Across the Gulf by Henry S. Whitehead. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ben Tucker. Across the Gulf by Henry S. Whitehead. For the first year or thereabouts after his Scotch mother's death, the successful lawyer Alan Carrington was conscious among his other feelings, of a kind of vague dread that she might appear as a character in one of his dreams, as she had often assured him her mother had come to her. Being the man he was, he resented this feeling as an incongruity. Yet there was a certain background for the feeling of dread. It had been one of his practical mother's convictions that such an appearance of her long-dead mother always preceded a disaster in the family. Such aversions as he might possess against the maternal side of his ancestry were all included in his dislike for belief in this kind of thing. When he agreed that the Scotch are a dour race, he always had reference, at least mentally, to this superstitious strain associated with that race from time immemorial, concrete to his experience because of this belief of his mother's, against which he had always fought. He carried out dutifully, and with a high degree of professional skill, all her various expressed desires and continued after her death to live in their large, comfortable house. Perhaps because his mother never did appear in such dreams as he happened to remember, his dread became less and less poignant. At the end of two years or so, occupied with the thronging interests of a public man in the full power of his early maturity, it had almost ceased to be so much as a memory. In the spring of his 44th year, Carrington, who had long worked at high pressure and virtually without vacations, was apprised by certain mental and physical indications which his physician interpreted vigorously, that he must take at least the whole summer off and devote himself to recuperation. Rest, said the doctor, for his overworked mind and under-exercised body was imperatively indicated. Carrington was able to set his nearly innumerable interests and affairs in order in something like three weeks, by means of highly concentrated efforts to that end. Then exceedingly nervous and not a little debilitated physically from this extra strain upon his depleted resources, he had to meet the problem of where he was to go and what he was to do. He was, of course, too deeply set in the rut of his routines to find such a decision easy. Fortunately, this problem was solved for him by a letter, which he received unexpectedly from one of his cousins on his mother's side, the Reverend Fergus MacDonald, a gentleman with whom he had only slight contacts. Dr. MacDonald had retained a developed pastoral instinct which he could no longer satisfy in the management of a parish. He was besides too little robust to risk assuming, at least for some time to come, the wearing burden of teaching. He compromised the matter by establishing a summer camp for boys in his still desirable Adirondacks. Being devoid of experience in business matters, he associated with himself a certain Thomas Starkey, a young man whom the ravages of the White Plague had snatched away from a sales managership and driven into the quasi-exile of Serenay, where Dr. MacDonald had met him. This association proved highly successful for the half-dozen years that it had lasted. Then Starkey, after a brave battle for his health, had succumbed, just at a period when his trained business intelligence would have been most helpful to the affairs of the camp. Dazed at this blow, Dr. MacDonald had desisted from his labors after literary distinction long enough to write to his cousin Carrington, beseeching his legal and financial counsel. When Carrington had read the last of his cousin's finished periods, he decided at once and dispatched a telegram announcing his immediate setting out for the camp, his intention to remain through the summer, and the promise to assume full charge of the business management. He started for the Adirondacks the next afternoon. His presence brought immediate order out of confusion. Dr. MacDonald, on the evening of the second day of his cousin's administration of affairs, got down on his knees and returned thanks to his maker for the undeserved beneficence which had sent this financial angel of light into the midst of his affairs, in this his hour of dire need. Thereafter, the Reverend Doctor immersed himself more and more deeply in his wanted task of producing the solid literature dear to the hearts of his editors. But if Carrington's coming had improved matters at the camp, the balance of indebtedness was far from being one-sided. For the first week or so, the reaction from his accustomed way of life had caused him to feel, if anything, even staler and more nerve-wracked than before. But that first unpleasantness passed. The invigorating air of the balsam-laden pine woods began to show its restorative effects rapidly. He found that he was sleeping like the dead. He could not get enough sleep, it appeared. His appetite increased, and he found that he was putting on needed weight. 
The business management of a boys' camp, absurdly simple after the complex matters of big business with which he had long been occupied, was only a spice to this new existence among the deep shadows and sunny spaces of the Adirondack country. At the end of a month of this, he confidently declared himself a new man. By the first of August, instead of the nervous wreck who had arrived sharply visaged and cadaverous two months before, Carrington presented the appearance of a robust, hard-muscled athlete of thirty, twenty-two pounds heavier, and without a nerve in his body. On the evening of the fourth day of August, healthily weary after a long day's hike, Carrington retired soon after nine o'clock and fell immediately into a deep and restful sleep. Toward morning, he dreamed of his mother for the first time since her death more than six years before. His dream took the form that he was lying here, in his own bed, awake, a not altogether uncommon form of dream, and that he was very chilly in the region of the left shoulder. As is well known to those skilled in the scientific phenomena of the dream state, now a very prominent portion of the material used in psychological study, this kind of sensation in a dream virtually always is the result of an actual physical condition and is reproduced in the dream because of that actual background as a stimulus. Carrington's cold shoulder was toward the left hand, or outside of the bed, which stood against the wall of his large airy room. In his dream, he thought that he reached out his hand to replace the bedclothes, and as he did so, his hand was softly though firmly taken, and his mother's well-remembered voice said, La still, laddie. I'll tuck you in. Then he thought his mother replaced the loosened covers and tucked them in about his shoulder with her competent touch. He wanted to thank her, and as he could not see her because of the position in which he was lying, he endeavored to open his eyes and turn over, being in that state commonly thought of as between sleep and waking. With some considerable effort, he succeeded in forcing open his reluctant eyes, but turning over was a much more difficult matter, it appeared. He had to fight against an overpowering inclination to sink back comfortably into the deep sleep, from which in his dream he had awakened to find his shoulder disagreeably uncomfortable. The warmth of the replaced covers was an additional inducement to sleep. At last, with a determined wrench, he overcame his desire to go to sleep again, and rolled over to his left side by dint of a strong effort of his will, smiling gratefully and about to express his thanks. But at the instant of accomplishing this victory of the will, he actually awakened in precisely the position recorded in his mind in the dream state. Where he had expected to meet his mother's eyes, he saw nothing, but there remained with him a persistent impression that he had felt the withdrawal of her hand from where, on his shoulder, it had rested caressingly. The grateful warmth of the bedclothes in that cool morning remained, however, and he observed that they were well tucked in about that shoulder. His dream had clearly been of the type which George de Maurier speaks of in Peter Ibbotson. He had dreamed true, and it required several minutes before he could rid himself of the impression that his mother, moved by some strange whimsicality, had stepped out of his sight, perhaps hidden herself behind the bed. He was actually about to look back of the bed before the utter absurdity of the idea became fully apparent to him. The back of the bed stood close against the wall of the room. His mother had been dead more than six years. He jumped out of bed at the sound of Rovea, blown by the camp bugler, and this abrupt action dissipated his impressions. Their memory remained, however, very clear-cut in his mind for the next two days. The impression of his mother's nearness in the course of that vivid dream had recalled her to his mind with the greatest clarity. With this revived impression of her, too, there marched almost of necessity, he supposed, in his mind the old idea which he had dreaded the idea that she would come to him to warn him of some impending danger. Curiously enough, as he analyzed his sensations, he found that there remained none of the old resentment connected with this speculation, such as had characterized it during the period immediately after his mother's death. His maturity, the preoccupations of an exceptionally full and active life, and the tenderness which marked all his memories of his mother, had served to remove from his mind all traces of that idea. The possibility of a warning in his dream of his dear mother only caused him to smile during those days after the dream, during which the revived impression of his mother slowly faded thin. But it was the indulgent, slightly melancholy smile of revived nostalgia, 
a gentle, faint sense of homesickness for her, such as might affect any middle-aged man recently reminded of a beloved mother in some rather intense fashion. On the evening of the second day after his dream, he was walking toward the camp garage with some visitors, a man and woman, parents of one of the boys at the camp intending to drive with them to the village to guide them in some minor purchases. Just beside the well-worn trail through the great pine trees halfway up the hill to the garage, the woman noticed a clump of large brownish mushrooms and inquired if they were of an edible variety. Carrington picked one and examined it. To his limited knowledge, it seemed to have several of the marks of an edible mushroom. While they were standing beside the plain where the mushrooms grew, one of the younger boys passed them. Crocker, called Mr. Carrington. Yes, Mr. Carrington, replied young Crocker, pausing. Crocker, your cabin is the one farthest south, isn't it? Yes, sir. Were you going there just now? Yes, Mr. Carrington, can I do anything for you? Well, if it isn't too much trouble, you might take this mushroom over to Professor Bindman's. You know where his camp is, just the other side of the wire fence beyond your cabin. And ask him to let us know whether or not this is an edible mushroom. I'm not quite sure myself. Certainly, replied the boy, pleased to be allowed out of bounds, even to the extent of the few rods separating the camp property from that of the gentleman named by Carrington, a university teacher regarded locally as a great expert on mushrooms, fungi, and such like things. Carrington called out after the disappearing boy. Oh, Crocker! Yes, Mr. Carrington. Throw it away if Dr. Benjamin says it's no good. But if he says it's all right, bring it back, please, and leave it on the mantel shelf in the big living room. Do you mind? All right, sir, shouted Crocker over his shoulder and trotted on. Returning from the village an hour later, Carrington found the mushroom on the mantel shelf in the living room. He placed it in a large paper bag, left it in the kitchen in a safe place, and the next morning, before breakfast, walked up the trail toward the garage and filled his paper bag with mushrooms. He liked mushrooms, and so doubtless did the people who had noticed these. He decided he would prepare the mushrooms himself. There would be just about enough for three generous portions. Mushrooms were not commonly eaten as a breakfast dish, but this was camp. Exchanging a pleasant good morning with the young colored man who served as assistant cook and who was engaged in getting breakfast ready, and smilingly declining his offer to prepare the mushrooms, he peeled them, warmed a generous lump of fresh country butter in a large frying pan, and began cooking them. A delightfully appetizing odor arising from the pan provoked respectful banter from the young cook, amused at the camp director's efforts along the lines of his own profession, and the two chatted while Carrington turned his mushrooms over and over in the butter with a long fork. When they were done exactly to a turn, and duly peppered and salted, Carrington left them in the pan which he took off the stove and set about the preparation of the three canapés of fried toast. He was going to serve his mushrooms in style, as the grinning young cook slyly remarked. He grinned back and divided the mushrooms into three equal portions, each on its canapé, which he asked the undercook to keep hot in the oven during the brief interval until a mess call should bring everybody at camp in to breakfast. Then with his long fork, he speared several small pieces of mushroom which had got broken in the pan. After blowing these cool on the fork, Carrington, grinning like a boy, put them in his mouth and began to eat them. "'Good, sir?' inquired the assistant cook. "'Delicious,' mumbled Carrington enthusiastically, his mouth full of the succulent bits. After he had swallowed his mouthful, he remarked, "'But I must have left a bit of the hide on one of them. There's a little trace of bitter. "'Look out for him, sir,' enjoined the undercook, suddenly grave. The plum wicked when they ain't just right, sir. These are all right, returned Carrington reassuringly. I had Professor Benjamin look them over. He sauntered out on the veranda waiting for the bugle call. From many directions the boys and a few visitors were struggling in toward the mess hall after a morning dip in the lake and cabin inspection. From their room in the guest house, the people with whom he had been the evening before came across the broad veranda toward him. He was just turning toward them with a smile of pleasant greeting when the very hand of death fell on him. Without warning, a sudden terrible griping accompanied by a deathly coldness, and this immediately followed by a pungent, burning heat, ran through his body. Great beads of sweat sprang out on his forehead. His knees began to give under him. Everything, all this pleasant world about him of brilliant morning sunshine and deep, Sharply defined shadow turned greenish and dim. 
His senses started to slip away from him in the numbness which closed down like a relentless hand, crushing out his consciousness. With an effort which seemed to wrench his soul and tear him with unimagined pain, he gathered all of his waning forces, and sustained only by a mighty effort of his powerful will. He staggered through the open doorway of the mess hall into the kitchen. He nearly collapsed as he leaned against the nearest table, articulating between fast paralyzing lips. Water! And mustard! Quick! The mushrooms! The head cook, that moment arrived in the kitchen, happened to be quick-minded. The undercook, too, had had, of course, some preparation for this possibility. One of the men seized a bowl just used for beating eggs, and with shaking hands poured it half full of warm water from a heating kettle on the stove. Into this the other emptied nearly half a tin of dry mustard, which he stirred about frantically with his floury hand. This, his eyes rolling with terror, he held to Carrington's lips, and Carrington, concentrating afresh all his remaining faculties, forced the nauseous fluid through his blue lips and swallowed painfully great saving gulps of the powerful emetic. Again and yet again the two negroes renewed the dose. One of the counselors, on dining room duty, coming into the kitchen, sensed something terribly amiss and ran to support Carrington. Ten minutes later, vastly nauseated, trembling with weakness but safe, Carrington, leaning heavily on the young counselor, walked up and down behind the mess hall. His first words, after he could speak coherently, were to order the assistant cook to burn the contents of the three hot plates in the oven. He had eaten a large mouthful of one of the most deadly varieties of poisonous mushroom, one containing the swiftly acting vegetable alkaloids which spell certain death. His few moments' respite, as he reasoned the matter out afterward, had been undoubtedly due to his having cooked the mushrooms in butter, of which he had been lavish. This, thoroughly soaked up by the mushrooms, had for a brief period resisted digestion. Very gradually, as he walked up and down, taking in deep breaths of the sweet, pine-scented air, his strength returned to him. After he had thoroughly walked off the faintness which had followed the violent treatment to which he had subjected himself, he went up to his room, and still terribly shaken by his experience and narrow escape from death, went to bed to rest. Crocker, it appeared, had duly carried out his instructions. Dr. Benjamin had looked at the specimen, and told the boy that there were several varieties of this mushroom, not easily to be distinguished from one another, of which some were wholesome, and one contained a deadly alkaloid. Being otherwise occupied at the time, he would have to defer his opinion until he had had an opportunity for a more thorough examination. He had handed back the mushroom submitted to him, and the lad had given it to a counselor, who had put it on the mantel shelf, intending to report to Mr. Carrington the following morning. Weak still, and very drowsy, Carrington lay on his bed, and silently thanked the powers above for having preserved his life. Abruptly he thought of his mother. The warning! At once it was as though she stood in the room beside his bed, as though their long, close companionship had not been interrupted by death. A wave of affectionate gratitude suffused him. Under its influence he rose warily, and sank to his knees beside the bed, his head on his arms, in the very spot where his mother had seemed to stand in his dream. Tears welled into his eyes and fell unnoticed as he communed silently with her who had brought him into the world, whose watchful love and care not even death could interrupt or vitiate. Silently, fervently, he spoke across the gulf to his mother. He choked with silent sobs as understanding of her invincible love came to him and overwhelmed him then to the accompaniment of a tremulous calmness which seemed to fall upon him abruptly. He had the sense of her, standing close beside him as she stood in his dream. He dared not raise his eyes, because now he knew that he was awake. It seemed to him as though she spoke, though there came to him no sensation of anything that could be compared to sound. You must be getting back into your bed, laddie. And keeping his eyes tightly shut, lest he disturb this visitation. He awkwardly fumbled his way back into bed. He settled himself on his back in an overpowering drowsiness, perhaps begotten of his recent shock, and its attendant bodily weakness ran through him like a benediction and a refreshing wind. As he drifted down over the threshold of consciousness, into the deep and prolonged sleep of physical exhaustion, which completely restored him, 
His last remembrance was of the lingering caress of his mother's firm hand resting on his shoulder. End of Across the Gulf by Henry S. Whitehead The Beautiful Suit by H. G. Wells This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Louise J. Bell The Beautiful Suit by H. G. Wells There was once a little man whose mother made him a beautiful suit of clothes. It was green and gold, and woven so that I cannot describe how delicate and fine it was. And there was a tie of orange fluffiness that tied up under his chin. And the buttons, in their newness, shone like stars. He was proud and pleased by his suit beyond measure and stood before the long looking-glass when first he put it on, so astonished and delighted with it that he could hardly turn himself away. He wanted to wear it everywhere and show it to all sorts of people. He thought over all the places he had ever visited and all the scenes he had ever heard described, and tried to imagine what the feel of it would be if he were to go now to those scenes and places, wearing his shining suit, and he wanted to go out forthwith into the long grass and the hot sunshine of the meadow wearing it, just to wear it. But his mother told him no. She told him he must take great care of his suit, for never would he have another nearly so fine. He must save it, and save it, and only wear it on rare and great occasions. It was his wedding suit, she said. And she took the buttons and twisted them up with tissue paper, for fear their bright newness should be tarnished and she tacked little guards over the cuffs and elbows and wherever the suit was most likely to come to harm. He hated and resisted these things, but what could he do? And at last her warnings and persuasions had effect, and he consented to take off his beautiful suit and fold it into its proper creases and put it away. It was almost as though he gave it up again, but he was always thinking of wearing it, and of the supreme occasions when, some day, it might be worn without the guards, without the tissue paper on the buttons, utterly and delightfully, never caring, beautiful beyond measure. One night, when he was dreaming of it after his habit, he dreamt he took the tissue paper from one of the buttons and found its brightness a little faded, and that distressed him mightily in his dream. He polished the poor faded button and polished it, and, if anything, it grew duller. He woke up and lay awake, thinking of the brightness a little dulled, and wondering how he would feel if, perhaps, when the great occasion, whatever it might be, should arrive, one button should chance to be ever so little short of its first glittering freshness. And for days and days that thought remained with him, distressingly. And, when next his mother let him wear his suit, he was tempted, and nearly gave way to the temptation, 
just to fumble off one little bit of tissue paper and see if, indeed, the buttons were keeping as bright as ever. He went trimly along on his way to church, full of this wild desire. For, you must know, his mother did, with repeated and careful warnings, let him wear his suit at times. On Sundays, for example, to and fro from church, when there was no threatening of rain, no dust blowing, nor anything to injure it, with its buttons covered, and its protections tacked upon it, and a sunshade in his hand to shadow it, if there seemed too strong a sunlight for its colors. And always, after such occasions, he brushed it over and folded it exquisitely, as she had taught him, and put it away again. Now all these restrictions his mother set to the wearing of his suit, he obeyed. Always he obeyed them. Until, one strange night, he woke up and saw the moonlight shining outside his window. It seemed to him the moonlight was not common moonlight, nor the night a common night and for a while he lay quite drowsily with this odd persuasion in his mind. Thought joined on to thought like things that whisper warmly in the shadows. Then he sat up in his little bed, suddenly very alert, with his heart beating very fast and a quiver in his body from top to toe. He had made up his mind. He knew that now he was going to wear his suit as it should be worn. He had no doubt in the matter. He was afraid, terribly afraid, but glad, glad. He got out of his bed and stood for a moment by the window, looking at the moonshine-flooded garden and trembling at the thing he meant to do. The air was full of a minute clamor of crickets and murmurings, of the infinitesimal shoutings of little living things. He went very gently across the creaking boards, for fear that he might wake the sleeping house, to the big, dark clothes press, wherein his beautiful suit lay folded, and he took it out, garment by garment, and softly and very eagerly tore off its tissue paper covering and its tacked protections until there it was, perfect and delightful, as he had seen it when first his mother had given it to him, a long time, it seemed, ago. Not a button had tarnished, not a thread had faded on this dear suit of his. He was glad enough for weeping, as in a noiseless hurry, he put it on, and then back he went, soft and quick, to the window that looked out upon the garden, and stood there for a minute, shining in the moonlight, with his buttons twinkling like stars, before he got out on the sill, and, making as little of a rustling as he could, clambered down to the garden path below. He stood before his mother's house, and it was white, and nearly as plain as by day, with every window blind but his own shut like an eye that sleeps. 
the trees cast still shadows like intricate black lace upon the wall the garden in the moonlight was very different from the garden by day moonshine was tangled in the hedges and stretched in phantom cobwebs from spray to spray every flower was gleaming white or crimson black and the air was a quiver with the thridding of small crickets and nightingales singing unseen in the depths of the trees there was no darkness in the world but only warm mysterious shadows and all the leaves and spikes were edged and lined with iridescent jewels of dew the night was warmer than any night had ever been the heavens by some miracle at once vaster and nearer and spite of the great ivory-tinted moon that ruled the world the sky was full of stars the little man did not shout nor sing for all his infinite gladness he stood for a time like one awe-stricken and then with a queer small cry and holding out his arms he ran out as if he would embrace at once the whole round immensity of the world he did not follow the neat set paths that cut the garden squarely but thrust across the beds and through the wet tall scented herbs through the night stock and the nicotine and the clusters of phantom white mallow flowers and through the thickets of southernwood and lavender and knee-deep across a wide space of mignonette he came to the great hedge and he thrust his way through it and though the thorns of the brambles scored him deeply and tore threads from his wonderful suit and though burrs and goose-grass and havers caught and clung to him he did not care he did not care for he knew it was all part of the wearing for which he had longed i am glad i put on my suit he said i am glad i wore my suit beyond the hedge he came to the duck pond or at least to what was the duck pond by day but by night it was a great bowl of silver moonshine all noisy with singing frogs of wonderful silver moonshine twisted and clotted with strange patternings and the little man ran down into its waters between the thin black rushes knee-deep and waist-deep and to his shoulders smiting the water to black and shining wavelets with either hand swaying and shivering wavelets amidst which the stars were netted in the tangled reflections of the brooding trees upon the bank he waded until he swam and so he crossed the pond and came out upon the other side trailing as it seemed to him not duckweed but very silver in long clinging dripping masses and up he went through the transfigured tangles of the willow herb and the uncut seeding grasses of the farther bank he came glad and breathless into the high road i am glad he said 
beyond measure that i had clothes that fitted this occasion the high road ran straight as an arrow flies straight into the deep blue pit of sky beneath the moon a white and shining road between the singing nightingales and along it he went running now and leaping and now walking and rejoicing in the clothes his mother had made for him with tireless loving hands the road was deep in dust but that for him was only soft whiteness and as he went a great dim moth came fluttering round his wet and shimmering and hastening figure at first he did not heed the moth and then he waved his hands at it and made a sort of dance with it as it circled round his head soft moth he cried dear moth and wonderful night wonderful night of the world do you think my clothes are beautiful dear moth as beautiful as your scales and all this silver vesture of the earth and sky and the moth circled closer and closer until at last its velvet wings just brushed his lips and next morning they found him dead with his neck broken in the bottom of the stone pit with his beautiful clothes a little bloody and foul and stained with the duckweed from the pond but his face was a face of such happiness that had you seen it you would have understood indeed how that he had died happy never knowing that cool and streaming silver for the duckweed in the pond end of the beautiful suit by h g wells recording by louise j bell sebastopol california the boy possessed by s mukherjee this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org i am sandhya veduri from sydney location reading the story on 3rd march 2022 the boy possessed by s mukherjee i think it was in 1906 that in one of the principal cities in india the son of a rich man became ill he had high fever and delirium and in his insensible state he was constantly talking in a language which was some kind of english but which the relatives could not understand this boy was reading in one of the lower classes of a school and hardly knew the english language when the fever would not abate for 24 hours a doctor was sent for the doctor arrived and went in to see the patient in the sick room the boy was lying on the bed with his eyes closed it was nearly evening as soon as the doctor entered the sick room the boy shouted doctor i am very hungry order some food for me Of course the doctor thought that the boy was in his senses he did not know that the boy had not sufficient knowledge of the english language to express his ideas in that tongue so the doctor had asked his relations when he had taken food last he was informed that the patient had had nothing to eat for the last 8 or 10 hours what will you have asked the doctor roast mutton and plenty of vegetables said the boy 
By this time, the doctor had approached the bedside. But it was too dark to see whether the eyes of the patient were open or not. But you are ill. Roast mutton will do you harm, said the doctor. No, it won't. I know what is good for me, said the patient. At this stage, the doctor was informed that the patient did not really know much English and that he was probably in delirium. A suggestion was also made that probably he was possessed by a ghost. The doctor who had been educated at the Calcutta Medical College did not quite believe the ghost theory. He, however, asked the patient who he was. In India, I do not know whether this is so in European countries too. Lots of people were possessed by ghosts and the ghost speaks through this victim. So generally a question like this is asked by the exorcist. Who are you and why are you troubling the poor patient? The answer, I am told, is at once given and the ghost says what he wants. Of course, I personally have never heard a ghost talk. I know a case in which a report was made to me that the wife of a groom of mine had been possessed by a ghost. On being asked what ghost it was the woman was reported to have, said, the big ghost of the house across the drain. I ran to the outhouses to find out how much was true, but when I reached the stables, the woman I was told was not talking. I found her in convulsions. To return to our story, the doctor asked the patient who he was. I am General Dash Dash Dash, said the boy. Why are you here? asked the doctor. I shall tell you that after I have had my roast button and the vegetables, said the boy or rather the ghost. But how can we be convinced that you are General Dash Dash, asked the doctor. Call Captain X of the Levin Brahmas and you will know, said the ghost. In the meantime, get me the food or I shall kill the patient. The father of the patient at once began to shout that he would get the mutton and the vegetables. The doctor in the meantime rushed out to procure some more medical assistance as well to fetch Captain X of the Levin Brahmas. The few big European officers of the station were also informed and within a couple of hours, the sick room was full of sensible, educated gentlemen. The mutton was in the meantime ready The mutton is ready, said the doctor. Lower it into the well in the compound, said the ghost. A basket was procured and the mutton and the vegetables were lowered into the well. But scarcely had the basket has gone down five yards, the well was forty feet deep, when somebody from inside the well shouted, Take it away, take it away, there is no salt in it. Those that were responsible for the preparation had to admit their mistake. The basket was pulled out and some salt was put in and the basket was lowered down again. But as the basket went in, about five or six yards, somebody from inside the well pulled it down with such force that the man who was lowering it narrowly escaped being dragged in. Fortunately, he let the rope slip through his hands with the result that though he did not fall into the well, his hands were bleeding profusely. Nothing happened after that and everybody returned to the patient. After a few minutes silence, the patient said, Take away the rope and the basket. Why did you not tie the end of the rope to the post? Why did you pull it so hard? said one of the persons present. I was hungry and in a hurry, said the ghost. They asked several persons to go down into the well but nobody would. At last a fishing hook was lowered down. The basket, which had at first completely disappeared, was now floating on the surface of the water. It was brought up quite empty. Captain X in the meantime has arrived and was taken to the patient. Two high officials of the government, both Europeans, had also arrived. As soon as the captain stepped into the sick room of the patient, we shall now call him Ghost, said, Good evening, Captain X. These people will not believe that I am General Dash Dash and I want to convince them. The captain was as surprised as the others had been before. You may ask me anything you like, Captain X, and I shall try to convince you, said the ghost. The captain stood staring. Speak, Captain X, are you dumb, said the ghost. 
I don't understand anything, stammered the captain. He was told everything by those present. After hearing it, the captain formulated a question from one of the military books. A correct reply was immediately given. Then followed a number of questions by the captain, the replies to all which were promptly given by the ghost. After this, the ghost said, If you are all convinced, you may go now and see me again tomorrow morning. Everybody quietly withdrew. The next morning, there was a large gathering in the sick room. A number of European officers who had heard the story at the club on the previous evening dropped in. Introduce each of these newcomers to me, said the ghost. Kept next introduced each person in Solomon form. If anybody is curious to know anything, I shall tell him, said the ghost. A few questions about England, position of buildings, shops, streets in London were asked and correctly answered. After all the questions, the Indian doctor who had been in attendance asked, Now, General, that we are convinced you are so and so, why are you troubling this poor boy? His father is rich, said the ghost. Not very, said the doctor. But what do you want from him to do? My tomb at Dashpur has been destroyed by a branch of a tree falling upon it. I want that to be properly repaid, said the ghost. I shall get that done immediately, said the father of the patient. If you do that within a week, I shall trouble your boy no longer, said the ghost. The monument was repaid and the boy has been never ill since. This is the whole story. A portion of it appeared in the papers. And there were several respectable witnesses, though the whole story is too wonderful. Inexplicable as it is, it appears that dead persons are a bit jealous of the sanctity of their tombs. I have heard a story of a boy troubled by a ghost who had inscribed his name on the tomb of a Mohammedan fakir. His father had to repair the tomb and has to put on an ornamental iron railing around it. Somehow or other, the thing looks like a fairy tale. The readers may have heard stories like this themselves and thought them as mere idle gossips. End of the story. The Cats of Ulthar by H.P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tyler Muterspa. Location, Monticello, Utah. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river sky, no man may kill a cat. And this I can verily believe, as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire. For the cat is cryptic, and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egyptus, and bearer of tales from forgotten cities in Moreau and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle lords, and heir to the secrets of hoary and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin and he speaks her language, but he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which she hath forgotten. In Ulthar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife, who delighted to trap and slay the cats of their neighbors. Why they did this I know not, save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night, and take it ill that cats should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near their hovel. And from some of the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife, because of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden under spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of the cats hated these odd folk, they feared them more, and instead of berating them as brutal assassins, merely took care that no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. When through some unavoidable oversight a cat was missed, 
and sounds heard after dark. The loser would lament impotently, or console himself by thanking fate that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Uthar was simple, and knew not whence it is that all cats first came. One day a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow cobbled streets of Uthar. Dark wanderers they were, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice a year. In the marketplace they told fortunes for silver, and bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of these wanderers none could tell, but it was seen that they were given to strange prayers, and that they had painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies and the heads of cats, hawks, rams, and lions. And the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns and a curious disc betwixt the horns. There was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow. And when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy, whom the dark people called Menez, smiled more often than he wept as he sat playing with the graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Uthar, Menez could not find his kitten and as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation, and finally to prayer. He stretched out his arms toward the sun and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand, though indeed the villagers did not try very hard to understand, since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the little boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead the shadowy, nebulous figures of exotic things, of hybrid creatures crowned with horned flink discs. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night, the wanderers left Uthar, and were never seen again, and the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth, the familiar cat had vanished. Cats large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow, and white. Old Cranon, the burgomaster, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for the killing of Menez's kitten, and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, the lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect for their hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple, even when little Atal, the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in performance of some unheard-of ride of beasts. The villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy, and though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, they preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So Uthar went to sleep in vain anger, and when the people awakened at dawn, behold, every cat was back at his accustomed hearth. Large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow and white, none was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair, and marveled not a little. Old Cranon again insisted that it was the dark folk who had taken them, since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat or drink their saucers of milk was exceedingly curious. And for two whole days the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food, but only doze by the fire in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked that no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week, the burgomaster decided to overcome his fears and call at the strangely silent dwelling as a matter of duty though in so doing he was careful to take with him Shang, 
the blacksmith, and Thule, the cutter of stone, as witnesses. And when they had broken down the frail door, they found only this. Two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and a number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the burgesses of Ulthar. Zath, the coroner, disputed at length with Nith, the notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thule were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atal, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned and given a sweet meat as a reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of small Menez and his black kitten, of the prayer of Menez and of the sky during that prayer, and of the doing of the cats on the night the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. And in the end the Burgesses passed that remarkable law, which is told of by traders in Haythig, and discussed by travelers in Nier, namely, that in Ulthar no man may kill a cat. End of The Cats of Ulthar The Coffin of Lissa by August W. Derleth From Weird Tales, October 1926 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The Coffin of Lissa by August W. Deerleth The horror of the sentence overwhelmed me. It fell upon me as a black cloak of night, descending on the earth, absorbing the light. So it heralded the expiration of my life. I was dazed, speechless, with the portent of the verdict. The black-robed judges seemed blurred to my sight as I rose and was taken from the chamber to make room for another poor wretch. Outside, night had fallen, and the murk of the darkness still further depressed my sunken spirits. Through the pall of gloom, I could discern no ray of hope. I was doomed, doomed to die by torture, the slow torture of the iron coffin. The final words of the inquisitors reverberated hollowly in the chambers of my benumbed mind. Slowly the first shock passed, and slowly I became conscious of my surroundings. My captors were leading me through a long passageway. A few candles glimmered feebly in their brackets at the end of the ill-lighted corridor. In a few moments I faced the iron door of the torture chamber. As the heavy door creaked backwards on its rusty hinges, the gleam of the flickering candles cast fitful, menacing shadows on the dread coffin in the center of the chamber. The sight filled me with renewed horror, and I was seized with a fierce desire for freedom. But the futile struggle that I essayed was immediately frustrated by my guards, whose strength far exceeded mine. I was roughly thrown into the instrument of torture, from which the lid had been removed. Suddenly, my head struck something unyielding, and I lapsed into unconsciousness. From then on, I knew but hazily what occurred. When I awoke, my sight encountered naught, save Stygian darkness. For a space I lay quiet, summoning to my aid all my faculties. Yet, try as I might, I could not pierce the blackness. It now seemed to swirl and eddy before my eyes, and often I closed them for the relief of immovable darkness. Now suddenly I bethought myself of moving my arms, but the attempt resulted in a sharp pain at the juncture 
of arm and shoulder. This, I thought, could be caused by no other agency than the clamps that I had so often heard of from witnesses of an execution. At that, preclusion to my efforts and the remembrance of the proceedings of some time past came upon me like a huge wave of ocean and swept away all the remnants of thoughts that I had been collecting, leaving nothing but fear, stark terror, despair. I realized where I was, and with the realization came the thought of unhindered death. I was in the terrible iron coffin of Lyssa, from which no man had ever escaped. I began to breathe heavily, and I could feel cold beads of sweat on my brow. I raved, I shouted in rage, I swore terrible oaths, oaths of vengeance against Torquemada, the Grand Inquisitor. But my exertions were too much for me, and I was forced to sink back in exhaustion. Shortly after, a reaction set in, and I lay quiet, contemplating my untimely end. I strained my ears for any sounds that might meet them. For a space I heard not, save my irregular breathing. Then another sound impinged upon my ears. It was a soft padding sound, a very soft sound, scarcely audible. I listened attentively, and attempted to find what occasioned it. It stopped at intervals. It resumed almost at once. Then no sound reached me for some little time, and suddenly I felt a sharp, stinging sensation in my right hand. I strove to draw it toward me, but the sharp pain in my shoulders was augmented with each movement of my arm. I groaned aloud. My arms had been drawn through apertures in the sides of the coffin. They had been chained to the stone floor for the rats to gnaw on. Again and again I shrieked, but the more often I did so, the more acutely did I realize the utter futility of my effort. I should not be heard here, so far underground. Even if I were heard, no one would liberate me. I sighed, and once more sank back to my rough bed, exhausted. The rats were gone now, frightened, no doubt, by my wild screams of terror. But poignantly I realized that they must eventually return. I lowered my eyelids and began to mumble a silent prayer. But then I was rudely interrupted. A new sound, a sound fraught with more dangers and horrors than any I had heard heretofore, reached my ears. A light sound, barely coherent. Yet it was there. A creaking sound, slow, in truth, and not continuous. But its portent flung me against the wildest throes of terror. The sound of the slow, sure descent of the coffin lid. This was the climax of the ghastly torture I was to undergo. I raised my head to find if I could touch the oncoming lid. But I could not, and the clawing pain in my shoulders as the steel clamps sank into my flesh caused me to sit back again as quickly as I could. The lid, then, was some distance away, and I had a few hours of grace. The certainty of death threw open the gates to my memory. I thought of my mistress, and of my innocent children, and I sobbed despondently. I traversed and retraversed my entire life, from the beginning of my miserable existence, to this experience of horror. Gradually my sobs quieted, 
and I had recourse in my God. For about the space of a glass of sand I lay unperturbable, my lips moving in prayer. Then I became cognizant of the proximity of the lid. I did not again endeavor to reach the cover with my head after my former racking experience, but I resorted to another means of finding its proximity. I summoned that feeble strength I had left, and forcibly blew air upward. At once I felt a draft on my face. The air had returned at the propinquity of the lid. At this discovery I sought to compose the feeling of haunting alarm which rose within me, but hardly had I attempted to do so when a biting sensation in my hands and arms acquainted me with the return of the rats, increased in number. I shrieked and screamed to scare them off, but to no avail for they attacked me as before. Simultaneously with these dire occurrences, a revolting nausea took possession of my senses. The air had become so foul that it oppressed me with its obnoxious poison. Cold sweat stood out in great beads upon my forehead. All my strength had deserted me, I could no longer even sob, and my breathing became more and more difficult as the lid came down. My imagination began to conjure up before me horrible visions. I believed that I saw Torquemada laughing delightedly at my sorry plight. I imagined Satan grinning at me, watching greedily for my soul. There were others, too, horrible faces leering at me through the gloom. I shut my eyes, but I could not shut out these damnable sights. They grew upon me. They assumed ghastly proportions. Their faces twisted into horrible, gargoyle-esque counterparts. Gradually they merged into a vague, indistinct, grotesque mass, and were swirled away by the eddying darkness. I could feel the lid now, lightly at first, for it advanced but slowly. A space passed, and the pressure began to pain me. Then came to me a last great power, and I shouted and raved, swearing horribly until the sweat rolled down my cheeks in great drops. The pressure became more and more pronounced, the air more obnoxious, the gnawing more persistent, the racking pain in my shoulders more torturous with each twitch, and at length I became oblivious of all. What am I doing here? Was I not in the iron coffin? Have I died and come to life? The sun cast long patches of light upon the stone floor of my cell and forms a network of conflicting shadows with the aid of the heavy bars at my window. My clothes are torn, bedraggled. I lack three fingers of the right hand and one and a half of another of the left. Why is my food reaching toward me at the end of a pole? Why is the door of this room never opened? Why does my keeper hurl disgusting epithets at me every time he nears me? What is the meaning of all of this? Why am I called such unbearable, bestial names? Above all, why am I so unjustly called that which is most often repeated, that which, of all, I deserve the least. Lunatic! At this word there comes upon me again 
that horrible nausea that attacked me in the coffin of Lissa, and I shriek in terror as those memories surge over me like the resistless waves of the ocean. And as my screams reverberate down the corridor, answering screams come from other cells, and my keeper laughs and shouts filthy curses at me. The End of The Coffin of Lissa by August W. Durleth The Crimson Weaver by R. Murray Gilchrist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gauntz The Crimson Weaver by R. Murray Gilchrist My master and I had wandered from our track and lost ourselves on the side of a great edge. It was a two days journey from the valley of the willow brakes, and we had roamed aimlessly, eating at hollow echoing inns where gray-haired hostesses ministered, and sleeping side by side through the dewless midsummer nights on beds of fresh-gathered heather. Beyond a single-arched wallless bridge that crossed a brown stream whose waters leaped straight from the upland, we reached the domain of the Crimson Weaver. No sooner had we reached the keystone when a beldam, wrinkled as a walnut and bald as an egg, crept from a cabin of turf and osier and held out her hands in warning. Enter not the domain of the Crimson Weaver, she shrieked. One I loved entered. I am here to warn men. Behold, I was beautiful once. She tore her ragged smock apart and discovered the foulness of her bosom, where the heart pulsed behind a curtain of livid skin. My master drew money from his wallet and scattered it on the ground. She is mad, he said. The evil she hints cannot exist. There is no fiend. So we passed on, but the bridge-keeper took no heed of the coins. For a while we heard her bellowed sighs issuing from the openings of her den. Strangely enough, the tenor of our talk changed from the moment that we left the bridge. He had been telling me of the Platonists, but when our feet pressed the sun-dried grass I was impelled to question him of love. It was the first time I had thought of the matter. How does passion first touch a man's life? I asked laying my hand on his arm. His ruddy color faded. He smiled wryly. You divine what passes in my brain, he replied. I also had begun to meditate. But I may not tell you. In my boyhood, I was scarce older than you at the time, I loved the true paragon. It were sacrilege to speak of the birth of passion. Let it suffice that ere I tasted of wedlock the woman died, and her death sealed forever the door of that chamber of my heart. Yet if one might see therein, there is an altar crowned with ever-burning tapers and with wreaths of unwithering asphodels. By this time we had reached the skirt of a yew forest, traversed in every direction by narrow paths. The air was moist and heavy, but ever and anon a light wind touched the treetops and bowed them, so that the pollen sank in golden veils to the ground. Everywhere we saw half-ruined fountains, satyrs vomiting senilely, nymphs emptying wine upon the lambent flames of dying phoenixes, creatures that were neither satyrs nor nymphs nor griffins, but grotesque adminglings of all slain by one another, with water gushing from wounds in belly and thigh. At length the path we had chosen terminated beside an oval mere that was surrounded by a colonnade of moss-grown arches. Huge pike quivered on the muddy bed, 
crayfish moved sluggishly amongst the weeds. There was an island in the middle where a leaden Diana, more compassionate than a crocodile, caressed Acteon's horns ere delivering him to his hounds. The huntress's head and shoulders were white with the excrement of a crowd of culvers that moved as if entangled in a snare. Northwards an avenue rose for the space of a mile to fall abruptly before an azure sky. For many years the U-mast on the pathway had been undisturbed by human foot. It was covered with a crust of greenish lichen. My master pressed my fingers. There is some evil in the air of this place, he said. I am strong, but you, you may not endure. We will return. Tis an enchanted country, I made answer feverishly. At the end of yonder avenue stands the palace of the sleeping maiden who awaits the kiss. Nay, since we have pierced the country thus far, let us not draw back. You are strong, master. No evil can touch us. So we fared to the place where the avenue sank, and then our eyes fell on the wondrous sight of a palace, lying in a concave pleasance, all treeless, but so bestarred with fainting flowers that neither blade of grass nor grain of earth was visible. Then came a rustling of wings above our heads, and looking skywards I saw flying towards the house a flock of culvers like unto those that had drawn themselves over Diana's head. The hindmost bird dropped its neck, and behold it gazed upon us with the face of a mannequin. They are charmed birds, made thus by the whim of the princess, I said. As the birds passed through the portals of a columbary that crowned a western tower, their white wings beat against a silver bell that glistened there, and the whole valley was filled with music. My master trembled and crossed himself. In the name of our mother, he exclaimed, let us return. I dare not trust your life here. But a great door in front of the palace swung open and a woman with swaying walk came out to the terrace. She wore a robe of crimson worn into tatters at skirt hem and shoulders. She had been forewarned of our presence, for her face turned instantly in our direction. She smiled subtly, and her smile died away into a most tempting sadness. She caught up such remnants of her skirt as trailed behind, and strutted about with the gait of a peacock. As the sun touched the glossy fabric, I saw eyes in rot in deeper hue. My master still trembled, but he did not move, for the gaze of the woman was fixed upon him. His brows twisted, and his white hair rose and stood erect, as if he viewed some unspeakable horror. Stooping with sidelong motions of the head, she approached, bringing with her the smell of such an incense as when amidst eastern herbs burns the coarse. She was perfect of feature as the Diana, but her skin was deathly white, and her lips fretted with pain. She took no heed of me, but knelt at my master's feet, a Magdalene before an impregnable priest. Prince and Lord, Tower of Chastity, hear, she murmured, for lack of love I perish, see my robe in tatters. He strove to avert his face, but his eyes still dwelt upon her. She half rose and shook nut-brown tresses over his knees. Youth came back in a flood to my master. His shriveled skin filled out. The dying sunlight turned to gold the whiteness of his hair. He would have raised her had I not caught his hands. The anguish of foreboding made me cry. One forces roughly the door of your heart's chamber. The wreaths wither, the tapers bend and fall. He grew old again. The crimson weaver turned to me. Oh, moral plot, she said laughingly. Think not to vanquish me with folly. I am too powerful. Once that a man may enter my domain, he is mine. 
but I drew my master away. "'Tis I who am strong,' I whispered. "'We will go hence at once. "'Surely we may find our way back to the bridge. "'The journey is easy.' The woman, seeing that the remembrance of an old love was strong within him, sighed heavily and returned to the palace. As she reached the doorway, the valves opened, and I saw in a distant chamber beyond the hall an ivory loom with a golden stool. My master and I walked again on the track we had made in the U-mast, but twilight was failing and ere we could reach the pool of Diana all was in utter darkness. So at the foot of a tree where no anthill rose we lay down and slept. Dreams came to me, gorgeous visions from the romances of Eld. Everywhere I sought vainly for a beloved. There was the castle of the ebony dwarf, where a young queen reposed in the innermost casket of the seventh crystal cabinet, there was the chamber of gloom, where Lenore danced, and where I groped for ages around columns of living flesh. There was the white minaret, where twenty-one princesses poised themselves on balls of burnished bronze. There was Melisandre's arbor, where the sacred toads crawled over the enchanted cloak. Unrest fretted me. I woke in spiritual pain. Dawn was breaking, a bright yellow dawn, and the glades were full of vapors. I turned to the place where my master had lain. He was not there. I felt with my hands over his bed. It was key cold. Terror of my loneliness overcame me, and I sat with covered face. On the ground near my feet lay a broken riband, whereon was strung a heart of chrysolite. It enclosed a knot of ash-colored hair, hair of the girl my master had loved. The mists gathered together and passed sunwards in one long, many-cornered veil. When the last shred had been drawn into the great light, I gazed along the avenue and saw the topmost bartizan of the Crimson Weaver's palace. It was midday ere I dared start on my search. The culvers beat about my head. I walked in pain as though giant spiders had woven about my body. On the terrace strange beasts, dogs and pigs with human limbs, tore ravenously at something that lay beside the balustrade. At sight of me they paused and lifted their snouts and bayed. A while afterwards the culvers rang the silver bell and the monsters dispersed hurriedly amongst the drooping blossoms of the pleasance, and where they had swarmed I saw naught but a steaming, sanguine pool. I approached the house, and the door fell open, admitting me to a chamber adorned with embellishments beyond the witchery of art. There I lifted my voice and cried eagerly, "'My master, my master, where is my master?' The alcoves sent out a babble of echoes, blended together like a harp chord on a dulcimer. My master, my master, where is my master? For the love of Christ, where is my master? The echo replied only, Where is my master? Above swung a globe of topaz, where a hundred suns gambled. From its center a convoluted horn held by a crimson cord, sank lower and lower. It stayed before my lips, and I blew therein, and heard the sweet voices of youth chant with one accord. Fall open, O doors, fall open, and show the way to the princess. Ere the last of the echoes had died, a vista opened, and at the end of an alabaster gallery I saw the crimson weaver at her loom. She had doffed her tattered robe for one new and lustrous as freshly drawn blood, and marvellous as her beauty had seemed before, its wonder was now increased a hundredfold. She came towards me with the same stately walk, but there was now a lightness in her demeanour that suggested the growth of wings. 
Within arm's length she curtsied, and curtsying showed me the firmness of her shoulders, the fullness of her breast. The sight brought no pleasure. My cracking tongue appealed in agony. My master, where is my master? She smiled happily. Nay, do not trouble. He is not here. His soul talks with the culvers in the coat. He has forgotten you. In the night we supped, and I gave him of Nepenthe. Where is my master? Yesterday he told me of the shrine in his heart, of ever-fresh flowers, of a love dead yet living. Her eyebrows curved mirthfully. "'Tis foolish boy's talk,' she said. "'If you sought till the end of time, you would never find him, unless I chose. "'Yet, if you buy of me, myself to name the price.' "'I looked around hopelessly at the unimaginable riches of her home. "'All that I have is this manor of the willow breaks, a Moorish park.' an ancient house where the thatch gapes and the casements swing loose. My possessions are pitiable, I said, but they are all yours. I give all to save him. Fool, fool, she cried. I have no need of gear. If I but raise my hand, all the riches of the world fall to me. Tis not what I wish for. Into her eyes came such a glitter as the moon makes on the moist skin of a sleeping snake. The firmness of her lips relaxed. They grew childlike in their softness. The atmosphere became almost tangible. I could scarce breathe. What is it? All that I can do if it be no sin. Come with me to my loom, she said, and if you do the thing I desire, you shall see him. There is no evil in it. In past times kings have sighed for the same. So I followed slowly to the loom, before which she had seated herself, and watched her deftly passing crimson thread over crimson thread. She was silent for a space, and in that space her beauty fascinated me, so that I was no longer master of myself. What you wish for I will give, even if it be life. The loom ceased. A kiss of the mouth, and you shall see him who passed in the night. She clasped her arms about my neck and pressed my lips. For one moment heaven and earth ceased to be, but there was one paradise where we were sole governors. Then she moved back and drew aside the web and showed me the head of my master and the bleeding heart whence a crimson cord unraveled into many threads. I wear men's lives, the woman said. Life is necessary to me, or even I, who have existed from the beginning, must die. But yesterday I feared the end, and he came. His soul is not dead, tis truth that it plays with my culvers. I fell back. Another kiss, she said. Unless I wish, there is no escape for you, and you may return to your home, though my power over you shall never wane. Once more, lip to lip. I crouched against the wall like a terrified dog. She grew angry. Her eyes darted fire. A kiss, she cried, for the penalty. My poor master's head, ugly and cadaverous, glared from the loom. I could not move. The crimson weaver lifted her skirt, uncovering feet shapen as those of a vulture. I fell prostrate. With her claws she fumbled about the flesh of my breast. Moving away she bade me pass from her sight. So half-dead I lie here at the manor of the willow breaks, 
watching hour by hour the bloody claw ever unwinding from my heart and passing over the western hills to the palace of the siren. End of the Crimson Weaver Dagon by H. P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gauntz Dagon by H. P. Lovecraft I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Penniless and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the enemy's navy had not reached its degree of ruthlessness, so that our vessel was made legitimate prize, while we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastnesses of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I awaked, it was to discover myself half-sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished, for there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing, and nothing within sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface exposing regions which for innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, strain my ears as I might, nor were there any sea-fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, 
which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness, and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for travelling purposes in short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I camped, and on the following day still travelled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first spied it. By the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but before the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me, but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Though my terror ran curious reminiscences of paradise lost and of satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness as the moon climbed higher in the sky i began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as i had imagined ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet the declivity became very gradual Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with a difficulty down the rocks, and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude and its location in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm the wavelets washed the base of the cyclopean monolith, 
on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did the most to hold me spellbound, plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas-reliefs, whose subjects would have excited the envy of a doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint, grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then suddenly I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemous-like, and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic, scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium I had said much but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist, and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease, and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am going to end matters, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Often I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man-of-war. 
This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind, of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand, the window, the window! End of Dagon by H. P. Lovecraft This recording is in the public domain. Deaf, Dumb, and Blind by C. M. Eddy, Jr. and H. P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames. Deaf, Dumb, and Blind by C. M. Eddy, Jr. and H. P. Lovecraft A little afternoon on the 28th day of June, 1924, Dr. Morehouse stopped his machine before the Tanner Place and four men alighted. The stone building, in perfect repair and freshness, stood near the road, and but for the swamp in the rear, it would have possessed no trace of dark suggestion. The spotless white doorway was visible across a trim lawn for some distance down the road, and as the doctor's party approached, it could be seen that the heavy portal yawned wide open. Only the screen door was closed. The proximity of the house had imposed a kind of nervous silence on the four men, for what lurked therein could only be imagined with vague terror. This terror underwent a marked abatement when the explorers heard distinctly the sound of Richard Blake's typewriter. Less than an hour before, a grown man had fled from that house, hatless, coatless, and screaming to fall upon the doorstep of his nearest neighbour half a mile away, babbling incoherently of house, dark, swamp, and room. Dr. Morehouse had needed no further spur to excited action when told that a slavering, maddened creature had burst out of the old tanner home by the edge of the swamp. He had known that something would happen when the two men had taken the accursed stone house. The man who had fled, and his master, Richard Blake, the author-poet from Boston, the genius who had gone into the war with every nerve and sense alert, and had come out as he was now, still debonair, though half a paralytic, still walking with song among the sights and sounds of living fantasy, though shut for ever from the physical world, deaf, dumb, and blind. Blake had revelled in the weird traditions and shuddering hints about the house and its former tenants. Such eldritch law was an imaginative asset from whose enjoyment his physical state might not bar him. He had smiled at the prognostications of the superstitious natives. Now, with his sole companion fled in a mad ecstasy of panic fright, and himself left helpless with whatever had caused that fright, Blake might have less occasion to revel and smile. This, at least, was Dr. Morehouse's reflection as he faced the problem of the fugitive, and called on the puzzled cottager to help him track the matter down. The Morehouses were an old Fenham family, and the doctor's grandfather had been one of those who had burned the hermit Simeon Tanner's body in 1819. Not even at this distance 
could the trained physician escape a spinal tingle at what was recorded of that burning, at the naive inferences drawn by ignorant countrymen from a slight and meaningless confirmation of the deceased? That tingle he knew to be foolish, for trifling bony protuberances on the forepart of the skull are of no significance, and are often observable in bald-headed men. Among the four men who ultimately set resolute faces toward that abhorrent house in the doctor's care, there occurred a singularly awed exchange of vague legends and half-furtive scraps of gossip handed down from curious grandmothers, legends and hints seldom repeated, and almost never systematically compared. They extended as far back as 1692, when a tanner had perished on Gallows Hill in Salem after a witch-trial, but did not grow intimate until the time the house was built, 1747, though the L was more recent. Not even then were the tales very numerous, for, queer though the tanners all were, it was only the last of them, old Simeon, whom people desperately feared. He added to what he had inherited, added horribly, everyone whispered, and bricked up the windows of the southeast room, whose east wall gave on the swamp. That was his study and library and it had a door of double thickness with braces. It had been chopped through with axes that terrible winter night in 1819, when the stinking smoke had poured from the chimney, and they found Tanner's body in there, with that expression on his face. It was because of that expression, not because of the two bony protuberances beneath the bushy white hair, that they had burned the body and the books and manuscripts it had had in that room. However, the short distance to the Tanner place was covered before much important historical matter could be correlated. As the doctor at the head of the party opened the screen door and entered the arched hallway, it was noticed that the sound of typewriting had suddenly ceased. At this point, two of the men also thought they noticed a faint effusion of cold air, strangely out of keeping with the great heat of the day though they afterward refused to swear to this. The hall was in perfect order, as were the various rooms entered in quest of the study where Blake was presumably to be found. The author had furnished his home in exquisite colonial taste, and though having no help but the one manservant, he had succeeded in maintaining it in a state of commendable neatness. Dr. Morehouse led his men from room to room, through the open doors and archways, at last finding the library or study which he sought, a fine southerly room on the ground floor, adjoining the once dreaded study of Simeon Tanner, lined with the books which the servant communicated through an ingenious alphabet of touches, and the bulky braille volumes which the author himself read with sensitive fingertips. Richard Blake, of course, was there, seated as usual before his typewriter, with a draft scattered stack of newly written pages on the table and floor, and one sheet still in the machine. He had stopped work, it appeared, with some suddenness, perhaps because of a chill which had caused him to draw together the neck of his dressing gown, and his head was turned toward the doorway of the sunny adjoining room in a manner quite singular for one whose lack of sight and hearing shuts out all sense of the external world. On drawing nearer and crossing to where he could see the author's face, Dr. Morehouse turned very pale and motioned to the others to stand back. He needed time to steady himself and to dispel all possibility of hideous illusion. No longer did he need to speculate why they had burned old Simeon Tanner's body on that wintry night, because of the expression it wore. For here was something only a well-disciplined mind could confront. The late Richard Blake, whose typewriter had ceased its nonchalant clicking only as the men had entered the house, had seen something, despite his blindness, and had been affected by it. 
Humanity had nothing to do with the look that was on his face, or with the glassy, morbid vision that blazed in great blue bloodshot eyes shut to this world's images for six years. Those eyes were fixed with an ecstasy of clear-sighted horror on the doorway leading to Simeon Tanner's old study, where the sun blazed on the walls once shrouded in bricked-up blackness. And Dr. Arlo Morehouse reeled dizzily when he saw that for all the dazzling daylight the inky pupils of those eyes were dilated as cavernously as those of a cat's eyes in the dark. The doctor closed the staring blind eyes before he let the others view the face of the corpse. Meanwhile, he examined the lifeless form with feverish diligence, using scrupulous technical care despite his throbbing nerves and almost shaking hands. Some of his results he communicated from time to time to the awed and inquisitive trio around him. Other results he judiciously withheld, lest they lead to speculations more disquieting than human speculations should be. It was not from any word of his, but from shrewd independent observation, that one of the men muttered about the body's tousled hair and the way the papers were scattered. This man said it was as if a strong breeze had blown through the open doorway which the dead man faced whereas although the once bricked windows beyond were indeed fully open to the warm june air there had been scarcely a breath of wind during the entire day when one of the men began to gather the sheets of newly written manuscript as they lay on floor and table dr morehouse stopped him with an alarmed gesture he had seen the sheet that remained in the machine and had hastily removed and pocketed it after a sentence or two blanched his face afresh. This incident prompted him to collect the scattered sheets himself and stuff them bulkily into an inside pocket without stopping to arrange them, and not even what he had read terrified him half so much as what he now noticed. The subtle difference in touch and heaviness of typing which distinguished the sheets he picked up from the one he had found on the typewriter. This shadowy impression he could not divorce from that other horrible circumstance which he was so zealously concealing from the men who had heard the machines clicking not ten minutes before. The circumstance he was trying to exclude from even his own mind till he could be alone and resting in the merciful depths of his Morris chair. One may judge of all the fear he felt at that circumstance by considering what he braved to keep it suppressed. In more than thirty years of professional practice, he had never regarded a medical examiner as one from whom a fact might be withheld. Yet through all the formalities which now followed, no man ever knew that when he examined this staring, contorted blind man's body, he had seen at once that death must have occurred at least half an hour before discovery. Dr. Morehouse presently closed the outer door and led the party through every corner of the ancient structure in search of any evidence which might directly illuminate the tragedy. Never was a result more completely negative. He knew that the trap-door of old Simeon Tanner had been removed as soon as that recluse's books and body had been burnt, and that the sub-cellar and the sinuous tunnel under the swamp had been filled up as soon as they were discovered some thirty-five years later. Now he saw that no fresh abnormalities had come to replace them, and that the whole establishment exhibited only the normal neatness of modern restoration and tasteful care. Telephoning for the sheriff at Fenham and for the country medical examiner at Bayborough, he awaited the arrival of the former, who, when he came, insisted on swearing in two of the men as deputies until the examiner should arrive. Dr. Morehouse, knowing the mystification and futility confronting the officials, could not help smiling wryly as he left with the villager 
whose house still sheltered the man who had fled. They found the patient exceedingly weak, but conscious and fairly composed, having promised the sheriff to extract and transmit all possible information from the fugitive. Dr. Morehouse began some calm and tactful questioning, which was received in a rational and compliant spirit, and baffled only by effacement of memory. Much of the man's quiet must have come from merciful inability to recollect, for all he could now tell was that he had been in the study with his master, and had seemed to see the next room suddenly grow dark. The room where the sunshine had for more than a hundred years replaced the gloom of bricked-up windows. Even this memory, which indeed he half doubted, greatly disturbed the unstrung nerves of the patient, and it was with the utmost gentleness and circumspection that Dr. Morehouse told him his master was dead, a natural victim of the cardiac weakness which his terrible wartime injuries must have caused. The man was grieved, for he had been devoted to the crippled author, but he promised to show fortitude in taking the body back to the family in Boston after the close of the medical examiner's formal inquiry. The physician, after satisfying as vaguely as possible the curiosity of the householder and his wife, and urging them to shelter the patient and keep him from the Tanner House, until his departure with the body, next drove home in a growing tremble of excitement. At last he was free to read the typed manuscript of the dead man, and to gain at least an inkling of what hellish thing had defied those shattered senses of sight and sound, and penetrated so disastrously to the delicate intelligence that brooded in external darkness and silence. He knew it would be a grotesque and terrible perusal, and he did not hasten to begin it. Instead, he very deliberately put his car in the garage, made himself comfortable in a dressing gown, and placed a stand of sedative and restorative medicines beside the great chair he was to occupy. Even after that, he obviously wasted time as he slowly arranged the numbered sheets, carefully avoiding any comprehensive glance at their text. What the manuscript did to Dr. Morehouse, we all know. It would never have been read by another had his wife not picked it up as he lay inert in his chair an hour later, breathing heavily and unresponsive to a knocking which one would have thought violent enough to arouse a mummied pharaoh. Terrible as the document is, particularly in the obvious change of style near the end, we cannot avoid the belief that to the folklore-wise physician it presented some added and supreme horror, which no other will ever be so fortunate as to receive. Certainly it is the general opinion of Fenham that the doctor's wide familiarity with the mutterings of old people and the tales his grandfather told him in youth furnished him some special information, in the light of which Richard Blake's hideous chronicle acquired a new clear and devastating significance, nearly insupportable to the normal human mind. That would explain the slowness of his recovery on that June evening, the reluctance with which he permitted his wife and son to read the manuscript, the singular ill grace with which he acceded to their determination not to burn a document so darkly remarkable, and most of all the peculiar rashness with which he hastened to purchase the old Tanner property, destroy the house with dynamite, and cut down the trees of the swamp for a substantial distance from the road. Concerning the whole subject, he now maintains an inflexible reticence, and is certain that there will die with him a knowledge without which the world is better off. The manuscript, as here appended, was copied through the courtesy of Floyd Morehouse, Esquire, son of the physician. A few omissions, indicated by asterisks, have been made in the interests of the public peace of mind 
Still others have been occasioned by the indefiniteness of the text, where the stricken author's lightning-like touch-typing seems shaken into incoherence or ambiguity. In three places, where lacunae are fairly well elucidated by the context, the task of recension has been attempted. Of the change in style near the end, it were best to say nothing. Surely it is plausible enough to attribute the phenomenon, as regards both content and physical aspect of typing, to the racked and tottering mind of a victim whose former handicaps had paled to nothing before that which he now faced. Bolder minds are at liberty to supply their own deductions. Here, then, is the document, written in an accursed house by a brain closed to the world's sights and sounds, a brain left alone and unworn to the mercies and mockeries of powers that no seeing hearing man has ever stayed to face. Contradictory as it is to all that we know of the universe through physics, chemistry, and biology, the logical mind will classify it as a singular product of dementia, a dementia communicated in some sympathetic way to the man who burst out of that house in time, and thus indeed may it very well be regarded, so long as Dr. Arlo Morehouse maintains his silence. The Manuscript Vague misgivings of the last quarter hour are now becoming definite fears. To begin with, I am thoroughly convinced that something must have happened to Dobbs. For the first time since we have been together, he has failed to answer my summons. When he did not respond to my repeated ringing, I decided that the bell must be out of order, but I have pounded on the table with vigour enough to rouse a charge of Charon. At first I thought he might have slipped out of the house for a breath of fresh air, for it has been hot and sultry all the forenoon but it is not like Dobbs to stay away so long, without first making sure that I would want nothing. It is, however, the unusual occurrence of the last few minutes which confirms my suspicion that Dobbs's absence is a matter beyond his control. It is the same happening which prompts me to put my impressions and conjectures on paper in the hope that the mere act of recording them may relieve a certain sinister suggestion of impending tragedy. Try as I will, I cannot free my mind from the legends connected with this old house, mere superstitious folderol for dwarfed brains to revel in, and on which I would not even waste a thought if Dobbs were here. Through the years that I have been shut away from the world I used to know, Dobbs has been my sixth sense. Now, for the first time since my incapacitation, I realise the full extent of my impotency. It is Dobbs who had compensated for my sightless eyes, my useless ears, my voiceless throat, and my crippled legs. There is a glass of water on my typewriter table. Without Dobbs to fill it when it has been emptied, my plight will be like that of Tantalus. Few have come to this house since we have lived here. There is little in common between garrulous country folk and a paralytic who cannot see, hear, or speak to them. It may be days before anyone else appears. Alone, with only my thoughts to keep me company. Disquieting thoughts, which have been in no wise assuaged by the sensations of the last few minutes. I do not like these sensations either, for more and more they are converting mere village gossip into a fantastic imagery which affects my emotions in a most peculiar and almost unprecedented manner. It seems hours since I started to write this, but I know it can only be a few minutes, for I have just inserted this fresh page into the machine. The mechanical action of switching the sheets, brief though it was, has given me a fresh grip on myself. Perhaps I can shake off this sense of approaching danger long enough to recount that which has already happened. At first it was no more than a mere tremor, somewhat similar to the shivering of a cheap tenement block when a heavy truck rumbles close by the curb, 
but this is no loosely built frame structure. Perhaps I am super sensitive to such things, and it may be that I am allowing my imagination to play tricks, but it seemed to me that the disturbance was more pronounced directly in front of me, and my chair faces the southwest wing, away from the road, directly in line with the swamp at the rear of the dwelling. Illusion though this may have been, there is no denying what followed. I was reminded of moments when I had felt the ground tremble beneath my feet at the bursting of giant shells, times when I have seen ships tossed like chaff before the fury of a typhoon. The house shook like a Dwergarian cinder in the sieves of Niflheim. Every timber in the floor beneath my feet quivered like a suffering thing. My typewriter trembled till I could imagine that the keys were chattering of their fear. A brief moment, and it was over. Everything is as calm as before, altogether too calm. It seems impossible that such a thing could happen, and yet leave everything exactly as it was before. No, not exactly. I am thoroughly convinced that something has happened to Dobbs. It is this conviction, added to this unnatural calm, which accentuates the premonitory fear that persists in creeping over me. Fear? Yes, though I am trying to reason sanely with myself that there is nothing of which to be afraid. Critics have both praised and condemned my poetry because of what they term a vivid imagination. At such a time as this, I can heartily agree with those who cry, Too vivid! Nothing can be very much amiss, or... Smoke! Just a faint sulphurous trace, but one which is unmistakable to my keenly attuned nostrils. So faint indeed, that it is impossible for me to determine whether it comes from some part of the house or drifts through the window of the adjoining room which opens on the swamp. The impression is rapidly becoming more clearly defined. I am sure, now, that it does not come from outside. Vagrant visions of the past sombre scenes of other days flash before me in stereoscopic review. A flaming factory, Hysterical screams of terrified women penned in by walls of fire, a blazing schoolhouse, pitiful cries of helpless children trapped by collapsing stairs, a theatre fire, frantic babble of panic-stricken people fighting to freedom over blistering floors, and over all, impenetrable clouds of black, noxious, malicious smoke polluting the peaceful sky. The air of the room is saturated with thick, heavy, stifling waves. At any moment I expect to feel hot tongues of flame lick eagerly at my useless legs. My eyes smart, my ears throb, I cough and choke to rid my lungs of the Ossipitian fumes, smoke such as is associated only with appalling catastrophes, acrid, stinking, mephitic smoke permeated with the revolting odour of burning flesh. Once more I am alone with this portentous calm. The welcome breeze that fans my cheeks is fast restoring my vanished courage. Clearly the house cannot be on fire, for every vestige of the torturous smoke is gone. I cannot detect a single trace of it, though I have been sniffing like a bloodhound. I am beginning to wonder if I am going mad, if the years of solitude have unhinged my mind. But the phenomenon has been too definite to permit me to class it as mere hallucination. Sane or insane, I cannot conceive these things as aught but actualities. And the moment I catalogue them as such, I can come to only one logical conclusion. The inference in itself is enough to upset one's mental stability. To concede this is to grant the truth of the superstitious rumours which Dobbs compiled from the villagers and transcribed for my sensitive fingertips to read, unsubstantial heresy that my materialistic mind instinctively condemns as asininity. I wish the throbbing in my ears would stop, 
It is as if mad spectral players were beating a duet upon the aching drums. I suppose it is merely a reaction to the suffocating sensations I have just experienced. A few more deep draughts of this refreshing air. Something, someone, is in the room. I am as sure I am no longer alone, as if I could see the presence I sense so infallibly. It is an impression quite similar to one which I have had while elbowing my way through a crowded street. The definite notion that eyes were singling me out from the rest of the throng, with a gaze intense enough to arrest my subconscious attention, the same sensation only magnified a thousandfold. Who? What can it be? After all, my fears may be groundless. Perhaps it means only that Dobbs has returned. No, it is not Dobbs. As I anticipated, the tattoo upon my ears has ceased and a low whisper has caught my attention. The overwhelming significance of the thing has just registered itself upon my bewildered brain. I can hear. It is not a single whispering voice, but many. Lecherous buzzing of bestial blowflies, satanic humming of libidinous bees, sibilant hissing of obscene reptiles, a whispering chorus no human throat could sing. It is gaining volume. The room rings with demoniacal chanting, tuneless, toneless, and grotesquely grim, a diabolical choir rehearsing unholy litanies, peons of Mephistophelian misery, set to music of wailing souls, a hideous crescendo of pagan pandemonium. The voices that surround me are drawing closer to my chair. The chanting has come to an abrupt end, and the whispering has resolved itself into intelligible words. I strain my ears to distinguish the words. Closer, and still closer. They are clear now. Too clear. Better had my ears been blocked forever than forced to listen to their hellish mouthings. Impious revelations of soul-sickening saturnalia. Ghoulish conceptions of devastating debaucheries. Profane bribes of Caberian orgies. Malevolent threats of unimagined punishments. It is cold, unreasonably cold, as if inspired by the cacodemoniacal presences that harass me. The breeze that was so friendly a few minutes ago growls angrily about my ears, an icy gale that rushes in from the swamp and chills me to the bone. If Dobbs has deserted me, I do not blame him. I hold no brief for cowardice or craven fear. But there are some things. I only hope his fate has been nothing worse than to have departed in time. My last doubt is swept away. I am doubly glad now that I have held to my resolve to write down my impressions. Not that I expect anyone to understand or believe. It has been a relief from the maddening strain of idly waiting for each new manifestation of psychic abnormality. As I see it, there are but three courses that may be taken. To flee from this accursed place and spend the torturous years that lie ahead in trying to forget. But flee I cannot. To yield an abominable alliance with forces so malign that Tartarus to them would seem but an alcove of paradise. But yield I will not. To die, far rather would I have my body torn limb from limb than to contaminate my soul in barbarous barter with such emissaries of Belial. I have had to pause for a moment to blow upon my fingers. The room is cold with the fetid frigor of the tomb. A peaceful numbness is creeping over me. I must fight off this lassitude. It is undermining my determination to die rather than to give in to the insidious importunings. I vow anew to resist until the end. The end that I know cannot be far away. The wind is colder than ever, if such a thing be possible. A wind frighted with the stench of dead alive things. Oh, merciful God who took my sight! 
a wind so cold it burns where it should freeze. It has become a blistering Sirocco. Unseen fingers grip me, ghost fingers that lack the physical strength to force me from my machine, icy fingers that force me into a vile vortex of vice, devil fingers that draw me down into a cesspool of eternal iniquity. Death fingers that shut off my breath and make my sightless eyes feel like they must burn with the pain. Frozen points press against my temples, hard bony knobs akin to horns, for real breath of some long dead thing kisses my fervid lips and sears my hot throat with frozen flame. It is dark not the darkness that is part of years of blindness, the impenetrable darkness of sin-steeped night, the pitch-black darkness of purgatory. I see, spes me Christus, it is the end. Not for mortal mind in any resisting of force beyond human imagination. Not for immortal spirit is any conquering of that which hath probed the depths and made of immortality a transient moment. The end? Nay, it is but the blissful beginning. The End of Deaf, Dumb, and Blind by C. M. Eddy, Jr. and H. P. Lovecraft Recording by Andy Sames Death and the Woman by Gertrude Atherton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Caveat Her husband was dying and she was alone with him. Nothing could exceed the desolation of her surroundings. She and the man who was going from her were in the third floor back of a New York boarding house. It was summer, and the other boarders were all in the country. All the servants except the cook had been dismissed, and she, when not working, slept profoundly on the fifth floor. The landlady was also out of town on a brief holiday. The window was open to admit the thick, unstirring air. No sound rose from the row of long, narrow yards, nor from the tall, deep houses annexed. The latter deadened the rattle of the streets. At intervals the distant elevated lumbered protestingly along, its grunts and screams muffled by the hot, suspended ocean. She sat there plunged in the profoundest grief that can come to the human soul. For in all other agony hope flickers, however forlornly. She gazed dully at the unconscious breathing form of the man who had been friend and companion and lover, during five years of youth too vigorous and hopeful to be warped by uneven fortune. It was wasted by disease. The face was shrunken. The night garment hung loosely about a body which had never been disfigured by flesh, but had been muscular with exercise and full-blooded with health. She was glad that the body was changed, glad that its beauty too had come in some other way than into the coffin. She had loved his hands as apart from himself, loved their strong, warm magnetism. They lay limp and yellow on the quilt. She knew that they were already cold, and that moisture was gathering on them. For a moment something convulsed within her. They had gone too. She repeated the words twice and after them. Forever. And the while, the sweetness of their pressure came back to her. She leaned suddenly over him. He was still in there, somewhere. Where? If he had not ceased to breathe, ego, the soul, the personality, was still in the sodden clay which had shaped to give it speech. Why could it not manifest itself to her? Was it still conscious in there? unable to project itself through the disintegrating matter which was the only medium its creator had vouchsafed it. Did it struggle there, seeing her agony, sharing it, longing for the complete disintegration which would 
put an end to its torment. She called his name. She even shook him slightly. Mad to tear the body apart and find her mate. Yet even in that tortured moment, realising that violence would hasten his going. The dying man took no notice of her. And she opened his gown and put her cheek to his heart, calling him again. There had never been a more perfect union. How could the bond still be so strong if he were not at the other end of it? He was there, her other part. Until dead, he must be living. There was no intermediate state. Why should he be as entombed and as unresponding as if the screws were in the lid? But the faintly beating heart did not quicken beneath her lips. She extended her arm suddenly, describing eccentric lines above, about him, rapidly opening and closing the hands, as if to clutch some escaping object, then sprang to her feet and went to the window. She feared insanity. She had asked to be left alone with her dying husband. She did not wish to lose her reason and shriek a crowd of people about her. Green plots in the yard were not apparent, she noticed. Something heavy like a pall rested upon them. Then she understood that the day was over and that night was coming. She returned swiftly to the bedside, wondering if she'd remained away hours or seconds, and if he were dead. His face was still discernible, and death had not relaxed it. She laid her own against it, then withdrew it with shuddering flesh, her teeth smiting each other as if an icy wind had come. She let herself fall back in the chair, clasping her hands against his heart, watching with expanding eyes the white sculptured face which, in the glittering dark, was becoming less defined of outline. Did she light the gas? It would draw mosquitoes. And she could not shut from him the little air he must be mechanically grateful for. And she did not want to see the opening eye, the falling jaw. Her vision became so fixed that at length she saw nothing, and had closed her eyes and waited for the moisture to rise and relieve the strain. When she opened them, his face had disappeared. The humid waves above the housetops put out the light of the stars, and the night was come. Fearfully, fearfully, she approached her ear to his lips. He still breathed. She made a motion to kiss him, then drew herself back in a quiver of agony. They were not the lips she had known, and she would have nothing the less. His breathing was so faint that in her half reclining position she could not hear it, could not be aware of the moment of his death. She extended her arm resolutely and laid her hand on his heart. Not only must she feel his going, but, so strong had been the comradeship between them, it was a matter of loving honour to stand by him to the last. She sat there in the hot, heavy night, pressing her hard hand against the ebbing heart of the unseen and awaited death. Suddenly an odd fancy possessed her. Where was death? Why was he tarrying? Who was detaining him? From what quarter would he come? He was taking his leisure, drawing near with footsteps as measured as those of men, keeping time to a funeral march. By a wayward reflection she saw to the slow music that was always turned on in the theatre when the heroine was about to appear, or something eventful to happen. She had always thought that sort of thing ridiculous and inartistic. So had he. She drew her brows together angrily, wondering at her levity, and pressed her relaxed palm against the heart it kept guard over. For a moment the sweat stood on her face, and the pent-up breath burst from her lungs. He still lived. Once more the fancy wantoned above the stunned heart. Death. Where was he? What a curious experience to be sitting alone in a big house. She knew that the cook had stolen out, waiting for death to come and snatch her husband from her. No, he would not snatch. He would steal upon his prey as noiselessly as the approach to sin to innocence, an invisible, unfair, sneaking enemy with whom no man's strength could grapple. If he would only come like a man, and take his chances like a man, women had been known to reach the hearts of giants with the dagger's point. But he would creep upon her. She gave an exclamation of horror, Something was creeping over the window sill. Her limbs palsied, but she struggled to her feet and looked back, her eyes dragged about against her own volition. 
Two small green stars glared menacingly at her just above the sill. Then the cat, possessing them, leapt downward, and the stars disappeared. She realised that she was horribly frightened. Is it possible, she thought, am I afraid of death, and of death that has yet to come? I have always been rather a brave woman. He used to call me heroic. Then with him it was impossible to fear anything, and I begged them to leave me alone with him as the last of earthly boons. Oh, shame. But she was still quaking as she resumed her seat and laid her hand again on his heart. She wished that she had asked Mary to sit outside the door. There was no bell in the room. No, to call would be worse than desecrating the house of God. She would not leave him for a moment. She to return and find him dead, gone alone. Her knees smote each other. It was idle to deny it. She was in a state of unreasoning terror. Her eyes rolled apprehensively about. She wondered if she should see it when it came. Wondered how far off it was now. Not very far. The heart was barely pulsing. She had heard of the power of the corpse to drive brave men to frenzy, and had wondered, having no morbid horror of the dead, but this, to wait, and wait, and wait, perhaps for hours past the midnight, on to the small hours, while that awful, determined, leisurely something stole nearer and nearer. She bent to him who had been her protector with a spasm of anger. Where was the indomitable spirit that had held her all these years with such strong and loving clasp? How could he leave her? How could he desert her? Her head fell back and moved restlessly against the cushion, moaning with the agony of loss. She recalled him as he had been. Then fear once more took possession of her, and she sat erect, rigid, breathless, awaiting the approach of death. Suddenly, far down in the house, on the first floor, her strained hearing took note of a sound, a wary, muffled sound, as if of someone creeping up the stair, fearful of being heard, slowly. It seemed to count a hundred between the laying of each foot. She gave a hysterical gasp. Where was the slow music? Her face, her body were wet, as if a wave of death sweat had broken over them. There was a stiff feeling at the roots of her hair. She wondered if it were really standing erect, but she could not raise her hand to ascertain. Possibly it was only the colouring matter freezing and bleaching. Her muscles were flabby, her nerves twitched helplessly. She knew it was death who was coming to her through the silent, deserted house. Knew it was the sensitive ear of her intelligence that heard him, not the dull, coarse grained ear of the body. He toiled up the stair painfully, as if he were old and tired with much work. But how could he afford to loiter with all the work he had to do? Every minute, every second, he must be in demand to hook his cold, hard finger about a soul struggling to escape from its putrefying tenement. But probably he had his emissaries, his minions, but only those worthy of the honour didn't come in person. He reached the first landing and crept like a cat down the hall to the next stair, then crawled slowly up as before, light footfalls were, they were squarely planted, unfaltering, slow, they never halted. Mechanically she pressed her jerking hand against her heart, its beats were almost done. They would finish, she calculated, just as those footfalls paused beside the bed. She was no longer a human being, she was an intelligence and an ear. Not a sound came from without. Even the elevated appeared to be temporarily off duty. But inside the big, quiet house, the footfall was waxing louder, louder, until iron feet crashed on iron stairs and echo thundered. She had counted the steps. One, two, three. Irritated beyond endurance of the long, deliberate pauses between, as they climbed the stairs and clanged with slow precision, she continued to count audibly with equal precision, noting their hollow reverberation. How many steps had the stair? She wished she knew. No need. The colossal trampling announced the lessening distance in an increasing volume of sound, not to be misunderstood. It turned the curve. It reached the landing. It advanced. Slowly. 
down the hall. It paused before her door. Their knuckles of iron shook the frail panels. Her nerveless tongue gave no invitation. The knocking became more imperious. The very walls vibrated. The handle turned swiftly and firmly. With a wild instinctive movement, she flung herself into the arms of her husband. When Mary opened the door and entered the room, she found a dead woman lying across a dead man. End of Death and the Woman The House in the Willows by Sewell Peasley Wright From Weird Magazine, April 1926 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. A Rational Ghost Story is The House in the Willows by Sewell Peasley Wright. The old Lathrop house stood on the tip of a wooded, swampy ravine that looked dismal even on the sunniest day and emitted the faint miasma of dead and rotting vegetation a loosely planked old bridge spanned the brook that crept into the maze of brush on each side and when an occasional vehicle did pass that way the hollow rumbling of the timbers echoed grumblingly along the wooded sides of the little steep-sided valley it was always damp in the ravine, and at night there was usually mist floating there. Sometimes it was dense, enfolding fog that wrapped one about in dank, stifling folds, and sometimes one could see only faint, ghostly wisps floating here and there. It was but very little drier up by the house and the ancient willows that stood grouped around the house drooped like despondent hopeless sentries grown old and gray in thankless service their trunks were soft and green with decades of moss and the damp dense shadows of the pernicious boughs had so protected the roof of the house from the healthy cleansing of the sun that here also a green patina added to the unwholesome atmosphere of the place there was something squat and repulsive about the house itself its wide angled gables stared blankly and the absolute lack of eaves a characteristic of early new england houses gave the building a bleak inhospitable look that fitted in perfectly with its background the fact that for nearly a decade it had been unoccupied so that the flags of the crooked narrow walk had been up thrust by rank growths and the garden had become a choked and tangled jungle of weeds was not due to the appearance of the house or its surroundings however your typical new englander while often harshly superstitious is seldom susceptible to such intangible influences briefly and baldly the old lathrop house was not occupied because the last lathrop of the line had committed murder there one night and was paying the penalty down at thomaston there were idle rumors spread by no one knows who that the place was haunted belated couples returning from a dance at the corners had seen ghostly figures moving in the yard and mysterious lights that flickered behind the staring windows it was a common dare at parties to challenge some brash young man to go alone to the old house and bring back as a token that he had actually made the trip a scrap of the moldering wallpaper usually the dare was declined but once in a while a young man eager to prove his bravery in the eyes of some fair damsel would brave the midnight terrors of the place 
and return, usually breathless and white of face, with the proof of his courage clutched tightly in his hand. Civilization, education, even religion are poor armor against the insidious attacks of superstition when one is alone at night in an old, deserted house, where willows whisper outside, and ancient beams and joists creak with weariness, and branches scratch on the roof and tap on the dusty, bleak-eyed panes as the wind comes and goes. The Erskine farm was only three-quarters of a mile or so from the old Lathrop place, and so it was not surprising that at Lena Erskine's birthday party someone suggested the trip to the old deserted house under the willows. "'There's an idea for you,' approved the hostess, her gray eyes dancing provocatively over the masculine portion of the crowd in the big, old-fashioned kitchen. "'Anyone volunteer?' It may have been accidental, but as she put the question, her eyes rested momentarily on Cal Weaver. Cal had been a contestant for Lena's hand ever since the old days in the little white schoolhouse over on the ridge. He did not hesitate. "'I'll go,' he said, and Lena's approving smile was ample reward. He felt very brave and daring there in the warm, comfortable kitchen, and he laughed off the good-natured jeers of the rest of the party with careless ease. "'Don't you folks fret. I'll bring back a section of paper big enough to recognize all right, and I won't come back looking as though I'd seen a ghost either, like Art Peebles did.' And with this parting shot at his rival, he clapped on his hat and strode whistling gaily out into the night. As long as he was on the main road, Cal's shrill piping rose triumphantly above the sharp and rather raw autumn wind. But when he turned onto the grass-grown winding old road that led past the Lathrop house, his whistle, despite his efforts, grew faint and tremulous. The night was very dark, with fragments of clouds scudding overhead, like great black bats, and the wind whistled with a soft droning sound in the pines that stood along the road. He came, at length, to the edge of the wooded valley, on the opposite side of which was the house that was his destination. As usual, there was a thin, unhealthy mist down in the ravine. Cal could see it writhing and twisting over the top of the alder bushes, and the damp, miasmic tang of it filled his lungs. Bravely, he strode down the valley, the floating fog seeming to close around him like a shroud. It reeked with the unpleasant breath of swampy vegetation and it was an effort to breathe in the moisture-laden atmosphere. The loose old bridge at the bottom of the ravine rumbled with startling loudness under Cal's determined heels. The noise startled the nightbird into eerie life, and something in the dense growth crashed through the underbrush with a sound like a man running in frantic haste. Cal's heart was pounding against his ribs with rapid, hammer-like blows, but he gritted his teeth and kept on. The gravel crunched loudly under his feet as he emerged from the mist that concealed the bottom of the ravine and started to climb the opposite hill, and now and then a rounded stone would start rolling down the steep incline to strike the sounding boards of the bridge and perhaps roll from there into the murky, brackish water below with a thick and muscled plop. Gradually, in the faint and ever-changing light of the cloud-obscured moon, Cal could make out ahead and to the right the irregular black bulk of the big willows. He paused for a moment before turning in at the weed-grown walk 
that led through a gap in the low disintegrating stone wall and peered into the darkness for a glimpse of the house he could make out the faint outline of one weathered gray gable with two blank windows staring unblinkingly in the dim light of the obscure moon suddenly he gave vent to a startled muffled explanation he saw or thought he saw the shadow of a man pass in front of one of the staring windows a black shadow that moved silently and joined its fellows leaving no trace behind nerves cal decided he spat out the word with disgust and started determinedly for the gray bulk of the old house as he approached it gradually detached itself from the dense shadows that surrounded it like some great squat beast emerging from its hiding place and preparing for a leap from the direction of the house came a sudden creak as of a rusty long disused door swung on its hinges followed by the sound of muffled footsteps a door swinging in the wind and a rat or a mouse prowling around muttered cal translating the sounds to his liking he swished through the tall grass of the dooryard mounted the rotting stoop and tried the front door it was locked and though he pressed against it with all the weight of his body the firm old oaken panels refused to give i never thought to ask how to get in he mumbled must be that you slip in a window he tried the first window he came to a small many-paned affair and gave a little pleased grunt as it slid up easily propping the window open with a small piece of wood torn from the stoop cal threw a leg over the sill and drew himself into the room it was much warmer inside and the air was thick and musty the room itself was utterly dark save for the dim rectangles that showed on three sides of the room where there were windows something moved in the room above and cal's heart raced for a moment until he recognized it as the scampering of a mouse a low-hanging willow branch tapped lightly on a window and cal stared around nervously until he located the source of the sound then with a little nervous chuckle he started feeling along the wall of the room until he located a torn edge of the wallpaper with a sharp rip he tore off a big triangle of paper and crammed it into a pocket of his coat he gave a little grunt of satisfaction and started for the window a noise behind him caused him to wheel nervously in his tracks he thought he saw something move for an instant far back in the dense shadows in a far corner of the room but though he stood as still as a stone image while his heart thumped perhaps a hundred times he saw nothing more and heard no sound save his own quick breathing partly reassured he backed toward the open window as he moved something came to life in the corner of the room he had been watching a silent black shadow the shadow of a man with stooping shoulders and outstretched head passed in front of one of the windows the thing came nearer on silent feet cal could see it more plainly it was huge and black and towered over him here and there it glowed with patches of greenish fire and its eyes burned out of a face that was gray and hideous as the face of death itself with a choking gasp cal leapt for the window as he did so the thing leapt also 
something struck Cal a terrific blow just at the base of the brain. He crumbled to the floor with a groan, a mocking, high-pitched chuckle ringing in his ears. The searching party, brave with lanterns and numbers, found him in a crumpled heap beside the window, his dark hair matted and sticky with blood. He was just regaining consciousness as they arrived. Two burning eyes, blazing in a gray, cavernous face, gazed through one of the windows into the room, but the light of the half-dozen lanterns on the floor prevented anyone from noticing. After a few minutes, a tall, stoop-shouldered figure in flapping clothing moved silently away from the window and started crawling through the thick underbrush that had encroached upon the dooryard. On all fours the figure crept, pushing through the tangled branches, crawling over decaying logs that sometimes glowed with the phosphorescent light of foxfire, stumbling over stones and outcropped ledges, chuckling in an excited, high-pitched voice, the figure hastened on. Thought you'd catch me, didn't you? Not that time. The shrill undertone sounded like the speaking of some great night-prowling rat. The man came at length to the stream that flowed at the bottom of the ravine. He stood erect and gauged the width as carefully as he could in the darkness and the mist, his eyes gleaming with the light of madness, his whole demeanor accentuated by the weird surrounding and the uncanny glowing of the foxfire that had rubbed on his clothes and from his clothes to his face and hands. He gave a sudden leap out over the murky, sluggish stream. His feet landed in splashing mud. He struggled wildly to regain his balance, but his muck-trapped feet hindered him. With a sodden splash he fell backward. The back of his head struck a submerged boulder just under the surface of the water. He shuddered, as though the water had chilled him, and raised one hand as if in protest. Then his hand dropped to his side, and his head slid from the rock to the bottom of the stream. Open-eyed, staring, the pale white face looked up from the bottom of the stream, up through the brackish, polluted water, and the floating gray mist, up at the cloudy sky. The morning sentinel the next day ran this item. Prisoner escapes from guard while being taken from Thomason to the State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, Burton Lathrop escaped from his guard, leapt from the train, and at this writing is still at liberty. Posses are scouring the county, and it seems likely that the escaped maniac's capture is only a matter of a few hours. From what little information the police have been able to obtain, it seems certain that Lathrop is heading in the direction of his old home, and authorities there are being warned to be on the lookout for him. The End of The House in the Willows by Sewell Peasley Wright H.S.H. by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. H.S.H. by Algernon Blackwood In the Mountain Club hut, to which he had escaped after weeks of gaiety in the capital, Delane, young traveling Englishman, sat alone and listened to the wind that beat the pines with violence. A firelight danced over the bare stone floor and raftered ceiling, giving the room an air of movement, and though the solid walls held steady against the wild spring hurricane, 
The cannonading of the wind seemed to threaten the foundations, for the mountain shook. The forest roared, and the shadows had a way of running everywhere as though the little building trembled. Delane watched and listened. He piled the logs on. From time to time he glanced nervously over his shoulder, restless, half uneasy, as a burst of spray from the branches dashed against the window, or a gust of unusual vehemence shook the door. Overwearied with his long day's climb, among impossible conditions he now realized in this mountain refuge his utter loneliness, for his mind gave birth to that unwelcome symptom of true loneliness, that he was not, after all, alone. Continually he heard steps and voices in the storm. Another wanderer, another climber out of season like himself, would presently arrive, and sleep was out of the question until first he heard that knocking on the door. Almost. He expected someone. He went for the tenth time to the little window. He peered forth into the thick darkness of the dropping night, shading his eyes against the streaming pane to screen the firelight in an attempt to see if another climber, perhaps a climber in distress, were visible. The surroundings were desolate and savage, well named the Devil's Saddle. Black-faced precipices, streaked with melting snow, rose towering to the north where the heights were hidden in seas of vapor. Waterfalls poured into abysses on two sides. A wall of impenetrable forest pressed up from the south. And the dangerous ridge he had climbed all day slid off wickedly into a sky of surging cloud. But no human figure was, of course, distinguishable, for both the lateness of the hour and the elemental fury of the night rendered it most unlikely. He turned away with a start, as the tempest delivered a blow with massive impact against his very face. Then, clearing the remnants of his frugal supper from the table, he hung his soaking clothes at a new angle before the fire, made sure the door was fastened on the inside, climbed into the bunk where white pillows and thick Austrian blankets looked so inviting, and prepared finally for sleep. "'I must be overtired.' he sighed, after half an hour's weary tossing, and went back to make up the sinking fire. Wood is plentiful in these climbers' huts. He heaped it on. But this time he lit the little oil lamp as well, realizing, though unwilling to acknowledge it, that it was not over-fatigue that banished sleep, but this unwelcome sense of expecting someone, of being not quite alone. For the feeling persisted and increased. He drew the wooden bench close up to the fire, turned the lamp as high as it would go, and wished unaccountably for the morning. Light was a very pleasant thing, and darkness now, for the first time since childhood, troubled him. It was outside, but it might so easily come in and swamp, obliterate, extinguish. The darkness seemed a positive thing. Already, somehow, it was established in his mind this sense of enormous aggressive darkness that veiled an undesirable hint of personality. Some shadow from the peaks or from the forest, immense and threatening, pervaded all his thought. This can't be entirely nerves, he whispered to himself. I'm not so tired as all that. And he made the fire roar. He shivered and drew closer to the blaze. I'm out of condition, that's part of it, he realized, and remembered with loathing the weeks of luxurious indulgence just behind him. For Delane had rather wasted his year of educational travel. Straight from Oxford, and well supplied with money, he had first saturated his mind in the latest continental thought, the science of France, the metaphysics and philosophy of Germany, and had then been caught aside by the gaiety of capitals where the lights are not turned out at midnight by a Sunday school police. He had been surfeited physically, emotionally, and intellectually till his mind and body longed hungrily for simple living again and simple teaching, above all the latter. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom, for certain temperaments, as Blake forgot to add, of which Delane was one. For there was stuff in the youth, and the reaction had set in with violent abruptness. His system rebelled. He cut loose energetically from all soft delights, and craved for severity, 
pure air, solitude, and hardship. Clean and simple conditions he must have, without delay, and the tonic of physical battling. It was too early in the year to climb seriously, for the snow was still dangerous and the weather wild, but he had chosen this most isolated of all mountain huts in order to make sure of solitude, and had come without guide or companion for a week's strenuous life in wild surroundings, and to take stock of himself with a view to full recovery. And all day long he climbed the desolate, unsafe ridge, his mind good, wholesome, natural symptom, had reverted to his childhood days, to the solid worldly wisdom of his church-going father, and to the early teaching, oh, how sweet and refreshing in its literal spirit, at his mother's knee. Now, as he watched the blazing logs, it came back to him again with redoubled force, the simple, precious, old-world stories of heaven and hell, of a paternal deity, and of a daring, subtle, personal devil. The interruption to his thoughts came with startling suddenness, as the roaring night descended against the windows with a thundering violence that shook the walls and sucked the flame halfway up the wide stone chimney. The oil lamp flickered and went out. Darkness invaded the room for a second, and Delane sprang from his bench, thinking the wet snow had loosened far above and was about to sweep the hut into the depths. And he was still standing, trembling and uncertain, in the middle of the room when a deep and sighing hush followed sharp upon the elemental outburst, and in the hush, like a whisper after thunder, he heard a curious steady sound that, at first, he thought must be a footstep by the door. It was then instantly repeated, but it was not a step. It was someone knocking on the heavy oaken panels, a firm authoritative sound as though the new arrival had the right to enter and was already impatient at the delay. The Englishman recovered himself instantly, realizing with keen relief the new arrival. At last! Another climber like myself, of course, he said, or perhaps the man who comes to prepare the hut for others. The season has begun. And he went over quickly, without a further qualm to unbolt the door. Forgive! he exclaimed in German as he threw it wide. I was half asleep before the fire. It is a terrible night. Come in to food and shelter, for both are here, and you shall share such supper as I possess. And a tall cloaked figure passed him swiftly, with a gust of angry wind from the impenetrable blackness of the world beyond. On the threshold, for a second, his outline stood full in the blaze of the firelight, with the sheet of darkness behind it, stately erect, commanding, his cloak torn fiercely by the wind, but the face hidden by a low-brimmed hat, and an instant later the door shut with resounding clamor upon the hurricane, and the two men turned to confront one another in the little room. Delane then realized two things sharply, both of them fleeting impressions, but acutely vivid. First, that the outside darkness seemed to have entered and established itself between him and the new arrival, and secondly, that the stranger's face was difficult to focus for clear sight, although the covering hat was now removed. There was a blur upon it somewhere, and this the Englishman ascribed partly to the flickering effect of firelight, and partly to the lightning glare of the man's masterful and terrific eyes which made his own sight waver in some curious fashion as he gazed upon him. These impressions, however, were but momentary in passing, due doubtless to the condition of his nerves and to the semi-shock of the dramatic, even theatrical entrance. Delane's senses, in this wild setting, were guilty of exaggeration. For now, while helping the man remove his cloak, speaking naturally of shelter, food, and the savage weather, he lost his first distortion, and his mind recovered sane proportion. The stranger, after all, though striking, was not of appearance so uncommon as to cause alarm. The light in the low doorway had touched his stature with illusion. He dwindled, and the great eyes upon Commer's subsequent inspection lost their original fierce lightning. The entering darkness, moreover, was but an effect of the upheaving night behind him as he strode across the threshold. The closed door proved it. 
and yet as delane continued his quieter examination there remained he saw the startling quality which had caused that first magnifying in his mind his senses while reporting accurately insisted upon this arresting an uncommon touch there was about this late wanderer of the night some evasive lofty strangeness that set him utterly apart from ordinary men the englishman examined him searchingly surreptitiously but with a touch of passionate curiosity he could not in the least account for nor explain there were contradictions of perplexing character about him for the first presentment had been of splendid youth while on the face though vigorous and gloriously handsome he now discerned the stamp of tremendous age that was worn and tired while radiant with strength and health and power it wore as well this certain signature of deep exhaustion that great experience rather than physical experience brings moreover he discovered in it in some way he could not hope to describe man woman and child there was a big sad earnestness about it yet a touch of humor too patience tenderness and sweetness held the mouth and behind the high pale forehead intellect sat enthroned and watchful in it were both love and hatred longing and despair an expression of being ever on the defensive yet hugely mutinous an air both hunted and beseeching great knowledge and great woe delane gave up the search aware that something unalterably splendid stood before him solemnity and beauty swept him too his was never the grotesque assumption that man must be the highest being in the universe nor that a thing is a miracle merely because it has never happened before he groped while explanation and analysis both halted a great teacher thought fluttered through him or a mighty rebel a distinguished personality beyond all question who can he be there was something regal that put respect upon his imagination instantly and he remembered the legend of the countryside that ludwig of bavaria was said to be about when nights were very wild he wondered into his speech and manner crept unawares an attitude of deference that was almost reverence and with it whence came this other quality a searching pity you must be wearied out he said respectfully busying himself about the room as well as cold and wet this fire will dry you sir and meanwhile i will prepare quickly such food as there is if you will eat it for the other carried no knapsack nor was he clothed for the severity of mountain travel i have already eaten said the stranger courteously and with my thanks to you i am neither wet nor tired the afflictions that i bear are of another kind the ones that you shall more easily i am sure relieve he spoke as a man whose words set troops in action and delane glanced at him deeply moved by the surprising phrase yet hardly marveling that it should be so he found no ready answer but there was evidently question in his look for the other continued and this time with a smile that portrayed sheer winning beauty as of a tender woman i saw the light and came to it it is unusual at this time his voice was resonant yet not deep there was a ringing quality about it that the bare room emphasized it charmed the young englishman inexplicably also it woke in him a sense of infinite pathos you are a climber sir like myself delane resumed lifting his eyes a moment uneasily from the coffee he brewed over a corner of the fire you know this neighborhood perhaps better at any rate than i can know it his german halted rather he chose his words with difficulty there was uncommon trouble in his mind i know all wild and desolate places replied the other in perfect english but with a wintry mournfulness in his voice and eyes for i feel at home in them and their stern companionship my nature craves as solace but unlike yourself i am no climber the heights have no attraction for you asked delane as he mingled steaming milk and coffee in the wooden bowl marveling what brought him then so high above the valleys 
It is their difficulty and danger that fascinate me always. I find the loneliness of the summits intoxicating in a sense. And regardless of refusal, he set the bread and meat before him, the apple and the tiny packet of salt, then turned away to place the coffee pot beside the fire again. But as he did so, a singular gesture of the other caught his eyes. Before touching bowl or plate, the stranger took the fruit and brushed his lips with it. He kissed it, then set it on the ground and crushed it into pulp beneath his heel. And seeing this, the young Englishman knew something dreadfully arrested in his mind, for as he looked away, pretending the act was unobserved, a thing of ice and darkness moved past him through the room, so that the pot trembled in his hand, rattling sharply against the hearthstone where he stooped. He could only interpret it as an act of madness, and the myth of the sad, drowned monarch wandering through this enchanted region pressed into him again unsought and urgent. It was a full minute before he had control of his heart and hand again. The bowl was half-emptied, and the man was smiling, this time the smile of a child who implores the comfort of enveloping and understanding arms. "'I am a wanderer rather than a climber,' he was saying, as though there had been no interval. For, though the lonely summits suit me well, I now find in them only terror. My feet lose their sureness, and my head its steady balance. I prefer the hidden gorges of these mountains, and the shadows of the covering forests. My days, his voice drew the loneliness of uttermost space into its piteous accents, are passed in darkness. I can never climb again. He spoke this time, indeed, as a man whose nerve was gone forever. It was pitiable almost to tears, and Delane, unable to explain the amazing contradictions, felt recklessly, furiously drawn to this trapped wanderer with the mien of a king, yet the air and speech sometimes of a woman, and sometimes of an outcast child. Ah, then you have known accidents. Delane replied with outer calmness as he lit his pipe, trying in vain to keep his hand as steady as his voice. You have been in one, perhaps. The effect, I have been told, is... The power and sweetness in that resonant voice took his breath away as he heard it break in upon his own uncertain accents. I have fallen, the stranger replied impressively, as the rain and wind wailed past the building mournfully. Yet a fall that was no part of any accident, for it was no common fall. But the man added, with a magnificent gesture of disdain, while yet it broke my heart in two. He stooped a little as he uttered the next words with a crying pathos that an outcast woman might have used. I am, he said, engulfed in intolerable loneliness. I can never climb again. With a shiver impossible to control, half of terror, half of pity, Delane moved a step nearer to the marvelous stranger. The spirit of Ludwig, exiled and distraught, had gripped his soul with a weakening terror. But now sheer beauty lifted him above all personal shrinking. There seemed some echo of lost divinity, worn, wild, yet grandiose through which this significant language strained towards a personal message for himself. In loneliness, he faltered, sympathy rising in a flood. For my kingdom that is lost to me forever, met him in deep throbbing tones that set the air on fire. For my imperial ancient heights, the jealousy took from me. The stranger paused with an indescribable air of broken dignity and pain. Outside, the tempest paused a moment before the awful elemental crash that followed. A bellowing of many winds descended like artillery upon the world. A burst of smoke rushed from the fireplace about them both, shrouding the stranger momentarily in a flying veil. And Delane stood up, uncomfortable in his very bones. What can it be? he asked himself sharply. Who is this being that he should use such language? He watched alarm chase pity, aware that the conversation held something beyond experience. But the pity returned in greater and ever greater flood, and love surged through him too. It was significant. 
he remembered afterwards, that he felt it incumbent upon himself to stand. Curious, too, how the thought of that mad, drowned, monarch-haunted memory with such persistence. Some vast emotion that he could not name drove out his subsequent words. The smoke had cleared, and a strange high stillness held the world. The rain streamed down in torrents, isolating these two somehow from the haunts of men. And the Englishman stared then into a countenance grown mighty with woe and loneliness. There stood darkly in it this incommunicable magnificence of pain that mingled awe with the pity he had felt. The kingly eyes looked clear into his own, completing his subjugation out of time. I would follow you, ran his thought upon its knees, follow you with obedience for ever and ever, even into a last damnation, for you are sublime. You shall come again into your kingdom, if my own small worship. Then blackness sponged the reckless thought away. He spoke in its place a more guarded, careful thing. I am aware, he faltered, yet conscious that he bowed, of standing before a great one of some world unknown to me. Who he may be, I have but the privilege of wondering. He has spoken darkly of a kingdom that is lost, yet he is still, I see, a monarch. And he lowered his head and shoulders involuntarily. For an instant, then, as he said it, the eyes before him flashed their original terrific lightnings. The darkness of the common world faded before the entrance of an outer darkness. From gulfs of terror at his feet rose shadows out of the night of time, and a passionate anguish, as of sudden madness, seized his heart and shook it. He listened breathlessly for the words that followed. It seemed some wind of unutterable despair passed in the breath from those non-human lips. I am still a monarch, yes, but my kingdom is taken from me, for I have no single subject. Lost in a loneliness that lies out of space and time, I am become a throneless ruler, and my hopelessness is more than I can bear. The beseeching pathos of the voice tore him in two. The deity himself, it seemed, stood there, accused of jealousy, of sin and cruelty. The stranger rose. The power about him brought the picture of a planet, throned in mid-heaven and poised beyond assault. Not otherwise, boomed the startling words, as though an avalanche found syllables, could I now show myself to you. Delane was trembling horribly. He felt the next word slip off his tongue unconsciously. The shattering truth had dawned upon his soul at last. Then the light you saw and came to, he whispered. Was the light in your heart that guided me, came the answer, sweet beguiling as the music in a woman's tones. The light of your instant brief desire that held love in it. He made an opening movement with his arms as he continued, smiling like stars in summer. For you summoned me, summoned me by your dear and precious belief. How dear! How precious none can know but I who stand before you. His figure drew up with an imperial air of proud dominion. His feet were set among the constellations. The opening movement of his arms continued slowly, and the music in his tones seemed merged in distant thunder. For your single brief belief, he smiled with the grandeur of a condescending emperor, shall give my vanished kingdom back to me and with an air of native majesty he held his hand out to be kissed. The black hurricane of night, the terror of frozen peaks, the yawning horror of the great abyss outside, all three crowded into the Englishman's mind with a slashing impact that blocked delivery of any word or action. It was not that he refused, it was not that he withdrew, but that life stood paralyzed and rigid, the flow stopped dead for the first time since he had left his mother's womb. The god in him was turned to stone and rendered ineffective. For an appalling instant, God was not. He realized the stupendous moment. Before him, drinking his little soul out merely by his presence, stood one whose habit of mind, not alone his external accidents, 
was imperial with black prerogative before the first man drew the breath of life. August procedure was native to his inner process of existence. The stars and confines of the universe owned his sway before he fell, to trifle away the dreary little centuries by haunting the minds of feeble men and women, by hiding himself in nursery cupboards, and by grinning with stained gargoyles from the roofs of city churches. And the lad's life stammered, flickered, threatened to go out before the enveloping terror of the revelation. I call to you, but call to you in play, thought whispered somewhere deep below the level of any speech, yet not so low that the audacious sound of it did not crash above the elements outside. For till now you have been to me but a coated bogey that my brain disowned with laughter and my heart thought picturesque if you are here alive may god forgive me for my it seemed as though tears the tears of love and profound commiseration drowned the very seed of thought itself a sound stopped him that was like a collapse in heaven some crashing as of a ruined world passed splintering through his little timid heart he did not yield but he understood with an understanding which seemed the delicate first sign of yielding the seductiveness of evil the sweet delight of surrendering the will without a recklessness to those swelling forces which disintegrate the heroic soul in man he remembered it was true in the reaction from excess he had definitely called upon his childhood's teaching with a passing moment of genuine belief and now that yearning of a fraction of a second bore its awful fruit the luscious capitals where he had rioted passed in a colored stream before his eyes the wine the women and the song stood there before him clothed in that power which lies insinuatingly disguised behind their little passing show of innocence the glamour donned this domino of regal and virile grandeur. He felt entangled beyond recovery. The idea of God seemed sterile and without reality. The one real thing, the one desirable thing, the one possible, strong and beautiful thing, was to bend his head and kiss those imperial fingers. He moved noiselessly towards the hand. He raised his own to take it and lift it toward his mouth. When there arose in his mind with startling vividness a small, soft picture of a child's nursery, a picture of a little boy, kneeling in scanty nightgown with pink upturned soles and asking ridiculous, audacious things of a shining figure seated on a summer cloud above the kitchen garden walnut tree. The tiny symbol flashed and went its way, yet not before it had lit the entire world with glory, for there came an absolute rooting power with it. In that half-forgotten instance, craving for the simple teaching of his childhood days, belief had conjured with two immense traditions. This was the second of them. The appearance of the one had inevitably produced the passage of its opposite and the hand that floated in the air before him to be kissed sank slowly down below the possible level of his lips. He shrank away. The laughter tempted something in his brain. There still clung about his heart the first aching, pitying terror. But sighs retreated, dwindling somehow as it went. The wind and rain obliterated every other sound, yet in that bare, unfurnished room of a climber's mountain hut there was a silence above the roar that drank in everything and broke the back of speech in opposition to this masquerading splendor delane had set up a personal paternal deity i thought of you perhaps cried the voice of self-defense but i did not call to you with real belief and by the name of god i did not summon you for your sweetness as your power sickens me and your hand is black with the curses of all the mothers in the world, whose prayers and tears... He stopped dead, overwhelmed by the cruelty of his reckless utterance. And the other moved towards him slowly, 
It was like the summit of some peaked and terrible height that moved. He spoke. He changed appallingly. But I claim, he roared, your heart. I claim you by that instant of belief you felt. For by that alone you shall restore to me my vanished kingdom. You shall worship me. In the countenance was a sudden awful power, but behind the stupefying roar there was weakness in the voice, as of an imploring and beseeching child. Again deep love and searching pity seared the Englishman's heart, as he replied in the gentlest accents he could find to master. And I claim you, he said, by my understanding sympathy and by my sorrow for your God-forsaken loneliness, and by my love for no kingdom built on hate can stand against the love you would deny. Words failed him then, as he saw the majesty fade slowly from the face, grown small and shadowy. One last expression of desperate energy in the eyes struck lightnings from the smoky air. As with an abandoned movement of the entire figure, he drew back, it seemed, towards the door behind him. The lane moved slowly after him, opening his arms. Tenderness and big compassion flung wide the gates of love within him. He found strange language, too, although actual spoken words did not produce them further than his entrails where they had their birth. Toys in the world are plentiful, sire, and you may have them for your masterpiece of play, but you must seek them where they still survive, in the churches and in isolated lands where thought lies unawakened, for they are the children's blocks of make-believe, whose palaces, like your once tremendous kingdom, have no true existence for the thinking mind. And he stretched his hands towards him with the gesture of one who sought to help and save, then paused as he realized that his arms enclosed sheer blackness, with the emptiness of wind and driving rain. For the door of the hut stood open, and Delane balanced on the threshold, facing the sheet of night above the abyss. He heard the waterfalls in the valley far below. The forest flapped and tossed its myriad branches. Cold drafts swept down from spectral fields of melting snow above, and the blackness turned momentarily into the semblance of towers and bastions of thick-beaten gloom. Above one soaring turret, then, a space of sky appeared, swept naked by a violent lost wind, an opening of purple into limitless distance. For one second, amid the vapors, it was visible, empty and untenanted. The next, there sailed across its small diameter a falling star. With an air of slow and endless leisure, yet at the same time, with terrific speed, it dived behind the ragged curtain of the clouds, and the space closed up again. Blackness returned upon the heavens. And through this blackness, plunging into that abyss of woe whence he had momentarily risen, the figure of the marvelous stranger melted utterly away. Delane, for a fleeting second, was aware of the earnestness in the sad, imploring countenance, of its sweetness and its power, so strangely mingled, of its mysterious grandeur, and of its pathetic childishness. But already it was sunk into interminable distance. A star that would be baleful, yet was merely glorious, passed on its endless wandering among the teeming systems of the universe. Behind the fixed and steady stars, secure in their appointed places, it set. It vanished into the pit of unknown emptiness. It was gone. God help you! sighed across the sea of wailing branches echoing down the dark abyss below. God give you rest at last! For he saw a princely, nay, an imperial being, homeless forever, and forever wandering, hunted as by keen, remorseless winds about a universe that held no corner for his feet, his majesty unworshipped, his reign a mockery, his court unfurnished, and his courtiers mere shadows of deep space. And a thin gray dawn, stealing up behind clearing summits in the east, crept then against the windows of the mountain hut. It brought with it a treacherous sharp air that made the sleeper draw another blanket 
nearer to shelter him from the sudden cold. The fire had died out, and an icy draught sucked steadily beneath the doorway. End of H.S.H. by Algernon Blackwood Jumby by Henry S. Whitehead This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Benjamin Tucker Jumby Mr. Granville Lee, a Virginian of Virginians, coming out of the World War with a lung wasted and scorched by mustard gas, was recommended by his physician to spend a winter in the spice and balm climate of the Lesser Antilles, the lower islands of the West Indian archipelago. He chose one of the American islands, St. Croix, the old Santa Cruz Island of the Holy Cross, named by Columbus himself on his second voyage, once famous for its rum. It was to Jaffre de Silva that Mr. Lee at last turned for definite information about the local magic, information which, after a two-month's residence accompanied with marked improvement in his general health, he had come to regard as imperative, from the wedding glimpses he had received of his persistence on the island. Contact with local customs, too, had sufficiently blunted his inherited sensibilities to make him almost comfortable as he sat with Mr. de Silva on the cool gallery of the gentleman's beautiful house, in the shade of forty years' growth of Bougainvillea on a certain afternoon. It was the restful, gospy period between five o'clock and dinner time. A glass jug of foaming rum swizzle stood on the table between them. "'But tell me, Mr. De Silva,' he urged as he absorbed his second glass of the cooling mild drink, "'have you ever actually been confronted with a jumby? Ever really seen one? You say quite frankly that you believe in them.' This was not the first question about jumbies that Mr. Lee had asked. He had consulted planters. He had spoken of the matter of jumbies with courteous, intelligent, colored storekeepers about the town, and even in Christianstead, St. Croix's other larger town on the north side of the island. He had even mentioned the matter to one or two coal-black sugar-field laborers, for he had been on the island just long enough to begin to understand, a little, the weird jargon of speech which Lafcadio Hearn, when he visited St. Croix many years before, had not recognized as English. There had been marked differences in what he had been told. The planters and storekeepers had smiled, though with varying degrees of intensity, and had replied that the Danes had invented jumbies to keep their estate laborers indoors after nightfall, thus ensuring a proper night's sleep for them, and minimizing the depredations upon growing crops. The laborers whom he had asked had rolled their eyes somewhat, but, it being broad daylight at the time of the inquiries, they had broken their impassive gravity with smiles and sought to impress Mr. Lee with their lofty contempt for the beliefs of their fellow blacks, and with queerly phrased assurances that Jumby is a figment of the imagination. Nevertheless, Mr. Lee was not satisfied. There was something here that he seemed to be missing, something extremely interesting, too, it appeared to him, something very different from Br'er Rabbit and similar tales of his own remembered childhood in Virginia. Once, too, he had been reading a book about Martinique and Guadalupe, those ancient jewels of France's crown, and he had not read far before he met the word zombie. After that, he knew at least that the Danes had not invented the jumbi. He heard, though vaguely, of the laborer's belief that Sven Garrick, who had long ago gone back to his home in Sweden, and Garrity, one of the smaller planters now on the island, were wolves, like Hanthropy, animal metamorphosis. It appeared formed part of this strange texture of local belief. Mr. Jaffre de Silva was one-eighth African. He was therefore, by island usage, colored. Which is as different from being black in the West Indies as anything that can be imagined. Mr. de Silva had been educated in the continental European manner. In his every word and action he reflected the faultless courtesy of his European forebearers. By every right and custom of West Indian society, Mr. de Silva was a colored gentleman whose social status was as clear-cut and definite as a cameo. These islands are largely populated by persons like Mr. De Silva. Despite the difference in their status from what it would be in North America, in the islands it has its advantages, among them that of logic. To the West Indian mind, a man whose heredity is seven-eighths derived from gentry, as like as not with authentic coats of arms, is entitled to be treated accordingly. 
That is why Mr. De Silva's many clerks, and everybody else who knew him, treated him with deference, addressed him as Sir, and doffed their hats in continental fashion when meeting. Salutes which, of course, Mr. De Silva invariably returned, even to the humblest, which is one of the marks of a gentleman anywhere. Jaffrey De Silva shifted one thin leg draped in spotless white drill over the other and lighted a fresh cigarette. Even my friends smile at me, Mr. Lee, he replied with a tolerant smile, which lightened for an instant his melancholy ivory-white countenance. They laugh at me more or less, because I admit I believe in jumbies. It is possible that everybody with even a small amount of African blood possesses that streak of belief in magic and the like. I seem, though, to have a peculiar aptitude for it. It is a matter of experience with me, sir, and my friends are free to smile at me if they wish. Most of them? Well, they do not admit their beliefs as freely as I, perhaps. Mr. Lee took another sip of the cold swizzle. He had heard how difficult it was to get Jaffrey de Silva to speak of his experiences, and he even suspected that under his host's even courtesy lay that austere pride which resents anything like ridicule, despite that tolerant smile. Please proceed, sir, urged Mr. Lee and was quite unconscious that he had just used a word which, in his native south, is reserved for gentlemen of pure Caucasian blood. When I was a young man, began Mr. De Silva, about 1894, there was a friend of mine named Hilmar Iverson, a Dane, who lived here in the town up near Moravian Church on what the people call Fowlnout Hill. Iverson had a position under the government, a clerk's job, and his office was in the fort. On his way home, he used to stop here almost every afternoon for a swizzle and a chat. We were great friends, close friends. He was then a man little past fifty, a butter tub of a fellow, very stout, and like many of that build, he suffered from heart attacks. One night a boy came here for me. It was eleven o'clock, and I was just arranging the mosquito net on my bed, ready to turn in. The servants had all gone home, so I went to the door myself, in shirt and trousers, and carried a lamp to see what was wanted. Or rather, I knew perfectly well what it was, a messenger to tell me Iverson was dead. Mr. Lee suddenly sat bolt upright. "'How could you know that?' he inquired, his eyes wide. Mr. De Silva threw away the remains of his cigarette. "'I sometimes know things like that,' he answered slowly. "'In this case, Iverson and I had been close friends for years. He and I had talked about magic and that sort of thing a great deal. Occult powers, manifestations, that sort of thing. It's a very general topic here, as you may have seen.' You would hear more of it if you continued to live here and settled into the ways of the island. In fact, Mr. Lee, Iverson and I had made a compact together. The one of us who went out first was to try to warn the other of it. You see, Mr. Lee, I had received Iverson's warning less than an hour before. I had been sitting out here on the gallery until ten o'clock or so. I was in that very chair you are occupying. Iverson had been having a heart attack. I had been to see him that afternoon. He looked just as he always did when he was recovering from an attack. In fact, he intended to return to his office the following morning. Neither of us, I am sure, had given a thought to the possibility of a sudden sinking spell. We had not even referred to our agreement. Well, it was about ten o'clock, as I've said, when all of a sudden I heard Iverson coming along through the yard below there, toward the house along that gravel path. He had apparently come through the gate from the Congan's Guard, the King Street, as they call it nowadays and I could hear his heavy step on the gravel very plainly. He had a slight limp, heavy crunch, light crunch, heavy crunch, light crunch, plod, 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 plod. Old Iverson to the life. There was no mistaking his step. There was no moon that night. The half of a waning moon was due to show itself an hour and a half later, but just then it was virtually pitch black down there in the garden. I got up out of my chair and walked over to the top of the steps, to tell you the truth, Mr. Lee, I rather suspected. I have a kind of aptitude for that sort of thing, that it was not Iverson himself. How shall I express it? I had the idea from somewhere inside me that it was Iverson trying to keep our agreement. My instinct assured me that he had just died. I cannot tell you how I knew it, but such was the case, Mr. Lee. So I waited over there, just behind you, at the top of the steps. The footfalls came along steadily. At the foot of the steps... Out of the shadow of the hibiscus bushes, it was a trifle less black than farther down the path. There was a faint illumination, too, from a lamp inside the house. I knew that if it were Iverson himself, I should be able to see him when the footsteps passed out of the deep shadow of the bushes. I did not speak. 
The footfalls came along toward that point and passed it. I strained my eyes through the gloom, and I knew I could see nothing. Then I knew Mr. Lee that Iverson had died and that he was keeping his agreement. I came back here and sat down in my chair and waited. The footfalls began to come up the steps. They came along the floor of the gallery, straight towards me. They stopped here, Mr. Lee. Just beside me, I could feel Iverson standing here, Mr. Lee. Mr. De Silva pointed to the floor with his slim, rather elegant hand. Suddenly, in the dead quiet, I could feel my hair stand up all over my scalp, straight and stiff. The chills started to run down my back and up again, Mr. Lee. I shook like a man with a ague, sitting here in my chair. I said, Iverson, I understand. Iverson, I'm afraid. My teeth were chattering like castanets, Mr. Lee. I said, Iverson, please go. You've kept the agreement. I'm sorry. I'm afraid, Iverson. The flesh is weak. I'm not afraid of you, Iverson, old friend. But you will understand, man. It's not ordinary fear. My intellect is all right, Iverson, but I'm badly panic-stricken, so please go, my friend. There had been silence, Mr. Lee, as I've said before I began to speak to Iverson, for the footsteps had stopped here beside me. But when I said that, and asked my friend to go, I could feel that he went at once, and I knew that he had understood how I meant it. It was suddenly, Mr. Lee, as though there had never been any footsteps, if you see what I mean. It is hard to put into words. I dare say, if I had been one of the labourers, I should have been halfway to Christianstead through the estates, Mr. Lee. But I was not so frightened that I could not stand my ground. After I had recovered myself a little, and my scalp had ceased its prickling and the chills were no longer running up and down my spine, I rose and I felt extremely wary, Mr. Lee. It had been exhausting, and I came into the house and drank a large tart of French brandy, and then I felt better, more like myself. I took my hurricane lantern and lighted it, and stepped down the path toward the gate leading to the Congan's guard. There was one thing I wished to see down there at the end of the garden. I wanted to see if the gate was fastened, Mr. Lee. It was. That huge iron staple that you noticed was in place. It had been used to fasten that old gate since some time in the eighteenth century, I imagine. I had not supposed anyone had opened the gate, Mr. Lee. But now I knew. There were no footprints in the gravel, Mr. Lee. I looked carefully. The marks of the bush broom, where the houseboy had swept the path on his way back from closing the gate, were undisturbed, Mr. Lee. I was satisfied, and no longer even a little frightened. I came back here and sat down and thought about my long friendship with old Iverson. I felt very sad to know that I should not see him alive again. He would never stop here again afternoons for a swizzle and a chat. About eleven o'clock I went inside the house and was preparing for bed when the rapping came at the front door. You see, Mr. Lee, I knew at once what it would mean. I went to the door in shirt and trousers and stocking feet carrying a lamp. We did not have electric light in those days. At the door stood Iverson's houseboy, a young fellow about eighteen. He was half asleep and very much upset. He cut his eyes at me and said nothing. "'What is it, man?' I asked the boy. "'Mr. Syverson sent Axio, sir. Please come to the house. Mr. Iverson die, sir.' "'What time Mr. Iverson die, man? You hear?' "'I ain't able to say what o'clock, sir. Mr. Syverson, come wake me where I sleep in a room in the yard, sir, and send me please call you. I think he die about an hour ago, sir.' I put on my shoes again and the rest of my clothes and picked up a St. Kitts supplejack. I'll get you one. It's one of those limber grapevine walking sticks. A handy thing on a dark night. I started with the boy for Iverson's house. When we had arrived almost at the Moravian church, I saw something ahead near the roadside. It was then about 11.15, and the streets were deserted. What I saw made me curious to test something. I paused and told the boy to run on ahead and tell Mrs. Iverson I would be there shortly. The boy started to trot ahead. He was pure black, Mr. Lee, but he went past what I saw without noticing it. He swerved a little away from it, and I think perhaps he slightly quickened his pace just at that point, but that was all. "'What did you see?' asked Mr. Lee, interrupting. He spoke a trifle breathlessly. His left lung was as yet far from being healed. "'The hanging jumbie," replied Mr. De Silva in his usual tones. "'Yes. There at the side of the road were three jumbies. There's a reference to that in the history of Stuart McCann. Perhaps you've run across that, eh?' Mr. Lee nodded, and Mr. De Silva quoted, There they hung, though no ladders rung, supported their dangling feet. And there's another line in the history, he continued smiling, 
which describes a typical group of hanging jumbie. Maiden, man-child, and shrew. Well, there were the usual three jumbies, apparently hanging in the air. It wasn't very light, but I could make out a boy of about twelve, a young girl, and a shriveled old woman. What the author of the history of Stuart McCann meant by the word shrew. He told me himself, by the way, Mr. Lee, that he had put feet on his jumbies mostly for the sake of convenient rhyme. Poetic license. The hanging jumbie have no feet. It is one of their peculiarities. Their legs stop at the ankles. They have abnormally long, thin legs, African legs. They are always black, you know. Their feet, if they have them, are always hidden in a kind of mist that lies along the ground whenever one sees them. They shift and weave as a full-blooded African does, standing on one foot and resting the other. You've noticed that, of course, while scratching the supporting ankle with the toes of the other foot. They do not swing in the sense that they seem to be swung on a rope. That is not what it means. They do not toil about. But they do always face the oncomer. I walked on slowly and passed them, and they kept their faces to me as they always do. I'm used to that. I went up the steps of the house to the front gallery and found Mrs. Iverson waiting for me. Her sister was with her, too. I remained sitting with them for the best part of an hour. Then two old black women who had been sent for into the country arrived. These were two old women who were accustomed to prepare the dead for burial, and I persuaded the ladies to retire and started to come home myself. It was a little past midnight, perhaps twelve fifteen. I picked out my own hat from two or three poor old Iversons that were hanging on the rack, took my supplejack, and stepped out of the door onto the little stone gallery at the head of the steps. There are about twelve or thirteen steps from the gallery down to the street. As I started down them, I noticed a third old black woman sitting all huddled together on the bottom step, with her back to me. I thought at once this must be some old crone who lived with the other two, the preparers of the dead. I imagined that she had been afraid to remain alone in their cabin, and so had accompanied them into the town. They are like children, you know, in some ways, and that, feeling too humble to come into the house, she had sat down to wait on the step and had fallen asleep. You've heard their proverbs, have you not? There's one that exactly fits the situation that I had imagined. Cockroach no wear crock and boot when he creep in fowl house. It means, be very reserved when in the presence of your betters. Quaint, rather, the poor souls. I started to walk down the steps toward the old woman. That scant half-moon had come up into the sky while I had been sitting with the ladies, and by its light everything was fairly sharply defined. I could see that old woman as plainly as I can see you now, Mr. Lee. In fact, I was looking directly at the poor old creature as I came down the steps, and fumbling in my pocket for a few coppers for, for tobacco and sugar, as they say. I was wondering, indeed, why she was not by this time on her feet and making one of their queer little bobbing bows. Cockroach bow to fowl, as they might say. It seemed this old woman must have fallen into a very deep sleep, for she had not moved at all, although ordinarily she would have heard me. For that night was deathly still, and their hearing is extraordinarily acute, like a cat's or a dog's. I remember that the fragrance from Mrs. Iverson's tuberoses and pots in the gallery railing was pouring out in a stream that night, making a greeting for the moon. It was almost overpowering. Just as I was putting my foot on the fifth step, there came a tiny little puff of fresh breeze from somewhere in the hills behind Iverson's house. It rustled the dry fronds of a palm tree that was growing beside the steps. I turned my head in that direction for an instant. Mr. Lee, when I looked back, down the steps, after what must have been a fifth of a second's inattention, that little old black woman who had been huddled up there on the lowest step, apparently sound asleep, was gone. She had vanished, utterly. And Mr. Lee, a little white dog about the size of a French poodle, was bounding up the steps toward me. With every bound, a step at a leap. The dog increased in size. It seemed to swell out there before my very eyes. Then I was really frightened. Thoroughly, utterly frightened. And I knew that if that animal so much as touched me, it meant death. Mr. Lee, absolute certain death. The little old woman was a sheen. Chen, of course. You know of lycanthropy. Wolf change, of course. Well, this was one of our varieties of it. I do not know what it would be called, I'm sure. 
mechanicanthropy, perhaps? I don't know. But something... something first cousin once removed from lycanthropy. And on the downward scale, Mr. Lee, the old woman was a were-dog. Of course, I had no time to think, only to use my instinct. I swung my supplejack with all my might, and brought it down squarely on that beast's head. It was only a step below me, then, and I could see the faint moonlight sparkling on the slaver about its mouth. It was then, it seemed to me, about the size of a medium-sized dog. Nearly wolf-sized, Mr. Lee, and a kind of deathly white. I was desperate, and the force with which I struck caused me to lose my balance. I did not fall, but it required a moment or two for me to regain my equilibrium. When I felt my feet firm under me again, I looked about frantically on all sides for the dog. But it too, Mr. Lee, like the old woman, had quite disappeared. I looked all about, you may well imagine, after that experience in the clear, thin moonlight. For yards about the foot of the steps there was no place, not even a small nook, where either the dog or the old woman could have been concealed. Neither was on the gallery, which was only a few feet square, a mere landing. But there came to my ear, sharpened by that night's experiences, from far out among the plantations at the rear of Iverson's house, the pad-pad of naked feet. Someone, something, was running desperately off in the direction of the centre of the island, back into the hills, into the deep bush. Then behind me, out of the house, onto the gallery, rushed the two old women, who had been preparing Iverson's body for its burial. They were enormously excited, and they shouted at me unintelligibly. I will have to render their words for you. Oh, the good God protect you, Master Jeffrey, sir. The Jumbi, the Jumbi. The Sheen, Master Jeffrey. He goes, sir. I reassured the poor old souls and went back home. Mr. De Silva fell abruptly silent. He slowly shifted his position in his chair and reached for and lighted a fresh cigarette. Mr. Lee was absolutely silent. He did not move. Mr. De Silva resumed deliberately after obtaining a light. You see, Mr. Lee, the West Indies are different from any other place in the world. I verily believe, sir. I've said so, anyhow, many a time, although I've never been out of the islands, except when I was a young man to Copenhagen. I've told you exactly what happened that particular night. Mr. Lee heaved a sigh. Thank you, Mr. De Silva, very much indeed, sir said he thoughtfully, and made as though to rise. His service wristwatch indicated six o'clock. "'Let us have a fresh swizzle, at least, before you go,' suggested Mr. De Silva. "'We have a saying here in the island that a man can't travel on one leg. Perhaps you've heard it already.' "'I have,' said Mr. Lee. "'Knud, Knud, you hear, man? Knud, tell Charlotte to mash up another bowl of ice, you hear? Quickly now!' commanded Mr. De Silva. End of Jumbi The Loved Dead by C. M. Eddy, Jr. and H. P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames The Loved Dead by C. M. Eddy, Jr. and H. P. Lovecraft It is midnight. Before dawn they will find me, and take me to a black cell, where I shall languish interminably while insatiable desires gnaw at my vitals and wither up my heart, till at last I become one with the dead that I love. My seat is the fetid hollow of an aged grave. My desk is the back of a fallen tombstone worn smooth by devastating centuries. My only light is that of the stars and a thin-edged moon. Yet I can see as clearly as though it were midday. Around me, on every side, sepulchral sentinels guarding unkempt graves. The tilting, decrepit headstones lie half hidden in masses of nauseous, rotting vegetation. Above the rest, silhouetted against the livid sky, an august monument 
lifts its austere tapering spire like the spectral chieftain of a Lemurian horde. The air is heavy with the noxious odours of fungi and the scent of damp, mouldy earth. But to me it is the aroma of Elysium. It is still, terrifyingly still, with a silence whose very profundity bespeaks the solemn and the hideous. Could I choose my habitation, it would be in the heart of some such city of putrefying flesh and crumbling bones, for their nearness sends ecstatic thrills through my soul, causing the stagnant blood to race through my veins and my torpid heart to pound with delirious joy, for the presence of death is life to me. My early childhood was one of long, prosaic and monotonous apathy, strictly ascetic, wan, pallid, undersized, and subject to protracted spells of morbid moroseness. I was ostracized by the healthy, normal youngsters of my own age. They dubbed me a spoil sport, an old woman, because I had no interest in the rough childish games they played or any stamina to participate in them had I so desired. Like all rural villages, Fenham had its quota of poison-tongued gossips. Their prying imaginations hailed my lethargic temperament as some abhorrent abnormality. They compared me with my parents and shook their heads in ominous doubt at the vast difference. Some of the more superstitious openly pronounced me a changeling, while others who knew something of my ancestry called attention to the vague, mysterious rumours concerning a great-great-grand-uncle who had been burned at the stake as a necromancer. Had I lived in some larger town with greater opportunities for congenial companionship, Perhaps I could have overcome this early tendency to be a recluse. As I reached my teens, I grew even more sullen, morbid, and apathetic. My life lacked motivation. I seemed in the grip of something that dulled my senses, stunted my development, retarded my activities, and left me unaccountably dissatisfied. I was sixteen when I attended my first funeral. A funeral in Fenham was a pre-eminent social event, for our town was noted for the longevity of its inhabitants. When, moreover, the funeral was that of such a well-known character as my grandfather, it was safe to assume that the townspeople would turn out en masse to pay due homage to his memory. Yet. I did not view the approaching ceremony with even latent interest. Anything that tended to lift me out of my habitual inertia held for me only the promise of physical and mental disquietude. In deference to my parents' importunings, mainly to give myself relief from their caustic condemnations of what they chose to call my unfilial attitude, I agreed to accompany them. There was nothing out of the ordinary about my grandfather's funeral, unless it was the voluminous array of floral tributes. But this, remember, was my initiation to the solemn rites of such an occasion. Something about the darkened room, the oblong coffin with its sombre drapings, the banked masses of fragrant blooms, the dolorous manifestations of the assembled villagers stirred me from my normal listlessness and arrested my attention. Roused from my momentary reverie by a nudge from my mother's sharp elbow, I followed her across the room to the casket where the body of my grandparent lay. For the first time I was face to face with death. I looked down upon the calm, placid face, lined with its multitudinous wrinkles, 
and saw nothing to cause so much of sorrow. Instead, it seemed to me that my grandfather was immeasurably content, blandly satisfied. I felt swayed by some strange, discordant sense of elation. So slowly, so stealthily had it crept over me that I could scarcely define its coming. As I mentally review that portentous hour, it seems that it must have originated with my first glimpse of that funeral scene. Silently strengthening its grip with subtle insidiousness. A baleful, malignant influence that seemed to emanate from the corpse itself held me with magnetic fascination. My whole being seemed charged with some ecstatic electrifying force and I felt my form straighten without conscious volition. My eyes were trying to burn beneath the closed lids of the dead man's and read some secret message they concealed. My heart gave a sudden leap of unholy glee and pounded against my ribs with demoniacal force as if to free itself from the confining walls of my frail frame. Wild, wanton, soul-satisfying sensuality engulfed me. Once more the vigorous prod of a maternal elbow jarred me into activity. I had made my way to the sable-shrouded coffin with leaden tread. I walked away with new-found animation. I accompanied the cortege to the cemetery, my whole physical being permeated with this mystic, enlivening influence. It was as if I had quaffed deep draughts of some exotic elixir, some abominable concoction, brewed from the blasphemous formulae in the archives of Belial. The townsfolk were so intent upon the ceremony that the radical change in my demeanour passed unnoticed by all save my father and mother. But in the fortnight that followed, the village busybodies found fresh material for their vitriolic tongues in my altered bearing. At the end of the fortnight, however, the potency of the stimulus began to lose its effectiveness. Another day or two and I had completely reverted to my old-time languor, though not to the complete and engulfing insipidity of the past. Before there had been an utter lack of desire to emerge from the enervation, now vague and indefinable unrest disturbed me. Outwardly I had become myself again, and the scandal-mongers turned to some more engrossing subject. Had they even so much as dreamed the true cause of my exhilaration, they would have shunned me as if I were a filthy, leprous thing. Had I visioned the execrable power behind my brief period of elation, I would have locked myself forever from the rest of the world and spent my remaining years in penitent solitude. Tragedy often runs in trilogies. Hence, despite the proverbial longevity of our townspeople, the next five years brought the death of both parents. My mother went first, in an accident of the most unexpected nature, and so genuine was my grief that I was honestly surprised to find its poignancy mocked and contradicted by that almost forgotten feeling of supreme and diabolical ecstasy. Once more my heart leapt wildly within me. Once more it pounded at trip-hammer speed and sent the hot blood coursing through my veins with meteoric fervour. I shook from my shoulders the harassing cloak of stagnation, only to replace it with the infinitely more horrible burden of loathsome, unhallowed desire. I haunted the death-chamber where the body of my mother lay, my soul a thirst for the devilish nectar that seemed to saturate the air of the darkened room. Every breath strengthened me 
lifted me to towering heights of seraphic satisfaction. I knew now that it was but a sort of drug delirium which must soon pass and leave me correspondingly weakened by its malign power. Yet I could no more control my longing than I could untwist the Gordian knots in the already tangled skein of my destiny. I knew, too, that through some strange satanic curse my life depended upon the dead for its motive force, that there was a singularity in my make-up which responded only to the awesome presence of some lifeless clod. A few days later, frantic for the bestial intoxicant on which the fullness of my existence depended, I interviewed Fenham's sole undertaker, and talked him into taking me on as a sort of apprentice. The shock of my mother's demise had visibly affected my father. I think that if I had broached the idea of such outre employment at any other time, he would have been emphatic in his refusal. As it was, he nodded acquiescence after a moment's sober thought. How little did I dream that he would be the object of my first practical lesson. He, too, died suddenly, developing some hitherto unsuspected heart affliction. My oxygenarian employer tried his best to dissuade me from the unthinkable task of embalming his body. Nor did he detect the rapturous glint in my eyes, as I finally won him over to my damnable point of view. I cannot hope to express the reprehensible, the unutterable thoughts that swept in tumultuous waves of passion to my racing heart as I laboured over the lifeless clay. Unsurpassed love was the keynote of these concepts, a love greater far greater than any I had borne him while he was alive. My father was not a rich man, but he had possessed enough of worldly goods to make him comfortably independent. As his sole heir, I found myself in rather a paradoxical position. My early youth had totally failed to fit me for contact with the modern world, Yet the primitive life of Fenham, with its attendant isolation, palled upon me. Indeed, the longevity of the inhabitants defeated my sole motive in arranging my indenture. After settling the estate, it proved an easy matter to secure my release, and I headed for Bayborough, a city some fifty miles away. Here my year of apprenticeship stood me in good stead. I had no trouble in establishing a favourable connection as an assistant with the Gresham Corporation, a concern that maintained the largest funeral parlours in the city. I even prevailed upon them to let me sleep upon the premises. For already the proximity of the dead was becoming an obsession. I applied myself to my task with unwanted zeal. No case was too gruesome for my impious sensibilities, and I soon became master at my chosen vocation. Every fresh corpse brought into the establishment meant a fulfilled promise of ungodly gladness, of irreverent gratification. A return of that rapturous tumult of the arteries, which transformed my grisly task into one of beloved devotion. Yet every carnal satiation exacted its toll. I came to dread the days that brought no dead for me to gloat over, and prayed to all the obscene gods of the nethermost abyss to bring swift, sure death upon the residents of the city. Then came the nights when a skulking figure stole surreptitiously through the shadowy streets of the suburbs, 
pitch dark nights when the midnight moon was obscured by heavy lowering clouds it was a furtive figure that blended with the trees and cast fugitive glances over its shoulder a figure bent on some malignant mission after one of these prowlings the morning papers would scream to their sensation mad clientele the details of some nightmare crime column on column of lurid gloating over abominable atrocities paragraph on paragraph of impossible solutions and extravagant conflicting suspicions through it all i felt a supreme sense of security for who would for a moment suspect an employee in an undertaking establishment where death was supposedly an everyday affair of seeking surcease from unnameable urgings in the cold-blooded slaughter of his fellow beings i planned each crime with maniacal cunning varying the manner of my murders so that no one would ever dream that all were the work of one blood-stained pair of hands the aftermath of each nocturnal venture was an ecstatic hour of pleasure pernicious and unalloyed a pleasure always heightened by the chance that its delicious source might later be assigned to my gloating administrations in the course of my regular occupation sometimes that double and ultimate pleasure did occur oh rare and delicious memory during the long nights when i clung to the shelter of my sanctuary i was prompted by the mausolean silence to devise new and unspeakable ways of lavishing my affections upon the dead that i loved the dead that gave me life one morning mr gresham came much earlier than usual came to find me stretched out upon a cold slab deep in ghoulish slumber my arms wrapped about the stark stiff naked body of a fetid corpse he roused me from my salacious dreams his eyes filled with mingled detestation and pity gently but firmly he told me that i must go that my nerves were unstrung that i needed a long rest from the repellent tasks my vocation required that my impressionable youth was too deeply affected by the dismal atmosphere of my environment how little did he know of the demoniacal desires that spurred me on in my disgusting infirmities i was wise enough to see that argument would only strengthen his belief in my potential madness it was far better to leave than to invite discovery of the motive underlying my actions after this i dared not stay long in one place for fear some overt act would bear my secret to an unsympathetic world i drifted from city to city from town to town i worked in morgues around cemeteries once in a crematory anywhere that afforded me an opportunity to be near the dead that i so craved then came the world war i was one of the first to go across one of the last to return four years of blood-red carnal hell sickening slime of rain-rotten trenches deafening bursts of hysterical shells monotonous droning of sardonic bullets smoking frenzies of phlegethon's fountains stifling fumes of murderous gases grotesque remnants of smashed and shredded bodies four years of transcendent satisfaction in every wanderer there is a latent urge to return to the scenes of his childhood 
a few months later found me making my way through the familiar byways of Fenham. Vacant, dilapidated farmhouses lined the adjacent roadsides, while the years had brought equal retrogression to the town itself. A mere handful of the houses were occupied, but among these was the one I had once called home. The tangled, weed-choked driveway, the broken window panes, the uncared-for acres that stretched behind, all bore mute confirmation of the tales that guarded inquiries had elicited. That it now sheltered a dissolute drunkard, who eked out a meagre existence from the chores his few neighbours gave him out of sympathy for the mistreated wife and the undernourished child who shared his lot. All in all, the glamour surrounding my youthful environment was entirely dispelled, so prompted by some errant foolhardy thought, I next turned my steps toward Bayborough. Here, too, the years had brought changes, but in reverse order. The small city I remembered had almost doubled in size despite its wartime depopulation. Instinctively, I sought my former place of employment, finding it still there but with an unfamiliar name and successor too above the door, for the influenza epidemic had claimed Mr. Gresham while the boys were overseas. Some fateful mood impelled me to ask for work. I referred to my tutelage under Mr. Gresham with some trepidation, but my fears were groundless. My late employer had carried the secret of my unethical conduct with him to the grave. An opportune vacancy ensured my immediate reinstallation. Then came vagrant haunting memories of scarlet nights of impious pilgrimages, and an uncontrollable desire to renew those illicit joys. I cast caution to the winds and launched upon another series of damnable debaucheries. Once more the yellow sheets found welcome material in the devilish details of my crimes, comparing them to the red weeks of horror that had appalled the city years before. Once more the police sent out their dragnet and drew into its enmeshing folds nothing. My thirst for the noxious nectar of the dead grew to a consuming fire, and I began to shorten the periods between my odious exploits. I realized that I was treading on dangerous ground, but demoniac desire gripped me in its torturing tentacles and urged me on. All this time my mind was becoming more and more benumbed to any influence except the cessation of my insane longings. Little details vitally important to one bent on such evil escapades escaped me. Somehow, Somewhere I left a vague trace, an elusive clue behind. Not enough to warrant my arrest, but sufficient to turn the tide of suspicion in my direction. I sensed this espionage, yet was helpless to stem the surging demand for more dead to quicken my enervated soul. Then came the night when the shrill whistle of the police roused me from my fiendish gloating over the body of my latest victim, a gory razor still clutched tightly in my hand. With one dexterous motion, I closed the blade and thrust it into the pocket of the coat I wore. Nightsticks beat a lusty tattoo upon the door. I crashed the window with a chair, thanking fate I had chosen one of the cheaper tenement districts for my locale. I dropped into a dingy alley as blue-coated forms burst through the shattered door. 
over shaky fences through filthy backyards past squalid ramshackled houses down dimly lighted narrow streets i fled i thought at once of the wooded marshes that lay beyond the city and stretched for half a hundred miles till they touched the outskirts of fenham if i could reach this goal i would be temporarily safe before dawn i was plunging headlong through the foreboding wasteland stumbling over the rotting roots of half-dead trees whose naked branches stretched out like grotesque arms striving to encumber me with mocking embraces the imps of the nefarious gods to whom i offered my idolatrous prayers must have guided my footsteps through the menacing morass a week later wan bedraggled and emaciated i lurked in the woods a mile from fenham so far i had eluded my pursuers yet i dare not show myself for i knew that the alarm must have been sent broadcast i vaguely hoped i had thrown them off the trail after that first frenetic night i had heard no sound of alien voices no crashing of heavy bodies through the underbrush perhaps they had concluded that my body lay hidden in some stagnant pool or had vanished forever in the tenacious quagmire hunger gnawed at my vitals with poignant pangs thirst left my throat parched and dry yet far worse was the unbearable hunger of my starving soul for the stimulus i found only in the nearness of the dead my nostrils quivered in sweet recollection no longer could i delude myself with the thought that this desire was a mere whim of the heated imagination i knew now that it was an integral part of life itself that without it i should burn out like an empty lamp i summoned all my remaining energy to fit me for the task of satisfying my accursed appetite despite the peril attending my move i set out to reconnoitre skirting the sheltering shadows like an obscene wraith once more i felt that strange sensation of being led by some unseen satellite of satan yet even my sin-steeped soul revolted for a moment when i found myself before my native abode the scene of my youthful hermitage then these disquieting memories faded in their place came overwhelming lustful desire behind the rotting walls of this old house lay my prey a moment later i had raised one of the shattered windows and climbed over the sill i listened for a moment every sense alert every muscle tensed for action the silence reassured me with cat-like tread i stole through the familiar rooms until stertorous snores indicating the place where i was to find surcease from my sufferings i allowed myself a sigh of anticipatory ecstasy as i pushed open the door of the bedchamber panther-like i made my way to the supine form stretched out in drunken stupor the wife and child where were they well they could wait my clutching fingers groped for his throat hours later i was again the fugitive but a new-found stolen strength was mine three silent forms slept to wake no more it was not until the garish light of day penetrated my hiding-place that i visualized the certain consequences of my rashly purchased relief by this time the bodies must have been discovered even the most obtuse of the rural police must surely link the tragedy with my flight from the nearby city besides for the first time i had been careless enough to leave some tangible proof of my identity 
my fingerprints on the throats of the newly dead. All day I shivered in nervous apprehension. The mere crackling of a dry twig beneath my feet conjured mental images that appalled me. That night, under cover of the protecting darkness, I skirted Fenham and made for the woods that lay beyond. Before dawn came the first definite hint of renewed pursuit, the distant baying of hounds. Through the long night I pressed on, but by morning I could feel my artificial strength ebbing. Noon brought once more the insistent call of the contaminating curse, and I knew I must fall by the way unless I could once more experience that exotic intoxication that came only with the proximity of the loved dead. I had travelled in a wide semicircle. If I pushed steadily ahead, Midnight would bring me to the cemetery where I had laid away my parents years before. My only hope, I felt certain, lay in reaching this goal before I was overtaken. With a silent prayer to the devils that dominated my destiny, I turned leaden feet in the direction of my last stronghold. God! Can it be that a scant twelve hours have passed since I started for my ghostly sanctuary? I have lived an eternity in each leaden hour, but I have reached a rich reward. The noxious odours of this neglected spot are frankincense to my suffering soul. The first streaks of dawn are greying the horizon. They are coming. My sharp ears catch the far-off howling of the dogs. It is but a matter of minutes before they find me and shut me away forever from the rest of the world, to spend my days in ravaging yearnings, till at last I join the dead that I love. They shall not take me. A way of escape is open. A coward's choice, perhaps. But better, far better than endless months of nameless misery. I leave this record behind me, that some soul may perhaps understand why I make this choice. The razor. It has nestled forgotten in my pocket since my flight from Baybro. Its blood-stained blade gleams oddly in the waning light of the thin-edged moon. One slashing stroke across my wrist, and deliverance is assured. Warm, fresh blood spatters grotesque patterns on dingy, decrepit slabs. Phantasmal hordes swarm over the rotting graves. Spectral fingers beckon me on. Ethereal fragments of unwritten melodies rise in celestial crescendo. Distant stars dance drunkenly in demoniac accompaniment. A thousand tiny hammers beat hideous dissonances on anvils inside my chaotic brain. Grey ghosts of slaughtered spirits parade in mocking silence before me. Scorching tongues of invisible flame sear the brand of hell upon my sickened soul. I can write no more. The End of The Loved Dead by C. M. Eddy Jr. and H. P. Lovecraft Recording by Andy Sames The Most Horrible Story by John W. Jakes this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Cook The Most Horrible Story by John W. Jakes The room was a very plain room. It had four walls, a ceiling, a floor. But it was new to Thompson because he had never seen it before. 
He stood in a relaxed fashion, studying it. There was a desk in the center of the room. It was gray, but Thompson could not identify the material from which it was made. A very old man with a clipped beard sat behind the desk. A candle flickered in a brass holder on top of the desk. Pardon me, said Thompson. The old man looked at him. He had been looking at Thompson for a long time. In fact, Thompson could not remember a time when the old man had not been looking at him. You like horror stories, I take it, the old man said. That's why you're here. Everybody in the world likes a good horror story, at least once in their lives. Yes, said Thompson, filled with a vague relief. I guess that's why I'm here. Fine, said the old man. He reached into the desk. Where, Thompson couldn't tell. Just out of sight. No drawer slid. But his hands came out, and they held a white card. Again they vanished. This time they held a metal-pointed pen. There was ink in the pen. It shone with a night-blue luster in the candle flame. Name, said the old man. James Thompson. Born? Thompson thought a minute. March 3rd, 1902. Is all this necessary? The old man seemed annoyed. Of course. We must have all the records, in order that you may become a full-time member. Full-time member of what? Thompson asked. He noticed that the pen seemed always full of ink. The Horror Book Club, of course, the old man replied. He scratched on the card writing down the information Thompson had given him. Then he put both card and pen out of sight under the desk. His hands came back up empty. Everything has been taken care of, he said, smiling. You've been admitted. Is that right? Thompson said aloud. He had begun to wonder whether membership in this club was exclusive. The candle kept on burning, but it stayed the same size. Er, what kind of books do you have? I mean... Could you let me have an idea of some of your titles? Dracula, Frankenstein, The Turn of the Screw, things like that? The old man laughed again, this time like he was chiding a small and extremely foolish child. Oh no, Mr. Thompson, we deal in actual, stark horror. We never use second-rate products. The hands dipped down again. Thompson wondered if it was some kind of game. They came back up. They put a book on the desk. It was a thin book roughly a foot square. It had a whitish cover. The old man's fingers rasped on the cover when he put it down on the desk. Human skin, the old man said cheerfully. Very good binding. Um, yes, said Thompson. He glanced at the cover. In square letters, the cover said, The Most Horrible Story in the World. Smaller type, down near the lower right-hand corner, said, James Thompson, January 3rd, 1953. Why, that's today, Thompson said. The old man waved. A formality. We always record the books when a new member enters the club. Keeps the records straight. Oh, Thompson said. Do I just start reading? The old man shook his head and got up. He took the book in one hand, the candle in the other. I'll conduct you to one of our reading rooms. We provide special reading rooms for the use of members. Thompson did not comment. He followed the old man. They went through an opening in the wall that he had not seen before, but it was in a dim corner, difficult to see clearly. They walked down a long hall. On each side of the hall were closed doors. The candle made shapes move on the walls. What's that screaming? Thompson asked, a bit puzzled. It seems to come from behind these doors. That's right, the old man said over his shoulder. This is the horror book club, you know. All of our members take an active interest in their reading. They participate. They get horrified. It's really a horrible book, you know. Is it? Thompson felt a slight tingle of expectancy run along his back. He felt somewhat masochistic at the moment. A new thought struck him. Is that the only book you carry? Yes, said the old man. We've had many additions made. It's the most horrible story in the world. You understand. The most horrible one ever conceived. That's why all our members read it. The hall seemed to stretch on endlessly. Doors marched by. Screams faded. 
New screams took their place. How late are you open? Thompson asked. I stay here all the time, the old man said. Members are always coming in. They usually stay for a long time. The book is irresistible. Must be, Thompson said. Finally, they came to a door. The old man stopped. He seemed to pull at the door and it opened, although there was no handle on it. He motioned Thompson inside. The reading room had one chair and one table. An unlit candle stood on the table. The old man applied flame from his candle. Severe, he said, indicating the room, but functional. All you really need to enjoy a good horror story. Well, thanks, Thompson stammered. The old man put the book down on the table. Do, er, is it customary to pay or tip? Thompson said awkwardly. Oh, no. The founders take care of that. Um, founders? Still alive, eh? Oh, certainly. Must like horror stories to set up a place like this. They do, the old man assured him. Well, I hope you like the book. He walked out and closed the door. Thompson said, well, a couple of times. Saw that no one was listening, laughed foolishly, and sat down on the chair. He picked up the book, feeling the tingle in his spine once more. He opened the book. He began to read. It was a very short story. He finished it almost immediately. And it certainly was horrible. Almost too horrible. He closed the book and got up. His face felt very pale. He went to the door. He tried to open it. It would not open. Old man, he yelled. Old man! Old man! He was so insistent in his yelling that he did not stop to think about the other screaming out in the hall. He expected the old man to come, and he did. The old man's voice said through the door, Yes? I don't like this book, Thompson said. The old man said nothing. And the door's locked. I want to leave. You can't. What do you mean I can't? What kind of place is this anyway? His tone was threatening, belligerent, and weak. You're a member now. It was very final. Thompson felt that the old man was gone. He shouted, Old man! Old man! There was no answer. He went back to the table. His stomach seemed to be gone. He opened the book. He read the story again. He couldn't help reading it. It had a kind of fascination. He began to see the true horror in the tale. When he had reread it for the fifth time, he started to scream. Everybody else screamed. Why shouldn't he? After all, he was in the mood. His stomach felt icy. The candle kept on burning, but it always stayed the same size. His eyes showed a glazed expression of madness as the full import of what he had just read registered on his mind. And then he screamed. And screamed. He alternated between periods of screaming and reading. And each time he read the book, it became more horrible. The infinity of horrible horror was something too vast to contemplate. He felt no need for food, or water, or sleep. The story was so horrible. Thompson stopped screaming again and opened the book, perhaps for the thousandth time. He anticipated it now, anticipated the screaming it would cause. The candle kept on burning. Thompson read the story from the book of skin with his name on it. He read it rapidly. It was a very short story. You're dead. End of The Most Horrible Story by John W. Jakes Recording by Frank Cook Over the Wire by Eugene Jones This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winston Tharp Over the Wire by Eugene Jones Snow and ice on that mountain. Nothing but snow. The wind drove it with a howl against the windows where it stuck on the warm panes. Sometimes I could just make out the blur of the semaphore lights, and sometimes I couldn't. 
All day the blizzard had dumped its swirling load about us, and now, when night closed down, the storm took the tower in its teeth, shaking it like you've seen a dog shake a rat. Oh, we were warm and cozy enough with our stove red hot, which was more than Donaldson, the agent at Hastings, could say. His wire talk was rotten and chattery, and he told us he'd run out of coal. Looked like he'd freeze to death, according to him. But Big Ben prophesied grimly that Donaldson could take care of himself, so we might as well save our worries. I don't suppose you've ever heard of Big Ben, but that is your loss. Every soul on the mountain division knew him. His moor snapped out like a track torpedo, fast, too, but accurate, staccato, with a smooth flow as if a machine had got hold of the key. Dots and dashes were part of him, for after years of it he could express himself better that way. Sort of feeling for the language, I suppose. I've seen the same gift since, but never to the extent Ben possessed it, why he could come mighty close to telling the color of your eyes over a telegraph wire. He and I had worked Tower BB-17 on the Mountain Division for three years, and during that time I never saw him flurried. Once a freight running extra got by us, dispatcher tangled up his train sheet. Forty minutes later a relay came in to stop her, or she'd meet 87 on the big grade. It takes just forty minutes to run from our tower to Hastings, further down the line. Hastings is the last station with a siding before the grade. In other words, the freight ought to have been getting her okay from Hastings right then. Was Ben excited? Not one little bit. Donaldson caught his first call. Clear as a bell it was. And Donaldson had time to flag the freight. But the particular night I'm speaking of, my side partner appeared a bit uneasy, which was enough to set my think tank working. He'd drop down alongside the key for a moment. Then he'd wander over to the windows, trying to pierce the blizzard. He was a big man, with a hearty laugh and a mouth full of teeth and a whiskered chin full of determination. His red hair, as brilliant as the glow in his corncob pipe, usually stood on end. But his eyes were gray and pleasant. That is, generally they were. Yet I've noticed them hard as rocks, drilling into you with a gleam in them like you see jumping across a spark gap. Right now, they were anxious. Perhaps that wasn't so strange, either, for all day long, from the length of the division, had come bunches of trouble. A snowshed out here, a freight ditched there, hell to pay everywhere. Wires were down, too. Not a word could we get below Hastings or north of the junction. Toward night, every siding was overflowing with dead-headed rolling stock. You see, the big grade, its four and a half percent in places, handicaps us, because even our best oil burners won't haul much tonnage on it in a blizzard. They can't make steam. And this particular frolic of the elements promised to beat anything that had struck us in twenty years. At 10 p.m., the chief dispatcher ordered the line cleared for the night, barring number 77 southbound which was to make her run as usual. I reckon you've heard of that train, the Cumberland Limited, all steel and solid Pullman. She was to follow a snowplow, and headquarters gossip filtering to us hinted she might find the blizzard a bit of a teaser. Suddenly Big Ben turned on me. Jim, said he, I don't like it. What's the old man thinking of to let 77 through? Have you heard what she's carrying tonight? I allowed I hadn't. Well, there's something like 100,000 gold in her express car. Government consignment. I got it straight. What a chance for a hold-up. Remember that cut below Hastings? He shook his massive head dubiously. It's been done before. As if to emphasize his words, the storm swooped down with renewed energy until the tower swayed like a lighthouse. Great guns, how this wind shrieked at us. How the snow thudded against the windows. And when you hear snow, you know there's a double-headed gale behind it. About that time our call came over the wire. N.H. 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 As Ben jumped in, I put down my paper to listen. I find it's a good thing to pay pretty strict attention to anything on a night like that. It keeps you from seeing shadows that aren't there and hearing sounds which your common sense tells you must be the wind. 
Presently came the professional dot and dash of Donaldson down at Hastings. Now Donaldson, next to Big Ben, was a star operator, and the two of them could talk better and with more satisfaction over a stretch of singing wire than if they were sitting together in a parlor. Even I knew Donaldson's style, although I wasn't more than middling expert. There were tricks in his stuff, such as shortening his O's, but his Morris ran mighty smooth. I read off the message to myself. Freezing cold down here, Ben. Lonely, too. Damn lonely. What do you get on 77? The big man at the table cut in. Brace up. 77 on time. Nothing to bother her tonight except the storm. All freight deadheaded. That seemed to satisfy Donaldson, for there was a long silence broken only by the whine of the wind and the thud, thud of driven snow. I had just picked up the paper again when... N.H. 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 snapped at us. The crispness of dots and dashes suggested excitement. Ben acknowledged deliberately, but when he closed the wire, I saw a narrowing of his eyes. Donaldson was in a hurry. Going to quit tomorrow, he began. Can't stand this joint. Say, there's two of you up there. You're lucky. Old man will have to come across with an assistant or I quit. Do you know you're the nearest white man to me? Just me, alone here. No night for a man to be alone. Hold on, I think I hear somebody in the waiting room. Maybe I'll have company. But he opened up again the next moment with, Good Lord, must be going off my nut. Nobody in the waiting room. It's the wind. I tell you, this place is like the North Pole. If I could only hear a fire crackling. Say, there it goes again. No, I'm way off. That's a fact. I'll have to look around. Do you notice anything funny in the wind? I seem to. Why the devil don't they put shades on these windows? What's the matter with me, anyhow? Ben went back at him, calm as a summer's day. Hold on, old man. Take some whiskey. It's your nerves. Get a grip on yourself. All right, answered Donaldson, his wire talk becoming calmer. Yes, I'll take the whiskey. Let me know about 77. That was all for a while. But Ben eyed me through the fumes of his pipe. I don't like it, he muttered. Not a bit. Never knew Donaldson a wild cat before. Wonder if there is anything wrong. I didn't say what was on my mind, for the shriek of the storm had erupted. So we just sat still and looked at each other and wondered what it could be like if either of us weren't there. Somehow I couldn't get rid of the picture of Hastings Station, a little frame building backed up against a cliff with a siding cut in behind it and the banked curve of the main line stretching away before it. A few farmers used the station, but a water tank was its real excuse for existence. I could see how the snow had half buried it and how Donaldson, veteran that he was, might hear strange sounds in the gale. I could see a great many things right then, but the sight wasn't pleasant. Snow, snow, and more snow, and icy rails, and low, hurrying clouds you felt were brushing against the tower. Listen, I snapped. Ben jumped to his feet. This won't do. Here, you quit listening or you'll be as bad as Donaldson. Then he came over to me. I guess it's just as well there are two of us, he said very quietly. Try the junction for a report on 77. I took the key with a sense of awe, only a couple of slim wires between us and the world, and a thousand chances for the storm to tear them down. But if we felt it, what about Donaldson? What about Donaldson, anyway? The junction answered after a bit, though there was no life in the sending. McFinn, nodded Ben. I know his style. Ask him whether the orders for 77 stand. I did. Sure, click McFinn. 77 on time. Pass her through. Rotten night, isn't it? They got a plow leading the limited like a blind baby. So long. That was at 11.2. Twenty minutes later, Donaldson started after us again. But it was a chattering, wild Donaldson, a new Donaldson, who tumbled his letters over each other. N.H. N.H. N.H he stuttered, even after I had opened the wire. 
NH, NH, NH. I sent him a string of R's a mile long before he acknowledged. Then, what's the matter with you up there? He clicked. Gone to sleep? But you can't sleep now. You've got to talk to me or I'll be ready for the queer house. Something is walking up and down outside my window. I've seen it twice. It can't be a man. And animals don't prowl around in a storm like this. Listen to that wind. I tell you, it's walking around the station. What am I saying? Do you believe in ghosts? It was in the waiting room a while back, but it got out before I had a shot at it. What would you do if you were down here alone, snowed in like a damned Eskimo? What would you do if it started to walk? Big Ben strode across the room. Give me the key he thundered. His eyes were hard gray now, like rock, with little points of fire in them, and it seemed he would smash the instrument as he crashed down with Donaldson's call. Stop that, went the dots and dashes, clear-cut, fast, but lordy, they had a punch behind them. Pull yourself together. Take some more whiskey. Wake up. Remember, you're an operator. You've got to handle the limited tonight. No more of that. You know damned well nothing is walking around down there except you, Rub some snow in your face. Wake up, I say. I'll talk to you as much as you like, but no more spook stuff. You're right, came the slower response. I won't bother you any more. Nevertheless, it's walking around here. Maybe I'll get a shot at it. I'll let you know if I do. That was all. And Ben and I looked across the table into each other's eyes. Well, I questioned. He shook himself as if trying to get rid of something clinging. Oh, Donaldson is getting old, he muttered. It's lonely down there, and its fire is out. That's what I make of it. When the wind howls and you're on a night shift in a godforsaken spot like Hastings, you're mighty apt to hear and see a little more than you've any business to. The next word that came flashing over the wire left no doubt in our minds. Either Donaldson was clean crazy or... Well, he must be crazy. Ever see a face half black and half white? Stuttered our instrument. I had a shot at it. It's still walking. Ben waited an instant, then sent. J.J., Donaldson's call, steady for three minutes, but he might as well have opened the window and yelled out into the storm. The wire was either dead or Hastings wouldn't answer. Presently, McFinn at the junction got busy. Just okayed 77, he said. Devilish night. The Limited looked like a hunk of the mountain on wheels. Bet the snow on the car roofs got scraped off on the top of the tunnels. Happy dreams. But we weren't to indulge in any happy dreams for some time to come. Hardly had McFinn shut up when... N.H. 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 Called Ben back. Lord! He groaned. Hear that style? It's Donaldson. But what's happened to him? I hate to listen to it. Dull, lifeless, flat came the dots and dashes from Hastings. No use, clicked Donaldson. This hide and seek is beyond me. Its face is half black and half white, and bullets don't worry it. I'm a gone duck. Never mind me. Anyhow, Hell is warm and not as lonesome as this. I'm freezing, and that's no ghost story. For God's sake, Ben's reply flew forth. Can that stuff. Pull yourself together, old man. Forget the face or whatever it is. Seventy-seven's on time. Hold hard. Sure, agreed Donaldson wearily. I'll handle the limited. How's the storm up there? Quitting lied Ben, and went to the window. Then followed an hour of silence, with only the shriek of the wind and the thud of snow. I reckon the two of us smoked considerable tobacco during that hour, and we played a few games of checkers, too, but our minds wandered. When at last we heard the shrill squeal of 77's whistle above the noise of the blizzard, we felt happy, just to know there were other people near us. Believe me, that was some relief. Far off the line we could make out the headlight of the Limited like a blinking, misty moon creeping toward us. Ben glanced at his semaphore levers. Down she bore on us, the din of her drivers, muffled by snow. 
There was the thunder of moving tons, a blast of cinders against the tower windows, and a snaky line of black as the Pullmans flashed past under their white caps. We watched her red taillights around the curve. J.J. 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 clicked Ben back at the table. And directly, Hastings answered in the same lifeless style. Limited just passed okay, went on my side partner. How are you feeling? Donaldson's wire talk was worse than ever. F Fine, he stuttered. Maybe I can hold out. The damn thing's always near me. It's cold here. I've got my feet on the stove. Say, this stove is a joke. It's so empty it's going to cave in pretty soon. Wait a minute. Let me try another shot. Nothing more. Not another word, though we took turns at the key. And when Ben relighted his pipe, I didn't like the look on his face. Jim, he began, there's things in this world none of us can understand. I reckon after all that, maybe I misjudged Donaldson. Perhaps he's up against one of them. Quit, I bellowed. You watch yourself or you'll be splitting a switch too. As you said a while back, Donaldson's nervous and cold. That's what's the matter with him, nothing else. Ben, mumbling a reply, turned again to the window. If possible, the storm was worse. I don't exactly remember how it happened. I must have dozed off about then, being pretty tuckered out. Anyhow, the first thing I knew, Ben was shaking the life out of me. I'll never forget the expression of his face as I opened my eyes. His eyes were all red. His hands were working. His jaw set. Wake up, Jim, he asked. I heard it, too. No, he went on as I instinctively looked toward the window. Not there. Over the wire. Listen. I listened, but for a long time nothing broke the vibrating stillness of the tower, and I got to thinking it was another case of nerves. Then... Father above us, may I never again hear such a sound. Our instruments started to whisper. You laugh, do you? But if you'd been there, you wouldn't have laughed. We went over to the table on tiptoe, hardly daring to breathe. The little steel bar trembled, moved down, snapped back, barely closing the contact. It was like a dying man framing words he couldn't utter. I followed in my mind the course of the single drumming wire over the trestles, through the ravines, under the mountains. What manner of thing was pressing the key at the other end? Ben dropped forward with an oath and pillowed his elbows on the table, as if his nearness might aid him. Listen, he begged. Oh, Jim, listen. Presently the instrument quivered again, but this time the impulse was stronger. Horribly flaccid, monotonously regular, like the labored effort of an amateur, came the message which shall forever sear my memory with unspeakable horror. God in heaven, help me. I can't stand this. They chain cross ties to the rails. They will ditch the limited. I'm done for. Hell is nearer now. Help, dear God, help me. That was all. Ben tore at the key, sending out into the night. J.J. 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 Until my head swam. But no response came. Not the least flutter only agonizing, storm-shrieking silence. Then he gave it up and staggered to his feet. His face was as gray as slate. Jim, he gasped. Donaldson is dead. I know it. It was a dying man who sent that message. I grabbed him by the shoulders. You fool, I yelled. He can't be dead. He sent it. Don't you understand? They're going to wreck the Limited. Donaldson was telling us. He may be wounded. We've got to get to him. Slowly, as if his body was awakening from sleep, the muscles in his shoulders under my hand tightened. Sure, I get you, he whispered. And before I knew what he was doing, he shook me off, rushing blindly for the stairs. 
"'Come on, Jim, for God's sake, hurry,' he called. "'Bring my gun and some torpedoes. "'It's only five miles by the road, thirty down the mountain by the track. "'Let's try the car.' "'I stopped long enough to be sure the revolver we kept in a drawer was loaded, "'stuffed some torpedoes in my pocket, and followed him. "'Out into the gale he sped to where he kept his little second-hand mud-spattered gas wagon. "'I had always kidded him about it, laughed at it, but now I prayed.' Yes, funny when you think of it, me, praying. But I did. Prayed it would run. Prayed there was gas and oil in it. Once away from the lee of the building, the storm wrapped around us, flinging the snow in our faces, making us gasp for breath. We were taking desperate chances and breaking all rules, this leaving a tower vacant. But what could we do? What in God's name could we do? When I caught up with Ben, he was cranking the engine desperately. I propped the shanty door open, though the blast of wind threatened to fairly tear it from its hinges. Fortunately, the radiator of the car had anti-freezing mixture in it. After an agonizing moment, the engine gave a couple of disgusted coughs and died. But Ben went right on. He spun that thing till I was dizzy as I sat with my hand on the throttle, feeding it raw gas. When there seemed no chance left, and I could see the limited a burning blackened mass and hear the cries of the injured, the engine started missing like thunder, to be sure. Ben leaped in beside me and let in his clutch. Once beyond the shanty, our headlights ended in a whirling bank of snow, and the cold stabbed like a driven nail. But the engine was running better now. How my side partner found the road, or how he kept that rickety piece of junk from chucking us down a ravine, I'll never know. But he did. Yes, by the grace of the Lord, he did. Pitching like a ship in a storm, sinking now and then up to our hubs, we jounced on down that mountain. What everlasting miles of emptiness, what biting pain as our ears and hands and noses turned red, then white. Once we heard the shriek of the limited below us on the grade. Once we saw the flash of our furnace door. Seconds turned into minutes, minutes into hours. Would we be in time? I set my teeth and prayed some more. Ah, we had hit the last stretch, and through the smother we could see the semaphore lights of Hastings Station, also the light in the building itself. Our car snorted and groaned as Ben fed it the gas, skidding to the edge of a precipice or flinging us half out of our seats, but we never thought of that. And now came the wail of the Limited's whistle, this time above us. Her headlight flickered across the cut, touching the station with uncertain fingers. The semaphore was set green. I shivered, but not from cold. If only we had half a chance. But the everlasting snow, how it clung to our wheels, and under it our tire chains spun gratingly in red clay, which flecked the white of the road like blood. Bearing down on Hastings Station, gathering speed with each pound of the drivers, thundered the Limited. We were playing the passage of a minute against a pile of cross ties, and the forfeit was death. Now we reached the nearest point to the right-of-way, and as we jerked to a halt, a black figure appeared on the depot platform against the light. I saw the flash of a gun and heard a bullet sing past. But Ben paid no heed. Throwing himself from the car, he floundered over to the track. I ran toward the station, firing as I went. Once I looked back, Ben was kneeling down, adjusting torpedoes under the very pilot of the plow. Now there isn't any use of my explaining how the Limited roared by, her engineer satisfied with the green of the semaphore, nor how he gave her the air when the torpedoes warned him, nor for that matter of the futile pursuit of the bandits who had intended to ditch her. All that came out in a morning paper. If I remember, there was even a picture of the pile of cross ties chained to the track. The fact that will interest you is what we discovered in Hastings Station. Without bothering to explain to 77's wondering crew, we dashed into the waiting room and threw open the door of the ticket office. At the table sat Donaldson. He was stiff and rigid, and from an ugly blotched hole in his neck there crept a frozen stream of blood. His right hand still rested on the telegraph key. "'Good God!' I muttered. "'Dead! He never moved after he was shot.' And then, somehow feeling Ben's eyes upon me, I looked at him. His smile was ghastly. Sure, he said. 
I told you so, back in the tower. He never moved after he was shot. And what about that message? How did he know about the cross ties? Shut up, I shrieked. Let's get him out of this. We'll go down on 77. I'm through. End of Over the Wire by Eugene Jones Restitution by Charles Hinckley From Snappy Stories, March 4th, 1916 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Restitution by Charles Hinckley Funny you should have called Peter Huntley a miser, commented young Phelps, forcing his way into the circle about the blazing log fire. Not that he isn't, he hastened to add, as one or two attempted interruption. But it's peculiar that you should be talking of it now. What's the story? asked Hoadley. The others hitched forward their chairs and gave ear. Nothing much. I met Huntley downtown this evening, just after dark. He had just picked up a newspaper that some man had dropped and was reading it under the glare of a corner light. He joined me, and we walked down the avenue. His clothes were threadbare, as usual. At the corner of Corning Avenue, a woman accosted us and asked for alms. She was, oh, thirty-five, maybe, but she looked sixty. A human wreck at the very bottom rung of the ladder. She had a bundle in her arms to fool people into thinking it was a baby. And Huntley, the miser, the dollar squeezer, Phelps paused for dramatic effect, handed her a crisp, new five dollar bill. Silence fell on the circle. Then Donovan laughed derisively. You've been drinking. He asserted Huntley would sell his immortal soul for five dollars Peter Huntley finished the frugal meal prepared by himself for himself in his musty ill-furnished bedroom He raised the wick of the lamp slightly begrudging even the tiny additional waste of oil and drew from the desk drawer six bank books Huntley kept his money in six banks for safety's sake. He smiled contently at the list of deposits appearing in their columns. Then he frowned. That five dollars might have gone in there too, he moaned. He lowered the light again and placed the bank books away affectionately, tenderly. Then he defied his clothes and climbed into the rickety cot in the corner. And as he lay there, he remembered the girl of his youth, his love for her, their elopement, their month together, and then the brutal way he had deserted her, without even having gone through the formality of a marriage ceremony. He had almost forgotten her, until tonight. The wreck to whom he had given five dollars was the girl of long ago. Five dollars. He sighed wearily. Then a new thought struck him. He smiled contentedly as he turned on his side. At last, he murmured, I can sleep in peace. I have made restitution. The End of Restitution by Charles Hinckley Ring Once for Death by Robert Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Cook. Ring Once for Death by Robert Arthur. Twenty years had left no trace inside Sam Key's little shop on Mott Street. There were the same dusty jars of ginseng root and tiger's whiskers the same little bronze Buddhas, the same gim cracks mixed with fine jade. 
Edith Williams gave a little murmur of pleasure as the door shut behind them. Mark, she said, it hasn't changed. It doesn't look like as if a thing had been sold since we were here on our honeymoon. It certainly doesn't, Dr. Mark Williams agreed, moving down the narrow aisle behind her. If someone hadn't told us Sam Key was dead, I'd believe we'd step back twenty years in time, like they do in those scientific stories Dr. David reads. We must buy something, his wife said, for a twentieth anniversary present for me. Perhaps a bell? From the shadowy depths of the shop a young man emerged. American in dress and manner, despite the oriental contours of his face and eyes. Good evening, he said. May I show you something? We think we want a bell, Dr. Williams chuckled. But we aren't quite sure. You're Sam Key's son? Sam Key, Jr. My honored father passed to the halls of his ancestors five years ago. I could just say that he died. Black eyes twinkled. But customers like the more flowery mode of speech. They think it's quaint. I think it's just nice and not quaint at all, Edith Williams declared. We're sorry your father is dead. We'd hope to see him again. Twenty years ago, when we were a very broke young couple on a honeymoon, he sold us a wonderful rose crystal necklace for half price. I'm sure he'll still make a profit, the black eyes twinkled again. But if you'd like a bell, here are small temple bells, camel bells, dinner bells, but even as he spoke, Edith Williams' hand darted to something at the back of the shelf. A bell carved out of crystal, she exclaimed, and a rose crystal at that. What could be more perfect? A rose crystal wedding present and a rose crystal anniversary present. The young man half stretched out his hand. I don't think you want that, he said. It's broken. Broken? Edith Williams rubbed off the dust and held the lovely bell shape of crystal, the size of a pear to the light. It looks perfect to me. I mean, it's not complete. Something of the American had vanished from the young man. It has no clapper. It will not ring. Why, that's right. Mark Williams took the bell. The clapper's missing. We can have another clapper made, his wife declared. That is, if the original can't be found. The young Chinese shook his head. The bell and the clapper were deliberately separated by my father twenty years ago. He hesitated, then added, My father was afraid of this bell. Afraid of it? Mark Williams raised his eyebrows. The other hesitated again. It will probably sound like a story for tourists, he said, but my father believed it. This bell was supposedly stolen from the temple of a sect of Buddhists somewhere in the mountains of China's interior. Just as many Occidentals believe that the Chinese Judgment Day will be heralded by a blast on St. Peter's trumpet, so this small sect is said to believe that when the bell like this one is rung, a bell carved from a single piece of rose crystal, and consecrated by ceremonies lasting ten years, any dead within sound of it will rise and live again. Heavenly! Edith Williams cried, and no pun intended. Mark, think what a help this bell will be in your practice when we make it ring again. To the Chinese she added, smiling. I'm just teasing him. My husband is really a very fine surgeon. The other bowed his head. I must tell you, he said, you will not be able to make it ring. Only the original clapper, carved from the same block of rose crystal, will ring it. That is why my father separated them. Again he hesitated. I have told you only half of what my father told me. He said that, though it defeats death, death cannot be defeated. Robbed of his chosen victim, he takes another in his place. Thus, when the bell was used in the temple of its origin, let us say when a high priest or a chief had died, a slave or servant was placed handy for death to take when he had been forced to relinquish his grasp upon the important one. He smiled, shook his head. There, he said. A preposterous story. Now, if you wish it, the bell is ten dollars, plus, of course, sales tax. The story alone is worth more, Dr. Williams declared. I think we'd better have it sent. Hadn't we, Edith? It'll be safer in the mail than in our suitcase. Sent? His wife seemed to come out of some deep feminine meditation. Oh, of course. And as for it's not ringing, I shall make it ring. I know I shall. If the story is true, Mark Williams murmured, I hope not. 
The package came on a Saturday morning when Mark Williams was catching up on the latest medical publications in his untidy, book-lined study. He heard Edith unwrapping paper in the hall outside. Then she came in with the rose crystal bell in her hands. Mark, it's here, she said. Now to make it ring. She plumped herself down beside his desk. He took the bell and reached for a silver pencil. Just for the sake of curiosity, he remarked, and not because I believed that delightful sales talk we were given. Let's see if it will ring when I tap. It should, you know. He tapped the lip of the bell. A muted thunk was the only response. Then he tried with a coin, a paper knife, and the bottom of a glass. In each instant, the resulting sound was nothing like a bell ringing. If you've finished, Mark, Edith said then, with feminine tolerance, let me show you how it's done. Gladly, her husband agreed. She took the bell and turned away for a moment. Then she shook the bell vigorously. A clear, sweet ringing shivered through the room, so thin and ethereal that small, involuntary shivers crawled up his spine. Good Lord, he exclaimed. How did you do that? I just put the clapper back in place with some thread, Edith told him. The clapper? He struck his head with his palm. Don't tell me. The crystal necklace we bought twenty years ago. Of course, her tone was composed. As soon as young Sam Key told us about his father separating the clapper and the bell, I remembered the central crystal pendant on my necklace. It is shaped like a bell clapper. We mentioned it once. I guessed right away we had the missing clapper, but I didn't say so. I wanted to score on you, Mark. She smiled affectionately at him. And because, you know, I had a queer feeling Sam Key, Jr., wouldn't let us have the bell if he guessed we had the clapper. I don't think he would. Mark Williams picked up his pipe and rubbed the bowl with his thumb. Yet he didn't really believe that story he told us any more than we do. No, but his father did. And if old Sam Key had told it to us, remember how wrinkled and wise he seemed? I do believe we'd have believed the story. You're probably right. Dr. Williams rang the bell and waited. The thin, sweet sound seemed to hang in the air a long moment, then was gone. Nope, he said. Nothing happened. Although, of course, that may be because there was no deceased around to respond. I'm not sure I feel like joking about the story. A small frown gathered on Edith's forehead. I had planned to use the bell as a dinner bell and to tell the story to our guests, but now I'm not sure. Frowning, she stared at the bell until the ringing of the telephone in the hall brought her out of her abstraction. Sit still, I'll answer. She hurried out. Dr. Williams, turning the rose crystal bell over in his hand, could hear the sudden tension in her voice as she answered. He was on his feet when she re-entered. An emergency operation at the hospital, she sighed. Nice young man. Automobile accident. Fracture of the skull, Dr. Amos says. He wouldn't have disturbed you, but you're the only brain man in town, with Dr. Hendricks away on vacation. I know. He was already in the hall reaching for his hat. Man's work is far from sun to sun, but a doctor's work is never done, he misquoted. I'll drive you, Edith followed him out. You sit back and relax for another ten minutes. Two hours later, as they drove homeward, the traffic was light, which was fortunate. More than once, Mark, in a frowning abstraction, found himself on the left of the center line and had to pull back into his own lane. He had lost patience before, but never without a feeling of personal defeat. Edith said he put too much of himself into every operation. Perhaps he did. And yet, no. There was every reason why the young man should have lived. Yet, just as Mark Williams had felt that he had been successful, the patient had died. In twenty years of marriage, Edith Williams had learned to read his thoughts at times. Now she put a hand comfortably on his arm. These things happen, darling, she said. You know that. A doctor can only do so much. Some of the job always remains in the hands of nature, and she does play tricks at times. Yes, confound it, I know it, her husband growled. But I resent losing that lad. There was no valid reason for it. Unless there was some complications I overlooked. He shook his head, scowling. I ordered an autopsy, but, yes, I'm going to do that autopsy myself. I'm going to turn back and do it now. I have to know. He pulled abruptly to the left to swing into a side road and turn. 
Edith Williams never saw the car that hit them. She heard the frantic blare of a horn and a scream of brakes, and in a frozen instant realized that there had been someone behind them about to pass. Then the impact came, throwing her forward into the windshield and unconscious. Edith Williams opened her eyes. Even before she realized that she was lying on the ground and that the figure bending over her was a state trooper, she remembered the crash. Her head hurt, but there was no confusion in her mind. Automatically, even as she tried to sit up, she accepted the fact that there had been a crash. Help had come, and she must have been unconscious for several minutes at least. Hey lady, take it easy, the trooper protested. You had a bad bump. You got to lie still until the ambulance gets here. It'll be along in five minutes. Mark, Edith said, paying no attention. My husband, is he all right? Now, lady, please, he's being taken care of. You, but she was not listening. Holding to his arm, she pulled herself to a sitting position. She saw their car on its side some yards away. Other cars pulled up around them, a little knot of staring people. Saw them and dismissed them. Her gaze found her husband, lying on the ground a few feet away. A coat folded beneath his head. Mark was dead. She had been a doctor's wife for twenty years, and before that time a nurse. She knew death when she saw it. Mark. The word was spoken to herself, but the trooper took it for a question. Yes, lady, he said. He's dead. He was still breathing when I got here, but he died two, three minutes ago. She got to her knees. Her only thought was to reach his side. She scrambled across the few feet of ground to him still on her knees and crouched beside him, fumbling for his pulse. There was none. There was nothing. Just a man who had been alive and now was dead. Behind her, she heard a voice raised. She turned. A large, disheveled man was standing beside the trooper, talking loudly. Now listen, officer, he was saying. I'm telling you again, it wasn't my fault. The guy pulled sharp left right in front of me. Not a thing I could do. It's a wonder we weren't all three of us killed. You can see by the marks on their car it wasn't my fault. Edith Williams closed her mind to the voice. She let Mark's hand lie in her lap as she fumbled in her bag, which was somehow still clutched in her fingers. She groped for a handkerchief to stem the tears which could not be held back. Something was in the way. Something smooth and hard and cold. She drew it out and heard the thin, sweet tinkle of the crystal bell. She must have dropped it automatically into her bag as they were preparing to leave the house. The hand in her lap moved. She gasped and bent forward as her husband's eyes opened. Mark, he whispered. Mark, darling. Edith, Mark Williams said with an effort. Sorry. Damned careless of me. Thinking of the hospital. You're alive, she said. You're alive. Oh, darling, darling, lie still. The ambulance will be here any second. A ambulance, he protested. No, I'm all right now. Help me sit up. But Mark. Just a bump on the head, he struggled to sit up. The state trooper came over. Easy, buddy, easy, he said, his voice odd. We thought you were gone. Now let's not lose you a second time. His mouth was tight. Hey, I'm sure glad you're all right, the red-faced man said in a rush of words. Whew, fellow, you had me all upset, even though it wasn't my fault. I mean, how's a guy going to keep from hitting you when, when... Catch him, Mark Williams cried, but the trooper was too late. The other man plunged forward to the ground and lay where he had fallen without quivering. The clock in the hall struck two with muted strokes. Cautiously, Edith Williams rose on her elbow and looked down at her husband's face. His eyes opened, and he looked back at her. You're awake, she said, unnecessarily. I woke up a few minutes ago, he answered. I've been lying here, thinking. I'll get you another phenobarbital. Dr. Amos said for you to take them and sleep until tomorrow. I know. I'll take one presently. You know, hearing that clock just now reminded me of something. Yes? Just before I came to this afternoon, after the crash, I had a strange impression of hearing a bell ring. It sounded so loud in my ears, I opened my eyes to see where it was. A bell? Yes. 
Just auditory hallucinations, of course. But Mark... Yes? Uh, a bell did ring. I mean, I had the crystal bell on my bag, and it tinkled a little. Do you suppose... Ah, of course not. But though he spoke swiftly, he did not sound convincing. This was a loud bell, like a great gong. But, I mean... Mark, darling, a moment earlier you had no pulse. No pulse? And you weren't breathing. Then the crystal bell tinkled and you... you... Nonsense. I know what you're thinking and believe me, it's nonsense. But Mark, he spoke carefully, the driver of the other car, who had no sooner regained consciousness than he... He had a fractured skull, Dr. Williams interrupted sharply. The ambulance intern diagnosed it. Skull fractures often fail to show themselves, and then, bingo, you keel over. That's what happened. Now let's say no more about it. Of course. In the hall, the clock struck the quarter hour. Shall I fix the phenobarbital now? Yes. No. Is David home? She hesitated. No, he hasn't gotten back yet. Has he phoned? He knows he's supposed to be in by midnight at the latest. No, he hasn't phoned. But there's a school dance tonight. That's no excuse for not phoning. He has the old car, hasn't he? Yes, you gave him the keys this morning, remember? All the more reason he should phone, Dr. Williams lay silent a moment. Two o'clock is too late for a seventeen-year-old boy to be out. I'll speak to him. He won't do it again. Now please, Mark, let me get you the phenobarbital. I'll stay up until David... The ringing phone, a clamor in the darkness, interrupted her. Mark Williams reached for it. The extension was beside his bed. Hello, he said, and then, although she could not hear their answering voice, she felt him stiffen, and she knew. As well as if she could hear the words she knew but the mother's instinct for disaster. Yes, Dr. Williams said. Yes, I see. I understand. I'll come at once. Thank you for calling. He slid out of bed before she could stop him. An emergency call, he spoke quietly. I have to go. He began to throw on his clothes. It's David, she said. Isn't it? She sat up. Don't try to keep me from knowing. It's about David. Yes, he said. His voice was very tired. David is hurt. I have to go to him. An accident. He's dead she said it steadily. David's dead, isn't he, Mark? He came over and sat beside her and put his arms around her. Edith, he said. Edith, yes. He's dead. Forty minutes ago. The car went over a curve. They have him at the county morgue. They want me to identify him. Identify him, Edith. You see, the car caught fire. I'm coming with you, she said. I'm coming with you. The taxi waited in a pool of darkness between two streetlights. The long, low building, which was the county morgue, blue lamp over its door, stood below the street level. A flight of concrete steps went down to it from the sidewalk. Ten minutes before, Dr. Mark Williams had gone down those steps. Now he climbed back up them, stiffly, wearily like an old man. Edith was waiting in the taxi sitting forward on the edge of the seat, hands clenched. As he reached the last step, she opened the door and stepped out. Mark, she asked shakily, was it? Yes, it's David. His voice was a monotone. Our son. I've completed the formalities. For now, the only thing we can do is go home. I'm going to him, she tried to pass. He caught her wrist. Discreetly, the taxi driver pretended to doze. No, Edith. There's no need. You mustn't see him. He's my son, she cried. Let me go. No. What have you got under your coat? It's the bell. The rose crystal bell, she cried. I'm going to ring it where David can hear. Defiantly, she brought forth her hand, clutching the little bell. It brought you back, Mark. Now it's going to bring back David. Edith, he said in horror, you mustn't believe that's possible. Can't. Those were coincidences. Now let me have it. No, I'm going to ring it. Violently, she tried to break out of his grip. I want David back. 
I am going to ring the bell. She got her hand free. The crystal bell rang in the quiet of the early morning with an eerie thinness, penetrating the silence like a silver knife. There, Edith Williams panted. I've rung it. I know you don't believe it, but I do. It'll bring David back. She raised her voice. David, she called. David, son, can you hear me? Edith, Dr. Williams groaned, you're just tormenting yourself. Come home. Please come home. Not until David has come back. David, David, can you hear me? She rang the bell again, rang it until Dr. Williams seized it. Then she let him take it. Edith, Edith, he groaned. If only you had let me come alone. Mark, listen. What? Listen, she whispered with a fierce urgency. He was silent, and then fingers of horror drew themselves down the spine at the clear, youthful voice that came up to them from the darkness below. Mother? Dad? Where are you? David, Edith Williams breathed. It's David. Let me go. I must go to him. No, Edith, her husband whispered frantically as the voice below called again. Dad? Mother? Are you up there? Wait for me. Let me go, she sobbed. David, we're here. We're up here, son. Edith, Mark Williams gasped. If you've ever loved me, listen to me. You mustn't go down there. David, I had to identify him by his class ring and his wallet. He was burned, terribly burned. I'm going to him. She wrenched herself free and sped for the steps, up which now was coming a tall form, a shadow shrouded in the darkness. Dr. Williams, horror nodding his stomach, leapt to stop her. But he slipped and fell headlong on the pavement, so that she was able to pant down the stairs to meet the upcoming figure. Oh, David, she sobbed. David! Hey, Mom! The boy held her steady. I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. But I didn't know what had happened until I got home, and you weren't there. And then one of the fellows from the fraternity called me. I realized they must have made a mistake, and you'd come here. I'd called for a taxi and came out here. My taxi let me off at the entrance around the block, and I've been looking for you down there. Poor Pete. Pete? she asked. Pete Friedberg. He was driving the old car. I lent him the keys and my driver's license. I shouldn't have, but he's older and he kept begging me. Then, then it's Pete who was killed, she gasped. Pete who was burned. Yes, Pete. I feel terrible about lending him the car, but he was supposed to be a good driver, and then them calling you, you and Dad thinking it was me. Then Mark was right. Of course he was right. She was laughing and sobbing now. It's just a bell. Pretty little bell, that's all. Bell? I don't follow you, Mom. Never mind, Edith William gasped. It's just a bell. It hasn't any powers over life and death. It doesn't bring back and it doesn't take away. But let's go get back up to your father. He may be thinking that the bell, that the bell really worked. They climbed the rest of the steps. Dr. Mark Williams still lay where he had fallen headlong on the pavement. The cab driver was bending over him. But there was nothing to be done. The crystal bell had been beneath him when he fell, and it had broken. One long, fine splinter of crystal was embedded in his heart. The End of Ring Once for Death By Robert Arthur Read by Frank Cook The Southwest Chamber by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Tan The Southwest Chamber by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman That school teacher from Acton is coming today, said the elder Miss Gill, Sophia. So she is, assented the younger Miss Gill, Amanda. I have decided to put her in the Southwest Chamber, said Sophia. Amanda looked at her sister with an expression of mingled doubt and terror. You don't suppose she would... She began hesitatingly. Would what? demanded Sophia sharply. 
She was more incisive than her sister. Both were below the medium height and stout, but Sophia was firm where Amanda was flabby. Amanda wore a baggy old muslin. It was a hot day, and Sophia was uncompromisingly hooked up in a starched and bone cambric over her high-shelving figure. I didn't know, but she would object to sleeping in that room, as long as Aunt Harriet died there such a little time ago, faltered Amanda. Well, said Sophia, of all the silly notions, if you are going to pick out rooms in this house where nobody has died for the boarders, you'll have your hands full. Grandfather Ackley had seven children. Four of them died here to my certain knowledge, besides grandfather and grandmother. I think great-grandmother Ackley, grandfather's mother, died here too. She must have. And great-grandfather Ackley? And grandfather's unmarried sister, great-aunt Fanny Ackley? I don't believe there's a room nor a bed in this house that somebody hasn't passed away in. Well, I suppose I am silly to think of it, and she had better go in there, said Amanda. I know she had. The northeast room is small and hot, and she's stout and likely to feel the heat. And she's saved money and is able to board out summers, and maybe she'll come here another year if she's well accommodated, said Sophia. Now, I guess you'd better go in there and see if any dust has settled on anything since it was cleaned, and open the west window and let the sun in while I see to that cake. Amanda went to her task in the southwest chamber, while her sister stepped heavily down the back stairs on her way to the kitchen. "'It seems to me you had better open the bed while you air and dust, then make it up again,' she called back. "'Yes, sister,' Amanda answered shudderingly. Nobody knew how this elderly woman with the untrammeled imagination of a child dreaded to enter the southwest chamber, and yet she could not have told why she had the dread. She had entered and occupied rooms which had been once tenanted by persons now dead. The room which had been hers in the little house in which she and her sister had lived before coming here had been her dead mother's. She had never reflected upon the fact with anything but loving awe and reverence. There had never been any fear. But this was different. She entered, and her heart beat thickly in her ears. Her hands were cold. The room was a very large one. The four windows, two facing south, two west, were closed, the blinds also. The room was in a film of green gloom. The furniture loomed out vaguely. The gilt frame of a blurred old engraving on the wall caught a little light. The white counterpane on the bed showed like a blank page. Amanda crossed the room, opened with a straining motion of her thin back and shoulders one of the west windows, and threw back the blind. Then the room revealed itself an apartment full of an aged and worn but no less valid state. Pieces of old mahogany swelled forth. A peacock-patterned chintz draped the bedstead. This chintz also covered a great easy chair which had been the favorite seat of the former occupant of the room. The closet door stood ajar. Amanda noticed that with wonder. There was a glimpse of a purple drapery floating from a peg inside the closet. Amanda went across and took down the garment hanging there. She wondered how her sister had happened to leave it when she cleaned the room. It was an old loose gown which had belonged to her aunt. She took it down, shuddering, and closed the closet door after a fearful glance into its dark depths. It was a long closet with a strong odor of lovage. The Aunt Harriet had had a habit of eating lovage and had carried it constantly in her pocket. There was very likely some of the pleasant root in the pocket of the musty purple gown which Amanda threw over the easy chair. Amanda perceived the odor with a start, as if before an actual presence. 
Odor seems, in a sense, a vital part of a personality. It can survive the flesh to which it has clung like a persistent shadow, seeming to have in itself something of the substance of that to which it pertained. Amanda was always conscious of this fragrance of lovage as she tidied the room. She dusted the heavy mahogany pieces punctiliously after she opened the bed as her sister had directed. She spread fresh towels over the washstand and the bureau. She made the bed. Then she thought to take the purple gown from the easy chair and carry it to the garret and put it in the trunk with the other articles of the dead woman's wardrobe which had been packed away there. But the purple gown was not in the chair. Amanda Gill was not a woman of strong convictions, even as to her own actions. She directly thought that possibly she had been mistaken and had not removed it from the closet. She glanced at the closet door and saw with surprise that it was open, and she thought she had closed it. But she instantly was not sure of that. So she entered the closet and looked for the purple gown. It was not there. Amanda Gill went feebly out of the closet and looked at the easy chair again. The purple gown was not there. She looked wildly around the room. She went down on her trembling knees and peered under the bed. She opened the bureau drawers. She looked again in the closet. Then she stood in the middle of the floor and fairly wrung her hands. What does it mean? she said in a shocked whisper. She had certainly seen that loose purple gown of her dead Aunt Harriet's. There is a limit at which self-refutation must stop in any sane person. Amanda Gill had reached it. She knew that she had seen that purple gown in that closet. She knew that she had removed it and put it on the easy chair. She also knew that she had not taken it out of the room. She felt a curious sense of being inverted mentally. It was as if all her traditions and laws of life were on their heads. Never in her simple record had any garment not remained where she had placed it unless removed by some palpable human agency. Then the thought occurred to her that possibly her sister Sophia might have entered the room unobserved while her back was turned and removed the dress. A sensation of relief came over her. Her blood seemed to flow back into its usual channels. The tension of her nerves relaxed. How silly I am, she said aloud. She hurried out and downstairs into the kitchen, where Sophia was making cake, stirring with splendid circular sweeps of a wooden spoon a creamy yellow mass. She looked up as her sister entered. Have you got it done? said she. Yes, replied Amanda. Then she hesitated. A sudden terror overcame her. It did not seem as if it were at all probable that Sophia had left that foamy cake mixture a second to go to Aunt Harriet's chamber and remove that purple gown. Well, said Sophia, if you have got that done, I wish you would take hold and string those beans. The first thing we know, there won't be time to boil them for dinner. Amanda moved toward the pan of beans on the table. Then she looked at her sister. Did you come up in Aunt Harriet's room while I was there? She asked weakly. She knew while she asked what the answer would be. Up in Aunt Harriet's room? Of course I didn't. I couldn't leave this cake without having it fall. You know that well enough. Why? Nothing, replied Amanda. Suddenly, she realized that she could not tell her sister what had happened, for before the utter absurdity of the whole thing, her belief in her own reason quailed. She knew what Sophia would say if she told her. She could hear her. Amanda Gill, 
have you gone stark staring mad? She resolved she would never tell Sophia. She dropped into a chair and begun shelling the beans with nerveless fingers. Sophia looked at her curiously. Amanda Gill, what on earth ails you? She asked. Nothing, replied Amanda. She bent her head very low over the green pods. Yes, there is too. You are as white as a sheet, and your hands are shaking so you can hardly string those beans. I did think you had more sense, Amanda Gill. I don't know what you mean, Sophia. Yes, you do know what I mean, too. You needn't pretend you don't. Why did you ask me if I had been in that room? And why do you act so queer? Amanda hesitated. She had been trained to truth. Then she lied. I wondered if you'd notice how it had leaked in on the paper, over by the bureau, that last rain, said she. What makes you so pale, then? I don't know. I guess the heat sort of overcame me. I shouldn't think it could have been very hot in that room when it had been shut up so long, said Sophia. She was evidently not satisfied, but then the grocer came to the door and the matter dropped. For the next hour, the two women were very busy. They kept no servant. When they had come into possession of this fine old place by the death of their aunt, it had seemed a doubtful blessing. There was not a cent with which to pay the repairs and taxes and insurance, except the twelve hundred dollars which they had obtained from the sale of the little house in which they had been born and lived all their lives. There had been a division in the old Ackley family years before. One of the daughters had married against her mother's wish and had been disinherited. She had married a poor man by the name of Gill and shared his humble lot in sight of her former home and her sister and mother living in prosperity until she had borne three daughters. Then she died, worn out with overwork and worry. The mother and elder sister had been pitiless to the last. Neither had ever spoken to her since she left her home the night of her marriage. They were hard women. The three daughters of the disinherited sister had lived quiet and poor, but not actually needy lives. Jane, the middle daughter, had married and died in less than a year. Amanda and Sophia had taken the baby girl she left when the father married again. Sophia had taught a primary school for many years. She had saved enough to buy the little house in which they lived. Amanda had crocheted lace and embroidered flannel and made tidies and pin cushions and had earned enough for her clothes and the child's, little Flora Scott. Their father, William Gill, had died before they were thirty. And now, in their late middle life, had come the death of the aunt to whom they had never spoken, although they had often seen her, who had lived in solitary state in the old Ackley mansion until she was more than eighty. There had been no will, and they were the only heirs with the exception of young Flora Scott, the daughter of the dead sister. Sophia and Amanda thought directly of Flora when they knew of the inheritance. It will be a splendid thing for her. She will have enough to live on when we are gone, Sophia said. She had promptly decided what was to be done. The small house was to be sold, and they were to move into the old Ackley house and take boarders to pay for its keeping. She scouted the idea of selling it. She had an enormous family pride. She had always held her head high when she had walked past that fine old mansion, the cradle of her race, which she was forbidden to enter. She was unmoved when the lawyer who was advising her disclosed to her the fact that Harriet Ackley had used every cent of the Ackley money. I realize that we have to work, said she, but my sister and I have determined to keep the place. 
That was the end of the discussion. Sophia and Amanda Gill had been living in the old Ackley house a fortnight, and they had three boarders. An elderly woman with a comfortable income, a young Congregationalist clergyman, and the middle-aged single woman who had charge of the village library. Now the school teacher from Acton, Miss Louisa Stark, was expected for the summer and would make four. Sophia considered that they were comfortably provided for. Her wants and her sister's were very few, and even the niece, although a young girl, had small expenses, since her wardrobe was supplied for years to come from that of the deceased aunt. There were stored away in the garret of the Ackley house enough voluminous black silks and satins and bombazines to keep her clad in somber richness for years to come. Flora was a very gentle girl, with large, serious blue eyes, a seldom-smiling, pretty mouth, and smooth flaxen hair. She was delicate and very young, sixteen on her next birthday. She came home soon now with her parcels of sugar and tea from the grocers. She entered the kitchen gravely and deposited them on the table by which her Aunt Amanda was seated stringing beans. Flora wore an obsolete turban-shaped hat of black straw which had belonged to the dead aunt. It set high like a crown, revealing her forehead. Her dress was an ancient purple and white print, too long and too large except over the chest, where it held her like a straight waistcoat. "'You had better take off your hat, Flora,' said Sophia." She turned suddenly to Amanda. Did you fill the water pitcher in that chamber for the schoolteacher? She asked severely. She was quite sure that Amanda had not filled the water pitcher. Amanda blushed and started guiltily. I declare, I don't believe I did, said she. I didn't think you had, said her sister with sarcastic emphasis. Flora, you go up to the room that was your great Aunt Harriet's and take the water pitcher off the washstand and fill it with water. Be real careful and don't break the pitcher and don't spill the water. In that chamber? asked Flora. She spoke very quietly, but her face changed a little. Yes, that chamber, returned her Aunt Sophia sharply. Go right along. Flora went, and her light footstep was heard on the stairs. Very soon she returned with the blue and white water pitcher and filled it carefully at the kitchen sink. Now be careful and not spill it, said Sophia as she went out of the room, carrying it gingerly. Amanda gave a timidly curious glance at her. She wondered if she had seen the purple gown. Then she started for the village stagecoach was seen driving around to the front of the house. The house stood on a corner. Here, Amanda, you look better than I do. You go and meet her, said Sophia. I'll just put the cake in the pan and I'll get it in the oven and I'll come. Show her right up to her room. Amanda removed her apron hastily and obeyed. Sophia hurried with her cake, pouring it into the baking tins. She had just put it in the oven when the door opened and Flora entered carrying the blue water pitcher. "'What are you bringing down that pitcher again for?' asked Sophia. "'She wants some water, and Aunt Amanda sent me,' replied Flora. Her pretty pale face had a bewildered expression. "'For the land's sake, she hasn't used all that great pitcher full of water so quick.' There wasn't any water in it, replied Flora. Her high, childish forehead was contracted slightly with a puzzled frown as she looked at her aunt. Wasn't any water in it? No, ma'am. Didn't I see you filling the pitcher with water not ten minutes ago, I want to know? Yes, ma'am. What did you do with that water? Nothing. Did you carry that pitcher full of water up to that room and set it on the washstand? 
Yes, ma'am. Didn't you spill it? No, ma'am. Now, Flora Scott, I want the truth. Did you fill that pitcher with water and carry it up there? And wasn't there any there when she came to use it? Yes, ma'am. Let me see that pitcher. Sophia examined the pitcher. It was not only perfectly dry from top to bottom, but even a little dusty. She turned severely on the young girl. That shows, said she, you did not fill the pitcher at all. You let the water run at the side because you didn't want to carry it upstairs. I am ashamed of you. It's bad enough to be so lazy, but when it comes to not telling the truth, the young girl's face broke up suddenly into piteous confusion, and her blue eyes became filmy with tears. I did fill the pitcher, honest, she faltered. I did, Aunt Sophia. You ask Aunt Amanda. I'll ask nobody. This pitcher is proof enough. Water don't go off and leave the pitcher dusty on the inside if it was put in ten minutes ago. Now you fill that pitcher full quick, and you carry it upstairs, and if you spill a drop, there'll be something besides talk. Flora filled the pitcher, with tears falling over her cheeks. She sniveled softly as she went out, balancing it carefully against her slender hip. Sophia followed her. Stop crying, said she sharply. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. What do you suppose Miss Louisa Stark will think? No water in her pitcher in the first place, and then you come back crying as if you didn't want to get it. In spite of herself, Sophia's voice was soothing. She was very fond of the girl. She followed her up the stairs to the chamber where Miss Louisa Stark was waiting for the water to remove the soil of travel. She had removed her bonnet, and its tuft of red geraniums lightened the obscurity of the mahogany dresser. She had placed her little beaded cape carefully on the bed. She was replying to a tremulous remark of Amanda's, who was nearly fainting from the new mystery of the water pitcher, that it was warm, and she suffered a good deal in warm weather. Louisa Stark was stout and solidly built, she was much larger than either of the Gill sisters. She was a masterly woman, inured to command from years of school teaching. She carried her swelling bulk with majesty. Even her face, moist and red with heat, lost nothing of its dignity of expression. She was standing in the middle of the floor with an air which gave the effect of her standing upon an elevation. She turned when Sophia and Flora carrying the water pitcher, entered. This is my sister Sophia, said Amanda tremulously. Sophia advanced, shook hands with Miss Louisa Stark, and bade her welcome and hoped she would like her room. Then she moved toward the closet. There is a nice large closet in this room, the best closet in the house. You might have your trunk, she said, then stopped short. The closet door was ajar, and a purple garment seemed suddenly to swing into view, as if impelled by some wind. Why, there is something left in this closet, Sophia said in a mortified tone. I thought all those things had been taken away. She pulled down the garment with a jerk, and as she did so, Amanda passed her in a weak rush for the door. I am afraid your sister is not well, said the schoolteacher from Acton. She looked very pale when you took that dress down. I noticed it at once. Hadn't you better go and see what the matter is? She may be going to faint. She is not subject to fainting spells, replied Sophia, but she followed Amanda. She found her in the room which they occupied together, lying on the bed, very pale, and gasping. She leaned over her. Amanda, what is the matter? Don't you feel well? she asked. I feel a little faint. Sophia got a camphor bottle and began rubbing her sister's forehead. 
Do you feel better? She said. Amanda nodded. I guess it was that green apple pie you ate this noon, said Sophia. I declare, what did I do with that dress of Aunt Harriet's? I guess if you feel better, I'll just run and get it and take it up, Garrett. I'll stop in here again when I come down. You'd better lay still. Flora can bring you a cup of tea. I wouldn't try to eat any supper. Sophia's tone as she left the room was full of loving concern. Presently, she returned. She looked disturbed, but angrily so. There was not the slightest hint of any fear in her expression. I want to know, said she, looking sharply and quickly around, if I brought that purple dress in here after all. I didn't see you, replied Amanda. I must have. It isn't in that chamber, nor the closet. You aren't lying on it, are you? I lay down before you came in, replied Amanda. So you did. Well, I'll go and look again. Presently, Amanda heard her sister's heavy step on the garret stairs. Then she returned with a queer, defiant expression on her face. I carried it up the garret after all and put it in the trunk, said she. I declare I forgot it. I suppose your being faint sort of put it out of my head. There it was, folded up just as nice right where I put it. Sophia's mouth was set. Her eyes upon her sister's scared, agitated face were full of hard challenge. Yes, murmured Amanda. I must go right down and see to that cake, said Sophia, going out of the room. If you don't feel well, you pound on the floor with the umbrella. Amanda looked after her. She knew that Sophia had not put that purple dress of her dead Aunt Harriet's in the trunk in the garret. Meantime, Miss Louisa Stark was settling herself in the southwest chamber. She unpacked her trunk and hung her dresses carefully in the closet. She filled the bureau drawers with nicely folded linen and small articles of dress. She was a very punctilious woman. She put on a black India silk dress with purple flowers. She combed her grayish blonde hair in smooth ridges back from her broad forehead. She pinned her lace at her throat with a brooch, very handsome, although somewhat obsolete, a bunch of pearl grapes on black onyx set in gold filigree. She had purchased it several years ago with a considerable portion of the stipend from her spring term of school teaching. As she surveyed herself in the little swing mirror surmounting the old-fashioned mahogany bureau, she suddenly bent forward and looked closely at the brooch. It seemed to her that something was wrong with it. As she looked, she became sure. Instead of the familiar bunch of pearl grapes on the black onyx, she saw a knot of blonde and black hair under glass, surrounded by a border of twisted gold. She felt a thrill of horror, though she could not tell why. She unpinned the brooch, and it was her own familiar one, the pearl grapes and the onyx. How very foolish I am, she thought. She thrust the pin in the laces at her throat and again looked at herself in the glass. And there it was again, the knot of blonde and black hair and the twisted gold. Louisa Stark looked at her own large, firm face above the brooch, and it was full of terror and dismay which were new to it. She straight away began to wonder if there could be anything wrong with her mind. She remembered that an aunt of her mother's had been insane. A sort of fury with herself possessed her. She stared at the brooch in the glass with eyes at once angry and terrified. Then she removed it again, and there was her own old brooch. Finally, she thrust the gold pin through the lace again, fastened it, and turning a defiant back on the glass, went down to supper. At the supper table, she met the other boarders, 
the elderly widow, the young clergyman, and the middle-aged librarian. She viewed the elderly widow with reserve, the clergyman with respect, the middle-aged librarian with suspicion. The latter wore a very youthful shirtwaist, and her hair in a girlish fashion, which the schoolteacher, who twisted hers severely from the straining roots at the nape of her neck to the small, smooth coil at the top, condemned as straining after effects no longer hers by right. The librarian, who had a quick acridness of manner, addressed her, asking what room she had, and asked the second time in spite of the schoolteacher's evident reluctance to hear her. She even, since she sat next to her, nudged her familiarly in her rigid black silk side. "'What room are you in, Miss Stark?' said she. "'I am at a loss how to designate the room,' replied Miss Stark stiffly. "'Is it the big southwest room?' "'It evidently faces that direction,' said Miss Stark. The librarian, whose name was Eliza Lippincott, turned abruptly to Miss Amanda Gill, over whose delicate face a curious color compounded of flush and pallor was stealing. "'What room did your aunt die in, Miss Amanda?' she asked abruptly. Amanda cast a terrified glance at her sister, who was serving a second plate of pudding for the minister. "'That room?' she replied feebly. That's what I thought, said the librarian with a certain triumph. I calculated that must be the room she died in, for it's the best in the house, and you haven't put anybody in it before. Somehow the room that anybody has died in lately is generally the last room that anybody is put in. I suppose you are so strong-minded that you don't object to sleeping in a room where anybody died a few weeks ago, she inquired of Louisa Stark with sharp eyes on her face. No, I do not, replied Miss Stark with emphasis. Nor in the same bed, persisted Eliza Lippincott with a kittenish reflection. The young minister looked up from his pudding. He was very spiritual, but he had poor pickings in his previous boarding place, and he could not help a certain abstract enjoyment over Miss Gill's cooking. You would certainly not be afraid, Miss Lippincott, he remarked with his gentle, almost caressing inflection of tone. You do not for a minute believe that a higher power would allow any manifestation on the part of a disembodied spirit, who we trust is in her heavenly home, to harm one of his servants? Oh, Mr. Dunn, of course not, replied Eliza Lippincott with a blush. Of course not. I never meant to imply. I could not believe you did said the minister gently. He was very young, but he already had a wrinkle of permanent anxiety between his eyes and a smile of permanent ingratiation on his lips. The lines of the smile were as deeply marked as the wrinkle. Of course, dear Miss Harriet Gill was a professing Christian, remarked the widow. And I don't suppose a professing Christian would come back and scare folks if she could. I wouldn't be a mite afraid to sleep in that room. I'd rather have it than the one I've got. If I was afraid to sleep in a room where a good woman died, I wouldn't tell of it. If I saw things or heard things, I'd think the fault must be with my own guilty conscience. Then she turned to Miss Stark. Any time you feel timid in that room, I'm ready and willing to change with you, said she. Thank you. I have no desire to change. I am perfectly satisfied with my room, replied Miss Stark with freezing dignity, which was thrown away upon the widow. Well, said she, any time, if you should feel timid, you know what to do. I've got a real nice room. It faces east and gets the morning sun, but it isn't so nice as yours, according to my way of thinking. I'd rather take my chances any day in a room anybody had died in than the one that was hot in summer. I'm more afraid of a sunstroke than of spooks for my part. Miss Sophia Gill, 
who had not spoken one word, but whose mouth had become more and more rigidly compressed, suddenly rose from the table, forcing the minister to leave a little pudding, at which he glanced regretfully. Miss Louisa Stark did not sit down in the parlor with the other boarders. She went straight to her room. She felt tired after her journey, and meditated a loose wrapper and writing a few letters quietly before she went to bed. Then, too, she was conscious of a feeling that if she delayed, the going there at all might assume more terrifying proportions. She was full of defiance against herself and her own lurking weakness. So she went resolutely and entered the southwest chamber. There was through the room a soft twilight. She could dimly discern everything, the white satin scroll work on the wallpaper and the white counterpane on the bed being the most evident. Consequently, both arrested her attention first. She saw against the wallpaper directly facing the door the waist of her best black satin dress hung over a picture. That is very strange, she said to herself, and again a thrill of vague horror came over her. She knew, or thought she knew, that she had put that black satin dress waist away, nicely folded between towels in her trunk. She was very choice of her black satin dress. She took down the black waist and laid it on the bed preparatory to folding it, but when she attempted to do so, she discovered that the two sleeves were firmly sewed together. Louisa Stark stared at the sewed sleeves. What does this mean? She asked herself. She examined the sewing carefully. The stitches were small and even and firm of black silk. She looked around the room. On the stand beside the bed was something which she had not noticed before. A little old-fashioned workbox with a picture of a little boy in a pinafore on top. Beside this workbox lay, as if just laid down by the user, a spool of black silk, a pair of scissors, and a large steel thimble with a hole in the top after an old style. Louisa stared at these, then at the sleeves of her dress. She moved toward the door. For a moment, she thought that this was something legitimate about which she might demand information. Then she became doubtful. Suppose that workbox had been there all the time. Suppose she had forgotten. Suppose she herself had done this absurd thing. Or suppose that she had not. What was to hinder the others from thinking so? What was to hinder a doubt being cast upon her own memory and reasoning powers? Louisa Stark had been on the verge of a nervous breakdown in spite of her iron constitution and her great willpower. No woman can teach school for forty years with absolute impunity. She was more credulous as to her own possible failings than she had ever been in her whole life. She was cold with horror and terror, and yet not so much horror and terror of the supernatural as of her own self. The weakness of belief in the supernatural was nearly impossible for this strong nature. She could more easily believe in her own failing powers. I don't know, but I'm going to be like Aunt Marcia, she said to herself, and her fat face took on the long rigidity of fear. She started toward the mirror to unfasten her dress, then remembered the strange circumstance of the brooch and stopped short. Then she straightened herself defiantly and marched up to the bureau and looked in the glass. She saw reflected therein, fastening the lace at her throat, the old-fashioned thing of a large oval, a knot of fair and black hair under glass, set in a rim of twisted gold. She unfastened it with trembling fingers and looked at it. It was her own brooch, the cluster of pearl grapes on black onyx. Louisa Stark placed the trinket in its little box on the nest of pink cotton and put it away in the bureau drawer. Only death could disturb her habit of order. Her fingers were so cold 
they felt fairly numb as she unfastened her dress. She staggered when she slipped it over her head. She went to the closet to hang it up and recoiled. A strong smell of lovage came in her nostrils. A purple gown near the door swung softly against her face, as if impelled by some wind from within. All the pegs were filled with garments not her own, mostly of somber black, but there were some strange patterned silk things and satins. Suddenly, Louisa Stark recovered her nerve. This, she told herself, was something distinctly tangible. Somebody had been taking liberties with her wardrobe. Somebody had been hanging someone else's clothes in her closet. She hastily slipped on her dress again and marched straight down to the parlor. The people were sitting there. The widow and the minister were playing backgammon. The librarian was watching them. Miss Amanda Gill was mending beside the large lamp on the center table. They all looked up with amazement as Louisa Stark entered. There was something strange in her expression. She noticed none of them except Amanda. Where is your sister? She asked peremptorily of her. She's in the kitchen, mixing up bread, Amanda quavered. Is there anything? But the schoolteacher was gone. She found Sophia Gill standing by the kitchen table, kneading dough with dignity. The young girl Flora was bringing some flour from the pantry. She stopped and stared at Miss Stark, and her pretty, delicate young face took on an expression of alarm. Miss Stark opened at once upon the subject in her mind. Miss Gill, said she, with her utmost schoolteacher manner, I wish to inquire why you have had my own clothes removed from the closet in my room and others substituted. Sophia Gill stood with her hands fast in the dough, regarding her. Her own face paled slowly and reluctantly. Her mouth stiffened. What? I don't quite understand what you mean, Miss Stark, said she. My clothes are not in the closet in my room, and it is full of things which do not belong to me, said Louisa Stark. Bring me that flower, said Sophia sharply to the young girl, who obeyed, casting timid, startled glances at Miss Stark as she passed her. Sophia Gill began rubbing her hands clear of the dough. I am sure I know nothing about it, she said with a certain tempered asperity. Do you know anything about it, Flora? Oh, no, I don't know anything about it, Aunt Sophia, answered the young girl, fluttering. Then Sophia turned to Miss Stark. I'll go upstairs with you, Miss Stark, said she, and see what the trouble is. There must be some mistake. She spoke stiffly with constrained civility. Very well, said Miss Stark with dignity. Then she and Miss Sophia went upstairs. Flora stood staring after them. Sophia and Louisa Stark went up to the southwest chamber. The closet door was shut. Sophia threw it open, then she looked at Miss Stark. On the pegs hung the schoolteacher's own garments in ordinary array. I can't see that there is anything wrong, remarked Sophia grimly. Miss Stark strove to speak, but she could not. She sank down on the nearest chair. She did not even attempt to defend herself. She saw her own clothes in the closet. She knew there had been no time for any human being to remove those which she thought she had seen and put hers in their places. She knew it was impossible. Again, the awful horror of herself overwhelmed her. You must have been mistaken, she heard Sophia say. She muttered something, she scarcely knew what. Sophia then went out of the room. Presently, she undressed and went to bed. In the morning, she did not go down to breakfast, and when Sophia came to inquire, requested that the stage be ordered for the noon train. She said that she was sorry, but was ill, 
and feared lest she might be worse, and she felt that she must return home at once. She looked ill and could not take even the toast and tea which Sophia had prepared for her. Sophia felt a certain pity for her, but it was largely mixed with indignation. She felt that she knew the true reason for the school teacher's illness and sudden departure, and it incensed her. If folks are going to act like fools, we shall never be able to keep this house, she said to Amanda after Miss Stark had gone, and Amanda knew what she meant. Directly, the widow, Mrs. Elvira Simmons, knew that the school teacher had gone and the southwest room was vacant. She begged to have it in exchange for her own. Sophia hesitated a moment. She eyed the widow sharply. There was something about the large, roseate face, worn in firm lines of humor and decision which reassured her. I have no objection, Mrs. Simmons, said she. If, if what? asked the widow. If you have common sense enough not to keep fussing because the room happens to be the one my aunt died in, said Sophia bluntly. Fiddlesticks, said the widow, Mrs. Elvira Simmons. That very afternoon, she moved into the southwest chamber. The young girl Flora assisted her, though much against her will. Now, I want you to carry Mrs. Simmons' dresses into the closet in that room and hang them up nicely and see that she gets everything she wants, said Sophia Gill. And you can change the bed and put on fresh sheets. What are you looking at me that way for? Oh, Aunt Sophia, can't I do something else? What do you want to do something else for? I'm afraid. Afraid of what? I should think you'd hang your head. No, you go right in there and do what I tell you. Pretty soon, Flora came running into the sitting room where Sophia was, as pale as death. And in her hand, she held a queer, old-fashioned, frilled nightcap. What's that? demanded Sophia. I found it under the pillow. What pillow? In the southwest room. Sophia took it and looked at it sternly. It's pre-Aunt Harriet's, said Flora faintly. You run down street and do that errand at the grocer's for me and I'll see that room, said Sophia with dignity. She carried the nightcap away and put it in the trunk in the garret, where she had supposed it stored with the rest of the dead woman's belongings. Then she went to the southwest chamber and made the bed and assisted Mrs. Simmons to move, and there was no further incident. The widow was openly triumphant over her new room. She talked a deal about it at the dinner table. It is the best room in the house, and I expect you all to be envious of me, said she. And are you sure you don't feel afraid of the ghosts? said the librarian. Ghosts, repeated the widow with scorn. If a ghost comes, I'll send her over to you. You are just across the hall from the southwest room. You needn't, returned Eliza Lippincott with a shudder. I wouldn't sleep in that room after. She checked herself with an eye on the minister. After what? asked the widow. Nothing, replied Eliza Lippincott in an embarrassed fashion. I trust Miss Lippincott has too good sense and too great faith to believe in anything of that sort, said the minister. I trust so too, replied Eliza hurriedly. You did see or hear something. Now what was it, I want to know, said the widow that evening when they were alone in the parlor. The minister had gone to make a call. Eliza hesitated. What was it, insisted the widow. Well, said Eliza hesitatingly, if you'll promise not to tell. Yes, I promise. What was it? Well, one day, last week, 
just before the school teacher came, I went in that room to see if there were any clouds. I wanted to wear my gray dress, and I was afraid it was going to rain, so I wanted to look at the sky at all points. So I went in there and... And what? Well, you know that chintz over the bed, and the valance, and the easy chair? What pattern should you say it was? Why, peacocks on a blue ground. Good land. I shouldn't think anyone who had ever seen that would forget it. Peacocks on a blue ground, you are sure? Of course I am. Why? Only when I went in there that afternoon, it was not peacocks on a blue ground. It was grape roses on a yellow ground. Why, what do you mean? What I say? Did Miss Sophia have it changed? No. I went in there again an hour later, and the peacocks were there. You didn't see straight the first time. I expected you would say that. The peacocks are there now. I saw them just now. Yes, I suppose so. I suppose they flew back. But they couldn't. Looks as if they did. Why, how could such a thing be? It couldn't be. Well, all I know is those peacocks were gone for an hour that afternoon, and the red roses on the yellow ground were there instead. The widow stared at her a moment. Then she began to laugh rather hysterically. Well, said she, I guess I shan't give up my nice room for any such tomfoolery as that. I guess I would just as soon have red roses on a yellow ground as peacocks on a blue. But there's no use talking. You couldn't have seen straight. How could such a thing have happened? I don't know, said Eliza Lippincott. But I know I wouldn't sleep in that room if you'd give me a thousand dollars. Well, I would, said the widow. And I'm going to. When Mrs. Simmons went to the southwest chamber that night, she cast a glance at the bed hanging and the easy chair. There were peacocks on the blue ground. She gave a contemptuous thought to Eliza Lippincott. I don't believe she's getting nervous, she thought. I wonder if any of her family have been out at all. But just before Mrs. Simmons was ready to get into bed, she looked again at the hangings and the easy chair, and there were the red roses on the yellow ground instead of the peacocks on the blue. She looked long and sharply. Then she shut her eyes, then opened them, and looked. She still saw the red roses. Then she crossed the room, turned her back to the bed, and looked out at the night from the south window. It was clear, and the full moon was shining. She watched it a moment, sailing over the dark blue in its nimbus of gold. Then she looked at the bed hangings. She still saw the red roses on the yellow ground. Mrs. Simmons was struck in her most vulnerable point. This apparent contradiction of the reasonable, as manifested in such a commonplace thing as chintz of a bed hanging, affected this ordinarily unimaginative woman as no ghostly appearance could have. Those red roses on the yellow ground were to her much more ghostly than any strange figure clad in white robes of the grave entering the room. She took a step toward the door, then she turned with a resolute air. As for going downstairs and owning up I'm scared, and having that lip and caught girl crowing over me, I won't for any red roses instead of peacocks. I guess they can't hurt me, and as long as we've both of us seen them, I guess we can't both be getting loony, she said. Mrs. Elvira Simmons blew out her light and got into bed and lay staring out between the chintz hangings at the moonlit room. 
She said her prayers in bed, always as being more comfortable, and presumably just as acceptable in the case of a faithful servant with a stout habit of body. Then, after a little, she fell asleep. She was of too practical a nature to be kept long awake by anything which had no power of actual bodily effect upon her. No stress of the spirit had ever disturbed her slumbers. So she slumbered between the red roses or the peacocks, she did not know which. But she was awakened about midnight by a strange sensation in her throat. She had dreamed that someone with long white fingers was strangling her, and she saw the bending over her face of an old woman in a white cap. When she waked, there was no old woman. The room was almost as light as day in the full moonlight and looked very peaceful. But the strangling sensation at her throat continued, and besides that, her face and ears felt muffled. She put up her hand and felt that her head was covered with a ruffled nightcap tied under her chin so tightly that it was exceedingly uncomfortable. A great qualm of horror shot over her. She tore the thing off frantically and flung it from her with a convulsive effort as if it had been a spider. She gave, as she did so, a quick short scream of terror. She sprang out of bed and was going toward the door when she stopped. It had suddenly occurred to her that Eliza Lippincott might have entered the room and tied on the cap while she was asleep. She had not locked the door. She looked in the closet, under the bed. There was no one there. Then she tried to open the door, but to her astonishment found that it was locked, bolted on the inside. I must have locked it after all, she reflected with wonder, for she never locked her door. Then she could scarcely conceal from herself that there was something out of the usual about it all. Certainly no one could have entered the room and departed locking the door on the inside. She could not control the long shiver of horror that crept over her, but she was still resolute. She resolved that she would throw the cap out of the window. I'll see if I have tricks like that played on me again. I don't care who does it, said she quite aloud. She was still unable to believe wholly in the supernatural. The idea of some human agency was still in her mind, filling her with anger. She went toward the spot where she had thrown the cap. She had stepped over it on her way to the door, but it was not there. She searched the whole room, lighting her lamp, but she could not find the cap. Finally, she gave it up. She extinguished her lamp and went back to bed. She fell asleep again. To be again awakened in the same fashion. That time, she tore off the cap as before, but she did not fling it on the floor as before. Instead, she held to it with a fierce grip. Her blood was up. Holding fast to the white, flimsy thing, she sprang out of bed, ran to the window which was open, slipped the screen, and flung it out. But a sudden gust of wind, though the night was calm, arose, and it floated back in her face. She brushed it aside like a cobweb, and she clutched at it. She was actually furious. It eluded her clutching fingers. Then she did not see it at all. She examined the floor. She lighted her lamp again and searched, but there was no sign of it. Mrs. Simmons was then in such a rage that all terror had disappeared for the time. She did not know with what she was angry, but she had a sense of some mocking presence, which was silently proving too strong against her weakness, and she was aroused to the utmost power of resistance. To be baffled like this, and resisted by something which was as nothing to her as straining senses, filled her with intensest resentment. Finally, she got back into bed again. She did not go to sleep. 
She felt strangely drowsy, but she fought against it. She was wide awake, staring at the moonlight, when she suddenly felt the soft white strings of the thing tighten around her throat and realized that her enemy was again upon her. She seized the strings, untied them, twitched off the cap, ran with it to the table where her scissors lay, and furiously cut it into small bits. She cut and tore, feeling an insane fury of gratification. There, said she quite aloud, I guess I shan't have any more trouble with this old cap. She tossed the bits of muslin into a basket and went back to bed. Almost immediately, she felt the soft strings tighten around her throat. Then at last she yielded, vanquished. This new refutal of all laws of reason by which she had learned, as it were, to spell her theory of life was too much for her equilibrium. She pulled off the clinging strings feebly, drew the thing from her head, slid weakly out of bed, caught up her wrapper and hastened out of the room. She went noiselessly along the hall to her own old room. She entered, got into her familiar bed, and lay there the rest of the night, shuddering and listening. And if she dozed, waking with a start at the feeling of pressure upon her throat, to find it was not there, yet still to be unable to shake off entirely the horror. When daylight came, she crept back to the southwest chamber and hurriedly got some clothes in which to dress herself. It took all her resolution to enter the room, but nothing unusual happened while she was there. She hastened back to her old chamber, dressed herself, and went down to breakfast with an imperturbable face. Her color had not faded. When asked by Eliza Lippincott how she had slept, she replied with an appearance of calmness which was bewildering that she had not slept very well. She never did sleep very well in a new bed, and she thought she would go back to her old room. Eliza Lippincott was not deceived, however. Neither were the Gill sisters nor the young girl, Flora. Eliza Lippincott spoke out bluntly. You needn't talk to me about sleeping well, said she. I know something queer happened in that room last night by the way you act. They all looked at Mrs. Simmons inquiringly, the librarian with malicious curiosity and triumph, the minister with sad incredulity, Sophia Gill with fear and indignation, Amanda and the young girl with unmixed terror. The widow bore herself with dignity. I saw nothing, nor heard nothing, which I trust could not have been accounted for in some rational manner, said she. What was it? persisted Eliza Lippincott. I do not wish to discuss the matter any further, replied Mrs. Simmons shortly. Then she passed her plate for more creamed potato. She felt she would die before she confessed to that ghastly absurdity of the nightcap or to having been disturbed by the flight of peacocks off a blue field of chintz after she had scoffed at the possibility of such a thing. She left the whole matter so vague that in a fashion she came off as the mistress of the situation. She, at all events, impressed everybody by her coolness in the face of no one knew what nightly terror. After breakfast, with the assistance of Amanda and Flora, she moved back into her old room. Scarcely a word was spoken during the process of moving, but they all worked with trembling haste and looked guilty when they met one another's eyes, as if conscious of betraying a common fear. That afternoon, the young minister, John Dunn, went to Sophia Gill and requested permission to occupy the southwest chamber that night. I don't ask to have my effects moved there, said he, for I could scarcely afford a room so much superior to the one I now occupy, but I would like, if you please, to sleep there tonight for the purpose of refuting in my own person any unfortunate superstition which may have obtained root here. Sophia Gill thanked the minister gratefully 
and eagerly accepted his offer. How anybody with common sense can believe for a minute in any such nonsense passes my comprehension, said she. It certainly passes mine how anybody with Christian faith can believe in ghosts, said the minister gently, and Sophia Gill felt a certain feminine contentment in hearing him. The minister was a child to her. She regarded him with no tincture of sentiment. And yet she loved to hear two other women covertly condemned by him, and she herself thereby exalted. That night, about twelve o'clock, the Reverend John Dunn essayed to go to his nightly slumber in the southwest chamber. He had been sitting up until that hour, preparing his sermon. He traversed the hall with a little night lamp in his hand, opened the door of the southwest chamber, and essayed to enter. He might as well have essayed to enter the solid side of a house. He could not believe his senses. The door was certainly open. He could look into the room, full of soft lights and shadows under the moonlight which streamed into the windows. He could see the bed in which he had expected to pass the night. But he could not enter. Whenever he strove to do so, he had a curious sensation, as if he were trying to press against an invisible person who met him with the force of opposition impossible to overcome. The minister was not an athletic man, yet he had considerable strength. He squared his elbows, set his mouth hard, and strove to push his way through into the room. The opposition which he met was as sternly and mutely terrible as the rocky fastness of a mountain in his way. For a half hour, John Dunn, doubting, raging, overwhelmed with spiritual agony as to the state of his own soul rather than fear, strove to enter that southwest chamber. He was simply powerless against this uncanny obstacle. Finally, a great horror, as of evil itself, came over him. He was a nervous man and very young. He fairly fled to his own chamber and locked himself in like a terror-stricken girl. The next morning, he went to Miss Gill and told her frankly what had happened, and begged her to say nothing about it, lest he should have injured the cause by the betrayal of such weakness, for he actually had come to believe that there was something wrong with the room. "'What it is, I know not, Miss Sophia,' said he. "'But I firmly believe, against my will, that there is in that room some accursed evil power at work, of which modern faith and modern science know nothing. Miss Sophia Gill listened with grimly lowering face. She had an inborn respect for the clergy, but she was bound to hold that southwest chamber in the dearly beloved old house of her father's free of blame. I think I will sleep in that room myself tonight, she said, when the minister had finished. He looked at her in doubt and dismay. I have great admiration for your faith and courage, Miss Sophia, he said. But are you wise? I am fully resolved to sleep in that room tonight, she said conclusively. There were occasions when Miss Sophia Gill could put on a manner of majesty and she did now. It was ten o'clock that night when Sophia Gill entered the southwest chamber. She had told her sister what she intended doing, and had been proof against her tearful entreaties. Amanda was charged not to tell the young girl Flora. There is no use in frightening that child over nothing, said Sophia. Sophia, when she entered the southwest chamber, set the lamp which she carried on the bureau, and began moving about the rooms, pulling down the curtains, taking off the nice white counterpane of the bed, and preparing generally for the night. As she did so, moving with great coolness and deliberation, she became conscious that she was thinking some thoughts that were foreign to her. 
she began remembering what she could not have remembered since she was not then born. The trouble over her mother's marriage, the bitter opposition, the shutting the door upon her, the ostracizing her from heart and home. She became aware of a most singular sensation, as of bitter resentment herself, and not against the mother and sister who had so treated her own mother, but against her own mother. And then she became aware of a bitterness extended to her own self. She felt malignant toward her mother as a young girl whom she remembered, though she could not have remembered, and she felt malignant toward her own self and her sister Amanda and Flora. Evil suggestions surged in her brain, suggestions which turned her heart to stone and which still fascinated her. And all the time, by a sort of double consciousness, she knew that what she thought was strange and not due to her own volition. She knew that she was thinking the thoughts of some other person, and she knew who. She felt herself possessed. But there was tremendous strength in the woman's nature. She had inherited strength for good and righteous self-assertion from the evil strength of her ancestors. They had turned their own weapons against themselves. She made an effort which seemed almost mortal, but was conscious that the hideous thing was gone from her. She thought her own thoughts. Then she scouted to herself the idea of anything supernatural about the terrific experience. I am imagining everything she told herself. She went on with the preparations. She went to the bureau to take down her hair. She looked in the glass and saw, instead of her softly parted waves of hair, harsh lines of iron gray under the black borders of an old-fashioned headdress. She saw, instead of her smooth, broad forehead, a high one, wrinkled with the intensest concentration of selfish reflections of a long life. She saw, instead of her steady blue eyes, black ones, with depths of malignant reserve, behind a broad meaning of ill will. She saw, instead of her firm, benevolent mouth, one of a hard, thin line, a network of melancholic wrinkles. She saw, instead of her own face, middle-aged and good to see, the expression of a life of honesty and goodwill to others and patience under trials, the face of a very old woman, scowling forever with unceasing hatred and misery at herself and all others, at life and death, at that which had been and that which was to come. She saw instead of her own face in the glass, the face of her dead Aunt Harriet, topping her own shoulders in her own well-known dress. Sophia Gill left the room. She went into the one which she shared with her sister Amanda. Amanda looked up and saw her standing there. She had set the lamp on a table, and she stood holding a handkerchief over her face. Amanda looked at her with terror. What is it? What is it, Sophia? she gasped. Sophia still stood with the handkerchief pressed to her face. Oh, Sophia, let me call somebody. Is your face hurt, Sophia? What is the matter with your face? fairly shrieked Amanda. Suddenly, Sophia took the handkerchief from her face. Look at me, Amanda Gill, she said in an awful voice. Amanda looked shrinking. What is it? Oh, what is it? You don't look hurt. What is it, Sophia? What do you see? Why, I see you. Me? Yes, you. What did you think I would see? Sophia Gill looked at her sister. Never, as long as I live, will I tell you what I thought you would see. And you must never 
ask me, said she. Well, I never will, Sophia, replied Amanda, half weeping with terror. You won't try to sleep in that room again, Sophia? No, said Sophia, and I am going to sell this house. End of the Southwest Chamber The Spider by Arthur Edwards Chapman From Weird Tales, November 1923 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman A Weird Storyette The Spider by Arthur Edwards Chapman I tell you, Ron, it was queer, uncanny. My friend, Ronald Titherton, laughed and weighed the little golden spider in his palm. You don't mean to suggest, do you, he replied, that this little mass of gold and carbon is capable of exercising control over the human will? The thing is valuable, I'll grant you. Those diamond eyes must be worth at least a couple of hundred apiece. But as for anything else, absurd. I got up and stood with my back to the fireplace, somewhat piqued at my companion's incredulity. You can believe it or not, Ron, I said, but I do most certainly suggest that such a thing happened. What did I go to the sale for? Not to purchase that comparatively insignificant ornament, you must agree. No, I went to secure for my collection those things that would make it the finest in the country, and I got them. But I tell you, Ron, that when that little spider was put up, I felt a strange desire come over me, an overwhelming determination to possess the thing. I don't know why it should have been so. I am not going to try to explain it. Beside those other antiques it was nothing, and yet I would willingly at that moment have exchanged them all for it. The diamond eyes of the thing are magnetic. They impelled me, even against my mind's ruling. I say again, it was uncanny. Titherington listened to my rather heated recital with a quiet smile on his thin lips and, taking a cigarette from his case, lit it thoughtfully. "'Let me see,' he mused slowly, as though speaking to himself. "'Wasn't this the same spider found by the body of the late Sir Nicholas Goldby when he was discovered dead under such mysterious circumstances some months ago?' "'Yes,' I agreed. He had brought it from the east, and the police held it to be a sacred jewel, and that Sir Nicholas had met his death at the hands of some Hindu fanatics who sought to return it to the despoiled temple. Ah, cried Titherington suddenly, seeming mightily pleased with himself. So you remember all that, do you? Of course, I said surprised. Why not, seeing that I had so great an interest in the dead man's collection? then don't you think he said deliberately that it was the very happening associated with the spider that caused you to act as you did in other words wasn't it a case of intensely heightened imagination you mean it was my vivid recollection of the facts connected with the case that made me desire to possess the thing and that i attribute to the spider a power which really was the outcome of my own eagerness i shook my head unconvinced exactly look here alan the facts fit together like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle didn't you say a dark foreign man bid against you very heavily for the jewel and when you outbid him he implored you to let him have it it seems to me alan that you have need to watch against human rather than supernatural powers then you think that the foreigner might try to steal the spider from me yes titherington replied getting up and stretching himself 
Take my advice and keep your eye on the thing. Well, I'm off to bed. It's eleven o'clock. Good night, old man. I bade him good night, and after he had gone, lit another cigarette and sat before the dying fire for a final smoke, casting my thoughts back over the strange events of the day. For all my friend's reasoning, I was not convinced. There was something strange about that golden spider, I was sure. I gazed at it where it rested upon the little china cabinet by the window, and tried to read some signs of hidden force in those great diamond eyes. But no, the thing was ordinary enough, simply a mass of gold and carbon, as Titherington had said. Throwing the stump of my cigarette into the fireplace, I rose swiftly and switched off the light. Then I retired, feeling well pleased with myself and the world in general as the result of my day's work, and wishing nothing better than to yield myself to the goddess of sleep. But for once that deity, usually so quick to respond to my call, failed to smile favorably upon me, and I turned restlessly in my bed, listening to the faint rustling of leaves outside the window, and the multitudinous other sounds that materialized in so mysterious a manner in the fancy of the wakeful. In the hall below the great clock chimed the half of eleven, and I found myself counting its ponderous ticks and picturing the massive pendulum swinging, always swinging, slowly, monotonously, in its glass prison. Tick-tock, tick-tock, it went, forcing itself on me with such insistence that presently I could no longer hear it through the very intensity of my listening. Once more I turned on my left side and faced the window, which was wide open, the night being a warm one. The moon had risen, and a narrow beam of light shone between the curtains, painting a silvery path along the carpet to the door, so that I was able mentally to trace the grotesque forms of impossible flowers, twining their way through the Greek keys that failed to unlock the door of the Temple of Sleep. Ding dong! Ding dong! Ding dong! chimed the never-sleeping sentinel, and as I listened to the knell of the quarter which had passed, I became suddenly conscious of a new sound of which I had not been aware before, and which I could not reconcile with any known cause. It was a strange, muffled drumming, something like the ticking of a watch within a metal cylinder. Of course, it was the ticking of my own watch, hung upon the bed rail, which acted as a sounding board for it. I smiled to myself as the utter simplicity of the explanation came to me, and raised my head confidently to confirm my reasoning. The watch had stopped at twenty-five minutes past eleven. Strange! What could it have been? I listened as I propped myself upon my pillow, but now I could not hear it. It must have been fancy, I thought, and lay down again. But barely had my head touched the pillow when thump, thump, thump came the noise with mechanical regularity. And then, with stunning force, the solution hurled itself at me as I pressed a hand against my breast. It was the beating of my own heart. A hot, clammy wave passed over my body at this realization. An unreasoning, nervous dread took possession of me, and I knew that I was afraid, horribly afraid of something which had no tangible existence. As I struggled with this strange feeling and called myself a fool for permitting fears of so childish a nature to overcome me, I saw something that caused my heart to give a great leap and my blood to chill in my veins. Framed in the doorway, glaring at me from an impenetrable blackness of the corridor beyond, were two large, unblinking eyes, shining in the reflected light like the headlamps of a motor gleaming like a couple of immense diamonds. Then, 
as I gazed in unbound horror at the glittering eyes, a great hairy leg crept slowly, hesitantly, into the silver beam, feeling the ground before it in wavering uncertainty. Presently, this joined by another, and yet a third, hovering in mid-air for a few seconds, before they came to rest on the carpet. I tried to turn my head away in fearful anticipation of what was to come, but I could not. There was something magnetic, uncanny, about those diamond eyes that impelled me even against my mind's ruling. And as I sat helpless, bound with fetters of unspeakable dread, the wavering legs were followed by a fearsome skull-like head, armed with a pair of great pincer fangs that opened and closed continuously with a rasping, clicking sound that caused my very hair to bristle, and presently the thing stood revealed in its hideous, loathsome entirety. There it was, ruddy golden in the moonlight, evil, horrible, like some huge, hairy bear. Merciful heaven, it was the spider! And it was coming toward me, with those hesitating, creeping steps, slowly, noiselessly. I tried to cry out, but my tongue refused to articulate, and I would have leapt from the bed and fled before the nightmare, but I could not move. That sinister, magnetic eye held me motionless, and I groomed inwardly with indescribable anguish, while the hot perspiration stood in beads on my forehead. Nearer and nearer it drew. Its outstretched legs felt the coverlet. They brushed my shrinking body. Horror! They enfolded me in an ever-tightening embrace. I stared into those awful, gleaming orbs that seemed to gloat over my helplessness, and for a tense moment the thing remained motionless. Below, the clock struck the hour of twelve. There was a loud, painful buzzing in my head. Then the spell seemed to fall from me, and as the great fangs of the thing groped for my throat, I gave a loud cry and hurled myself with the blind madness of despair at the foul, hairy shape, falling to the carpeted floor, locked in that ruthless embrace. I have but a hazy recollection of what occurred next. It seemed that I was mad. I struggled and kicked frantically in my futile efforts to avoid those fearsome fangs that were gripping my bare throat. Perhaps I screamed. I faintly remember my outstretched hand touching something that was cold, solid, and a sharp, thrilling sense of exultation passed through me as I rained wild blows, sickening, crunching blows, on the hideous, grinning head. A loathsome, putrid mass oozed out. The hairy legs slackened and grew rigid. My madness spent, I rolled over on the floor. My stomach revolted. I was nauseated, sickened. I swooned. They found me lying apparently lifeless on the floor, and firmly grasped in my hand a heavy iron poker. Close by, its diamond eyes crushed to powder, and battered almost beyond recognition, lay the golden spider. The End of The Spider by Arthur Edwards Chapman The Temple by H. P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gauntz The Temple by H. P. Lovecraft Manuscript found on the coast of Yucatan. On August 20, 1917, 
I, Karl Heinrich, Graf von Altberg Ehrenstein, Lieutenant Commander in the Imperial German Navy and in charge of the submarine U-29, deposit this bottle and record in the Atlantic Ocean at a point to me unknown, but probably about north latitude 20 degrees, west longitude 35 degrees, where my ship lies disabled on the ocean floor. I do so because of my desire to set certain unusual facts before the public, a thing I shall not in all probability survive to accomplish in person, since the circumstances surrounding me are as menacing as they are extraordinary, and involve not only the hopeless crippling of the U-29, but the impairment of my iron German will in a manner most disastrous. On the afternoon of June 18, as reported by wireless to the U-61 bound for Kiel, we torpedoed the British freighter Victory, New York to Liverpool, in north latitude 45 degrees 16 minutes, west longitude 28 degrees 34 minutes, permitting the crew to leave in boats in order to obtain a good cinema view for the Admiralty records. The ship sank quite picturesquely, bow first, the stern rising high out of the water whilst the hull shot down perpendicularly to the bottom of the sea. Our camera missed nothing, and I regret that so fine a reel of film should never reach Berlin. After that, we sank the lifeboats with our guns and submerged. When we rose to the surface about sunset, a seaman's body was found on the deck, hands gripping the railing in curious fashion. The poor fellow was young, rather dark and very handsome, probably an Italian or Greek, and undoubtedly of the victory's crew. He had evidently sought refuge on the very ship which had been forced to destroy his own, one more victim of the unjust war of aggression which the English pig-dogs are waging upon the fatherland. Our men searched him for souvenirs, and found in his coat pocket a very odd bit of ivory carved to represent a youth's head crowned with a laurel. My fellow officer, Lieutenant Clenza, believed that the thing was of great age and artistic value, so took it from the men for himself. How it had ever come into the possession of a common soldier, neither he nor I could imagine. As the dead man was thrown overboard, there occurred two incidents which created much disturbance amongst the crew. The fellow's eyes had been closed, but in the dragging of his body to the rail they were jarred open, and many seemed to entertain a queer delusion that they gazed steadily and mockingly at Schmidt and Zimmer, who were bent over the corpse. Then Boson Muller, an elderly man who would have known better had he not been a superstitious Alsatian swine, became so excited by this impression that he watched the body in the water, and swore that after it sank a little it drew its limbs into a swimming position and sped away to the south under the waves. Clenza and I did not like these displays of peasant ignorance, and severely reprimanded the men, particularly Muller. The next day a very troublesome situation was created by the indisposition of some of the crew. They were evidently suffering from the nervous strain of our long voyage, and had had bad dreams. Several seemed quite dazed and stupid, and after satisfying myself that they were not feigning their weakness, I excused them from their duties. The sea was rather rough so we descended to a depth where the waves were less troublesome. Here we were comparatively calm, despite a somewhat puzzling southward current which we could not identify from our oceanographic charts. The moans of the sick men were decidedly annoying, but since they did not appear to demoralize the rest of the crew, we did not resort to extreme measures. It was our plan to remain where we were, and intercept the liner Dacia, mentioned in information from agents in New York. In the early evening we rose to the surface, and found the sea less heavy. The smoke of a battleship was on the northern horizon, but our distance and ability to submerge made us safe. 
What worried us more was the talk of Boson Muller, which grew wilder as the night came on. He was in a detestably childish state, and babbled of some illusion of dead bodies drifting past the undersea portholes, bodies which looked at him intensely, and which he recognized in spite of bloating as having seen dying during some of our victorious German exploits. And he said that the young man we had found and tossed overboard was their leader. This was very gruesome and abnormal, so we confined Muller in irons and had him soundly whipped. The men were not pleased at his punishment, but discipline was necessary. We also denied the request of a delegation headed by Seaman Zimmer that the curious carved ivory head be cast into the sea. On June 20, Seaman Bohm and Schmidt, who had been ill the day before, became violently insane. I regretted that no physician was included in our complement of officers, since German lives are precious. But the constant ravings of the two concerning a terrible curse were most subversive of discipline, so drastic steps were taken. The crew accepted the event in a sullen fashion, but it seemed to quiet Muller, who thereafter gave us no trouble. In the evening we released him and he went about his duties silently. In the week that followed we were all very nervous, watching for the Dacia. The tension was aggravated by the disappearance of Muller and Zimmer, who undoubtedly committed suicide as a result of the fears which had seemed to harass them, though they were not observed in the act of jumping overboard. I was rather glad to be rid of Muller, for even his silence had unfavorably affected the crew. Everyone seemed inclined to be silent now, as though holding a secret fear. Many were ill, but none made a disturbance. Lieutenant Klenze chafed under the strain, and was annoyed by the merest trifles, such as the school of dolphins which gathered about the U-29 in increasing numbers, and the growing intensity of that southward current which was not on our chart. It at length became apparent that we had missed the Dacia altogether. Such failures are not uncommon, and we were more pleased than disappointed, since our return to Wilhelmshaven was now in order. At noon, June 28, we turned northeastward, and despite some rather comical entanglements with the unusual masses of dolphins, we were soon under way. The explosion in the engine room at 2 p.m. was wholly a surprise. No defect in the machinery or carelessness in the men had been noticed, yet without warning the ship was racked from end to end with a colossal shock. Lieutenant Klenze hurried to the engine room, finding the fuel tank and most of the mechanism shattered, and engineers Rob and Schneider instantly killed. Our situation had suddenly become grave indeed for though the chemical air regenerators were intact, and though we could use the devices for raising and submerging the ship and opening the hatches as long as compressed air and storage batteries might hold out, we were powerless to propel or guide the submarine. To seek rescue in the lifeboats would be to deliver ourselves into the hands of enemies unreasonably embittered against our great German nation and our wireless had failed ever since the victory affair to put us in touch with a fellow U-boat of the Imperial Navy. From the hour of the accident till July 2 we drifted constantly to the south, almost without plans and encountering no vessel. Dolphins still encircled the U-29, a somewhat remarkable circumstance considering the distance we had covered. On the morning of July 2 we sighted a warship flying American colors, and the men became very restless in their desire to surrender. Finally, Lieutenant Klenze had to shoot a seaman named Traub, who urged this un-German act with especial violence. This quieted the crew for the time, and we submerged unseen. The next afternoon a dense flock of seabirds appeared from the south, and the ocean began to heave ominously. Closing our hatches, we awaited developments until we realized that we must either submerge or be swamped in the mounting waves. Our air pressure and electricity were diminishing, 
and we wish to avoid all unnecessary use of our slender mechanical resources, but in this case there was no choice. We did not descend far, and when, after several hours, the sea was calmer, we decided to return to the surface. Here, however, a new trouble developed, for the ship failed to respond to our direction in spite of all that the mechanics could do. As the men grew more frightened at this undersea imprisonment, some of them began to mutter again about Lieutenant Clens's ivory image, but the sight of an automatic pistol calmed them. We kept the poor devils as busy as we could, tinkering at the machinery even when we knew it was useless. Clensa and I usually slept at different times, and it was during my sleep about 5 a.m. July 4 that the general mutiny broke loose. The six remaining pigs of seamen, suspecting that we were lost, had suddenly burst into a mad fury at our refusal to surrender to the Yankee battleship two days before, and were in a delirium of cursing and destruction. They roared like the animals they were, and broke instruments and furniture indiscriminately, screaming about such nonsense as the curse of the ivory image and the dark, dead youth who looked at them and swam away. Lieutenant Clensis seemed paralyzed and inefficient, as one might expect of a soft, womanish Rhinelander. I shot all six men, for it was necessary, and made sure that none remained alive. We expelled the bodies through the double hatches and were alone in the U-29. Clensa seemed very nervous and drank heavily. It was decided that we remain alive as long as possible, using the large stock of provisions and chemical supply of oxygen, none of which had suffered from the crazy antics of those swine-hound seamen. Our compasses, depth gauges, and other instruments were ruined so that henceforth our reckoning would be guesswork, based on our watches, the calendar, and our apparent drift as judged by any objects we might spy through the portholes or from the conning tower. Fortunately, we had storage batteries still capable of long use, both for interior lighting and for the searchlight. We often cast a beam around the ship, but saw only dolphins, swimming parallel to our own drifting course. I was scientifically interested in those dolphins, for though the ordinary Delphinus delphis is a cetacean mammal, unable to subsist without air, I watched one of the swimmers closely for two hours, and did not see him alter his submerged condition. With the passage of time, Clensa and I decided that we were still drifting south, meanwhile sinking deeper and deeper. We noted the marine fauna and flora, and read much on the subject in the books I had carried with me for spare moments. I could not help observing, however, the inferior scientific knowledge of my companion. His mind was not Prussian, but given to imaginings and speculations which have no value. The fact of our coming death affected him curiously, and he would frequently pray in remorse over the men, women, and children we had sent to the bottom— forgetting that all things are noble which serve the German state. After a time he became noticeably unbalanced, gazing for hours at his ivory image and weaving fanciful stories of the lost and forgotten things under the sea. Sometimes, as a psychological experiment, I would lead him on in these wanderings, and listen to his endless poetical quotations and tales of sunken ships. I was very sorry for him, for I dislike to see a German suffer, but he was not a good man to die with. For myself I was proud, knowing how the fatherland would revere my memory, and how my sons would be taught to be men like me. On August 9 we espied the ocean floor, and sent a powerful beam from the searchlight over it. It was a vast, undulating plain, mostly covered with seaweed and strewn with the shells of small mollusks. Here and there were slimy objects of puzzling contour, draped with weeds and encrusted with barnacles, which Clenza declared must be ancient ships lying in their graves. He was puzzled by one thing, a peak of solid matter, 
protruding above the ocean bed nearly four feet at its apex, about two feet thick, with flat sides and smooth upper surfaces, which met at a very obtuse angle. I called the peak a bit of outcropping rock, but Clenza thought he saw carvings on it. After a while he began to shudder, and turned away from the scene as if frightened, yet could give no explanation save that he was overcome with the vastness, darkness, remoteness, antiquity, and mystery of the oceanic abysses. His mind was tired, but I am always a German, and was quick to notice two things. That the U-29 was standing the deep-sea pressure splendidly, and that the peculiar dolphins were still about us, even at a depth where the existence of high organisms is considered impossible by most naturalists. That I had previously overestimated our depth, I was sure, but nonetheless we must be deep enough to make these phenomena remarkable. Our southward speed, as gauged by the ocean floor, was about as I had estimated from the organisms past at higher levels. It was at 3.15 p.m., August 12, that poor Clenza went wholly mad. He had been in the conning tower using the searchlight when I saw him bound into the library compartment where I sat reading, and his face at once betrayed him. I will repeat here what he said, underlining the words he emphasized. He is calling. He is calling. I hear him. We must go. As he spoke, he took his ivory image from the table, pocketed it, and seized my arm in an effort to drag me up the companionway to the deck. In a moment I understood that he meant to open the hatch and plunge with me into the water outside, a vagary of suicidal and homicidal mania for which I was scarcely prepared. As I hung back and attempted to soothe him, he grew more violent, saying, Come now, do not wait until later. It is better to repent and be forgiven than to defy and be condemned. Then I tried the opposite of the soothing plan and told him he was mad, pitifully demented. But he was unmoved and cried, If I am mad, it is mercy. May the gods pity the man who in his callousness can remain sane to the hideous end. Come and be mad whilst he still calls with mercy. This outburst seemed to relieve a pressure in his brain, for as he finished he grew much milder, asking me to let him depart alone if I would not accompany him. My course at once became clear. He was a German, but only a Rhinelander and a commoner and he was now a potentially dangerous madman. By complying with his suicidal request, I could immediately free myself from one who was no longer a companion but a menace. I asked him to give me the ivory image before he went, but this request brought from him such uncanny laughter that I did not repeat it. Then I asked him if he wished to leave any keepsake or lock of hair for his family in Germany in case I should be rescued but again he gave me that strange laugh. So as he climbed the ladder I went to the levers, and allowing proper time intervals operated the machinery which sent him to his death. After I saw that he was no longer in the boat, I threw the searchlight around the water in an effort to obtain a last glimpse of him, since I wished to ascertain whether the water pressure would flatten him as it theoretically should, or whether the body would be unaffected like those extraordinary dolphins. I did not, however, succeed in finding my late companion, for the dolphins were massed thickly and obscuringly about the conning tower. That evening I regretted that I had not taken the ivory image surreptitiously from poor Clence's pocket as he left, for the memory of it fascinated me. I could not forget the youthful, beautiful head with its leafy crown, though I am not by nature an artist. I was also sorry that I had no one with whom to converse. Clenza, though not my mental equal, was much better than no one. I did not sleep well that night, and wondered exactly when the end would come. Surely I had little enough chance of rescue. The next day I ascended to the conning tower, and commenced the customary searchlight explorations. 
Northward, the view was much the same as it had been all the four days since we had sighted the bottom, but I perceived that the drifting of the U-29 was less rapid. As I swung the beam around to the south, I noticed that the ocean floor ahead fell away in a marked declivity, and bore curiously regular blocks of stone in certain places, disposed as if in accordance with the definite patterns. The boat did not at once descend to match the greater ocean depth, so I was soon forced to adjust the searchlight to cast a sharply downward beam. Owing to the abruptness of the change, a wire was disconnected, which necessitated a delay of many minutes for repairs, but at length the light streamed on again, flooding the marine valley below me. I am not given to emotion of any kind, but my amazement was very great when I saw what lay revealed in that electrical glow. And yet, as one reared in the best culture of Prussia, I could not have been amazed, for geology and tradition alike tell us of great transpositions in oceanic and continental areas. What I saw was an extended and elaborate array of ruined edifices, all of magnificent the one classified architecture and in various stages of preservation. Most appeared to be of marble, gleaming whitely in the rays of the searchlight, and the general plan was of a large city at the bottom of a narrow valley, with numerous isolated temples and villas on the steep slopes above. Roofs were fallen and columns were broken, but there still remained an air of immemorially ancient splendor which nothing could efface. Confronted at last with the Atlantis I had formerly deemed largely a myth, I was the most eager of explorers. At the bottom of that valley a river once had flowed, for as I examined the scene more closely, I beheld the remains of stone and marble bridges and sea walls and terraces and embankments once verdant and beautiful. In my enthusiasm I became nearly as idiotic and sentimental as poor Clenza, and was very tardy in noticing that the southward current had ceased at last, allowing the U-29 to settle slowly down upon the sunken city as an airplane settles upon a town of the upper earth. I was slow, too, in realizing that the school of unusual dolphins had vanished. In about two hours the boat rested in a paved plaza close to the rocky wall of the valley. On one side I could view the entire city as it sloped from the plaza down to the old river bank. On the other side, in startling proximity, I was confronted by the richly ornate and perfectly preserved façade of a great building, evidently a temple, hollowed from the solid rock. Of the original workmanship of this titanic thing I can only make conjectures. The façade of immense magnitude apparently covers a continuous hollow recess, for its windows are many and widely distributed. In the center yawns a great open door, reached by an impressive flight of steps, and surrounded by exquisite carvings like the figure of Bacchanals in relief. Foremost of all are the great columns and frieze, both decorated with sculptures of inexpressible beauty, obviously portraying idealized pastoral scenes and processions of priests and priestesses, bearing strange ceremonial devices in adoration of a radiant god. The art is of the most phenomenal perfection, largely Hellenic in idea, yet strangely individual. It imparts an impression of terrible antiquity, as though it were the remotest rather than the immediate ancestor of Greek art. Nor can I doubt that every detail of this massive product was fashioned from the virgin hillside rock of our planet. It is palpably a part of the valley wall, though how the vast interior was ever excavated I cannot imagine. Perhaps a cavern or series of caverns furnished the nucleus. Neither age nor submersion has corroded the pristine grandeur of this awful fane, for fane indeed it must be, and today after thousands of years it rests untarnished and inviolate of the endless night and silence of an ocean chasm. 
I cannot reckon the number of hours I spent in gazing at the sunken city with its buildings, arches, statues, and bridges, and the colossal temple with its beauty and mystery. Though I knew that death was near, my curiosity was consuming, and I threw the searchlight's beam about in eager quest. The shaft of light permitted me to learn many details, but refused to show anything within the gaping door of the rock-hewn temple, and after a time I turned off the current, conscious of the need of conserving power. The rays were now perceptibly dimmer than they had been during the weeks of drifting, and as if sharpened by the coming deprivation of light, my desire to explore the watery secrets grew. I, a German, should be the first to tread those eon-forgotten ways. I produced and examined a deep-sea diving suit of jointed metal, and experimented with the portable light and air regenerator. Though I should have trouble in managing the double hatches alone, I believed I could overcome all obstacles with my scientific skill and actually walk about the dead city in person. On August 16 I effected an exit from the U-29, and laboriously made my way through the ruined and mud-choked streets to the ancient river. I found no skeletons or other human remains, but gleaned a wealth of archaeological lore from sculptures and coins. Of this I cannot now speak save to utter my awe at a culture in the full noon of glory, when cave-dwellers roamed Europe and the Nile flowed unwatched to the sea. Others, guided by this manuscript if it shall ever be found, must unfold the mysteries at which I can only hint. I returned to the boat as my electric batteries grew feeble, resolved to explore the rock temple on the following day. On the seventeenth, as my impulse to search out the mystery of the temple waxed still more insistent, a great disappointment befell me, for I found that the materials needed to replenish the portable light had perished in the mutiny of those pigs in July. My rage was unbounded yet my German sense forbade me to venture unprepared into an utterly black interior which might prove the lair of some indescribable marine monster, or a labyrinth of passages from whose windings I could never extricate myself. All I could do was to turn on the waning searchlight of the U-29, and with its aid walk up the temple steps and study the exterior carvings. The shaft of light entered the door at an upward angle, and I peered in to see if I could glimpse anything, but all in vain. Not even the roof was visible, and though I took a step or two inside after testing the floor with a staff, I dared not go farther. Moreover, for the first time in my life I experienced the emotion of dread. I began to realize how some of poor Clens's moods had arisen. For as the temple drew me more and more, I feared its aqueous abysses with a blind and mounting terror. Returning to the submarine, I turned off the lights and sat thinking in the dark. Electricity must now be saved for emergencies. Saturday the 18th I spent in total darkness, tormented by the thoughts and memories that threatened to overcome my German will. Clenza had gone mad and perished before reaching this sinister remnant of a past unwholesomely remote, and had advised me to go with him. Was indeed fate preserving my reason only to draw me irresistibly to an end more horrible and unthinkable than any man has dreamed of? Clearly my nerves were sorely taxed, and I must cast off these impressions of weaker men. I could not sleep Saturday night and turned on the lights regardless of the future. It was annoying that the electricity should not last out the air and provisions. I revived my thoughts of euthanasia, and examined my automatic pistol. Toward morning I must have dropped asleep with the lights on, for I awoke in darkness yesterday afternoon to find the batteries dead. I struck several matches in succession, and desperately regretted the improvidence which had caused us long ago to use up the few candles we carried. After the fading of the last match I dared to waste, I sat very quietly without a light. 
as I considered the inevitable end my mind ran over preceding events, and developed a hitherto dormant impression which would have caused a weaker and more superstitious man to shudder. The head of the radiant god in the sculptures on the rock temple is the same as that carven bit of ivory which the dead sailor brought from the sea and which poor Cleansa carried back into the sea. I was a little dazed by this coincidence, but did not become terrified. It is only the inferior thinker who hastens to explain the singular and the complex by the primitive shortcut of supernaturalism. The coincidence was strange, but I was too sound a reasoner to connect circumstances which admit of no logical connection, or to associate in any uncanny fashion the disastrous events which had led from the victory affair to my present plight. Feeling the need of more rest, I took a sedative and secured some more sleep. My nervous condition was reflected in my dreams, for I seemed to hear the cries of drowning persons and to see the dead faces pressing against the portholes of the boat. And among the dead faces was the living, mocking face of the youth with the ivory image. I must be careful how I record my awakening today, for I am unstrung, and much hallucination is necessarily mixed with fact. Psychologically, my case is most interesting, and I regret that it cannot be observed scientifically by a competent German authority. Upon opening my eyes, my first sensation was an overmastering desire to visit the rock temple, a desire which grew every instant, yet which I automatically sought to resist through some emotion of fear which operated in the reverse direction. Next there came to me the impression of light amidst the darkness of dead batteries, and I seemed to see a sort of phosphorescent glow in the water through the porthole which opened toward the temple. This aroused my curiosity, for I knew of no deep-sea organism capable of emitting such luminosity. But before I could investigate there came a third impression which because of its irrationality caused me to doubt the objectivity of anything my senses might record. It was an oral delusion, a sensation of rhythmic melodic sound as of some wild yet beautiful chant or choral hymn coming from the outside through the absolutely soundproof hull of the U-29. Convinced of my psychological and nervous abnormality, I lighted some matches and poured a stiff dose of sodium bromide solution, which seemed to calm me to the extent of dispelling the illusion of sound. But the phosphorescence remained, and I had difficulty in repressing a childish impulse to go to the porthole and seek its source. It was horribly realistic and I could soon distinguish by its aid the familiar objects around me, as well as the empty sodium bromide glass of which I had no former visual impression in its present location. This last circumstance made me ponder, and I crossed the room and touched the glass. It was indeed in the place where I had seemed to see it. Now I knew that the light was either real or part of an hallucination so fixed and consistent that I could not hope to dispel it, so abandoning all resistance I ascended to the conning tower to look for the luminous agency. Might it not actually be another U-boat, offering possibilities of rescue? It is well that the reader accept nothing which follows as objective truth, for since the events transcend natural law, they are necessarily the subjective and unreal creations of my overtaxed mind. When I attained the conning tower, I found the sea in general far less luminous than I had expected. There was no animal or vegetable phosphorescence about, and the city that sloped to the river was invisible in blackness. What I did see was not spectacular, not grotesque or terrifying, yet it removed my last vestige of trust in my consciousness. For the door and windows of the undersea temple hewn from the rocky hill were vividly aglow with a flickering radiance, as from a mighty altar flame far within. 
Later incidents are chaotic. As I stared at the uncannily lighted door and windows, I became subject to the most extravagant visions. Visions so extravagant that I cannot even relate them. I fancied that I discovered objects in the temple, objects both stationary and moving, and seemed to hear again the unreal chant that had floated to me when first I awaked, and over all rose thoughts and fears which centered in the youth from the sea, and the ivory image whose carving was duplicated on the frieze and columns of the temple before me. I thought of poor Clensa and wondered where his body rested with the image he had carried back into the sea. He had warned me of something, and I had not heeded. But he was a soft-headed Rhinelander who went mad at troubles a Prussian could bear with ease. The rest is very simple. My impulse to visit and enter the temple has now become an inexplicable and imperious command, which ultimately cannot be denied. My own German will no longer controls my acts, and volition is henceforward possible only in minor matters. Such madness it was which drove Clenza to his death, bareheaded and unprotected in the ocean. But I am a Prussian, and a man of sense, and will use to the last what little will I have. When first I saw that I must go, I prepared my diving suit, helmet, and air regenerator for instant donning, and immediately commenced to write this hurried chronicle in the hope that it may some day reach the world. I shall seal the manuscript in a bottle, and entrust it to the sea as I leave the U-29 forever. I have no fear, not even from the prophecies of the madman Clenza. What I have seen cannot be true, and I know that this madness of my own will at most lead only to suffocation when my air is gone. The light in the temple is a sheer delusion, and I shall die calmly, like a German, in the black and forgotten depths. This demonic laughter which I hear as I write comes only from my own weakening brain. So I will carefully don my diving suit and walk boldly up the steps into that primal shrine, that silent secret of unfathomed waters and uncounted years. End of the Temple by H. P. Lovecraft